Hi, everyone. I think we'll go ahead and get started so we can stay on schedule today. Um, my name is Melissa Lee. I'm the coordinating attorney for the Institutions Project at Columbia Legal Services, and I really want to thank all of you for being here today. We're really excited to um, be holding the CLE and um, starting the new reentry clinic, and hopefully um, many of you will be able to be involved in, in the clinic. Um, so first thing I want to get out of the way is restrooms. The men's room, if you go out this door, is just right here to the left of the um, registration table. The women's room, if you go back past the elevators to the reception desk and take a left, they're down that hallway. Um, so I just want to give all of you a little bit of information about the reentry clinic that we um, are initiating with um, some funding from a grant from the Paul Allen Foundation. Um, we're going to be pairing with Fair Start to provide clinical legal services to their students related to reentry issues. Um, I've Many of you are probably familiar with Fair Start. It's a culinary training program for people who um, are homeless. And as you might imagine, many of those people, up to 90%, have a criminal record. Um, and so in talking with the case managers and the students at Fair Start, we found that many of them have reentry legal issues that they could use assistance with. Um, so we are going to be holding a clinic once a month at Fair Start. It will be the fourth Tuesday of every month at 2.30 at the Fair Start campus. Um, and we will also hold a clinic the second Monday of every month at the um, King County Law Library that will be open to people from not only Fair Start but the general community. Um, the clinic will cover three main areas. The first one is legal financial obligations. Um, our CLS attorney, Nick Allen, will be presenting to you about that later today. Um, and then the other two areas will be housing and employment, the barriers to housing and employment created by having a criminal record. Um, and Murph Eman, another CLS attorney, will be presenting um, about those issues later today as well. Um, so for those of you who will be able to volunteer at the clinic, this CLE will kind of provide the basis of, of um, those subjects. The clinic will have, um, will have probably eight to ten appointments for clients every, every clinic. Um, with volunteer attorneys meeting with the clients and providing advice and counsel. Um, a, we'll have legal assistant support as well as attorney support from Columbia Legal Services. We'll be there to make sure that you have what you need. Um, and, the, and we will help with any follow-up as necessary for the, the clients as well. Um, we'll pass around a sign-up sheet later for people. And um, if you're interested, you can sign up or you can get in contact with us after the presentation today. Um, so we have some great presenters today. Um, our first presenter is Vanessa Hernandez. She's with the Second Chances Project at the um, ACLU of Washington. Um, and she'll be doing a presentation this morning about background screening and vacating a ceiling records. Um, Murphy Eman is in the back there. And she'll be doing two presentations today, one on um, the barriers to housing by, um, created by criminal records and one about the barriers to employment created by criminal records. Um, Nick Allen, also in the back, is another CLS attorney who will be presenting about legal financial obligations, which are the fees, fines, um, fees and fines associated in restitution associated with a criminal record. Um, and Maria Silvernail here, she's been volunteering with um, Columbia Legal Services. We've been running a legal financial obligations clinic for the past couple of years, and Maria has been our most dedicated volunteer, and she'll be able to talk a little bit about what the experiences of a volunteer with the clinic is like. Um, and later today, um, Debbie Perlis from Northwest Justice Project will be here to talk to us about ethics. Um, so I think that's all for now. Uh, and we'll turn it over to Vanessa. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, so I'm Vanessa Hernandez. I'm a staff attorney with the ACLU of Washington, and I run a program there called our Second Chances Project. So we provide um, a lot of the same services that the reentry clinic will be providing. We do individual advice and representation around the impact that a background check has on people's opportunities, particularly housing and employment, also schooling and volunteer opportunities. Um, so what I'm going to be talking to you about today is sort of the records part of things, not um, what employers or landlords or anyone else do with those records, but really what's showing up in a background check, um, what the law is around that area, and how you can um, advocate for people to ensure that background checks are complete, accurate, as minimal as is possible under the law, um, and, you know, helping to provide sort of an, uh, an alternative way to look at those background checks. Um, 
before I jump in, two things. One is I really, really appreciate it if you stop me and ask me questions, so please don't feel shy about doing that. And two, just a quick show of hands, how many of you have ever done criminal law before? Or practiced criminal law? Okay, so a few but not many. Um, so I'll be using a few sort of criminal law terminology. I'll try to make sure that I'm explaining things all the way through, but again, if I start tossing off things about deferred dispositions and you have no idea what I'm talking about, please, please stop me. Um, so basically the overview of what I'm going to do is I'm gonna talk at the beginning just sort of about what these records are and where they come from. Um, because most people are gonna come into you and say something to the effect of this is showing up in my record and I want it to go away. And the initial question that I always ask is, well, what record are we talking about? So I'm gonna to try to lay out the landscape of what sorts of records are out there, how they get created and generated and what it means for folks. And then I'm gonna talk really specifically about the mechanisms available under Washington law for vacating, sealing, setting aside these records. Um, what the eligibility requirements are, what the process looks like, how it all works. Um, so the first sort of starting point is that in Washington state, we have extremely open access to virtually every criminal history record that um, is created. And when people talk about criminal history records, they often think that you have just sort of one record, right? That there's this central database where everybody goes and that's where all the information is. And that is incredibly far from the truth. What we have instead are a, a bunch of different sources of original information of records. You have law enforcement records, you have jail records, you have court records, um, you have credit records, you have employer verification records, you have eviction records. All of those records are disseminated, packaged, repackaged in infinite varieties. So what any given employer or any given landlord is looking at is going to be often very, very different than what your client might have seen before, what you might see, what another employer or landlord or someone will look at. Um, generally, for the purposes of trying to figure out, well, what do people have in terms of criminal history, what you're going to be looking for are the original source materials. And there are two original sources of criminal history records in Washington State. The most accurate and the easiest to get are court records, okay? In Washington State, court records are available very, very widely and electronically. The most comprehensive database of those court records is called JIS, the Judicial Information Systems. JIS is, looks exactly like that. It is a clunky program that was programmed in like 1978. Um, any person with, can, any, any individual can subscribe to it. It takes a $100 fee and you establish a user account and then you have to download the program. Um, CLS has access to it. I recommend if you are going to be doing this work on a regular basis that you get a JIS account. Um, takes a little doing to learn how to use it. But JIS is one of the primary sources of criminal history information because about at least 200 companies that do background checks are subscribed to JIS. And this is where they get um, most court information. You can look people up by name, by date of birth, and it will give you a list of not only every criminal case filed under that name in Washington state, but every civil case, every traffic infraction that gets filed in a court, it's all listed out in JIS. In addition to that, the Washington courts offer a, what I call a data dump. Um, Washington has something called SCOMIS, which is the Superior Courts Online Management Information System. SCOMIS is an index of all of the superior court cases, which are those cases which are filed either as, which are initially filed as felony level charges. The Washington Administrative Office of the Court actually sells SCOMIS in bulk. So instead of doing what you have to do in JIS, where you go in and you have to type an individual name and get an individual record, SCOMIS will actually just, they'll sell you all of SCOMIS. Um, this is a little bit more costly, but the major background check companies in the, in, the, in the country are subscribed to SCOMIS, meaning every quarter they get a dump of all of the information that is in SCOMIS. Um, that is impactful for your clients for two reasons. One is that that data dump is very, very easy to compile and sell and disseminate on downstream. So LexisNexis might buy SCOMIS and might then send a copy of it off to somebody else. The other reason it impacts your clients is because that database is updated at best 
quarterly, which means that the information in SCOMIS from the SCOMIS data dump, which is floating around, may be two or three or four months out of date. It may often be even more out of date if the companies aren't regularly complying with their obligations to update these databases. In addition to that, Washington has a website, the Washington Courts website. Um, it's courts.wa.gov. If you go onto the Washington Courts website, you'll find that there is a name search function. And you can go in there and type in the name of any individual, and it will pull up a list of all of the cases that have been filed under that particular name. So if you go in and you type my name, Vanessa Hernandez, you will find 43 cases that have been filed under the name Vanessa Hernandez. The Washington Courts database doesn't distinguish by anything else. It doesn't distinguish by date of birth. It doesn't distinguish by residence. It doesn't distinguish by social security numbers. But some people do use the Washington Courts database as sort of a quick and dirty background check. Um, it is not intended for that use. It is not accurate for that use, but it is available. Um, Two things I'll note about SCOMIS and the Washington Courts database is that very recently the um, Washington Judicial Information Systems Committee took juvenile cases off of those lists. So if you go into a SCOMIS database, if you get a SCOMIS data dump now, it will no longer include juvenile cases. And the same thing for the Washington Courts website. If you search for a juvenile case, it will no longer show up. Um, in terms of law enforcement records, the, the easiest and most accessible public source of law enforcement records is what's called watch reports. Watch reports are generated by the Washington State Patrol. It's Washington Access to Criminal History. Uh, basically, anybody can get a watch report. If you go onto the State Patrol, you pay them $10. Um, you can download a watch report on anybody in the state. All you need is a name and a date of birth. Um, Watch reports are somewhat limited in what they include. So they don't include cases which have been vacated or sealed, which I'll get to in a second. They don't include non-conviction data. So if a case was dismissed or um, charges were never really filed, a watch report won't include those arrest information. Watch reports are also notoriously incomplete. So if you are trying to get a sense of what a person's criminal history is, I would not rely on a watch report. The reason for that is that a watch report begins with an arrest, right? So watch doesn't begin tracking a case, doesn't generate a report, unless the person is arrested at the inception of the case. There are lots of cases where people don't get arrested at the inception, where they're not arrested and booked into jail. Um, shoplifting cases are a really good example of that. Right? Most shoplifting cases work where a person is stopped by source security, their information is taken down, they're given a notification, and then charges are filed at a later date without them ever being arrested by law enforcement and booked. Watch just doesn't have those cases. There are court records of those cases, but they don't show up in watch reports. So again, while this is a source of, of background check information and it can be comprehensive, it is not always comprehensive. Um, similar, a similar source of information is FBI records, right? Um, so FBI records includes arrests reported by all 50 states. They mostly will include convictions. They also include non-conviction data because it just starts with an arrest. So they'll list an arrest even if there's never a conviction. It includes some juvenile records, not all juvenile records. It includes some sealed cases. It, sorry, it doesn't include sealed cases. For the most part, though, FBI reports are not going to be a source of information that you're going to need to be worried about. And that's because access to FBI records is fairly limited. Um, you can get it by statute um, if you are an approved agency. Uh, for example, um, State agencies that do licensing for nursing homes or schools, those types of agencies have access to FBI reports. But for the most part, private employers don't. Not all private employers, um, but for the most part, they don't have that information. It's, you have to be authorized specifically by federal law. Um, so really, the biggest source of the information that is going to be impacting the people that you're going to be working with is going to be reports prepared by consumer reporting agencies, or CRAs. Consumer reporting agencies are private third-party companies. 
Um, what they do is they mine all of those original sources of information. They go to law enforcement, they go to DOC, they go to watch reports, they get a SCOMAS data dump, they look in GIS, they send people physically down to the courthouse. And they compile these databases, which they then use to generate reports for the purposes of housing, employment, and, and other permissible purposes under the statute. Um, these are private companies, okay? So they're not government agencies. And they are operating for profit. In fact, they are very, very, very big business. And generally, in my experience, the vast majority of employers and housing providers you're going to be looking at are going to be using CRAs. Housing providers and employers can get watch reports, and some of them do. They could conceivably do their own research into court records, and some of them do. But the vast majority of them are hiring these third-party companies. Um, oh. I was going to define what a consumer, oh, there it is. Um, so what is a consumer report? A consumer report is any written, oral, or other communication. And sorry, I added this slide in today so you don't have it. Um, any written, oral, or other communication of information about a consumer by a consumer reporting agency, which is one of these companies, that is used or collected wholly or in part in connection with a consumer account or transaction. So credit, insurance, housing, employment, government benefits, licensing, all of those are considered consumer transactions. CRAs, as I mentioned, get their records primarily electronically these days. They're getting them mostly through the SCOMAS data dump or GIS research. Some CRAs still use courthouse runners, meaning they actually send people physically to the courthouse to use the court computers to pull up the current records and then report those back. Um, they also often rely on bulk transfers from whatever source of information they can get them. For example, CRAs up until 2009, when DOC stopped doing this, they would get bulk offender data from DOC. They would request from DOC all of the records of all of the inmates who had been booked into a Department of Corrections facility, and then download that information into their databases. Similarly, they uh, use public records requests to get information from public agencies, which are then downloaded. One of the big hurdles with dealing with CRAs, though, is that a lot of them aren't using what I call the original information, right? They're not going back to the courts or to the state patrol or to the DOC to get the source, the information about this individual from the source. Instead, what many of them do is they contract and subcontract with each other. So any report that's given to a landlord is probably the product of five or six or seven or eight other CRAs. A landlord would get, uh, would contract with a tenant screener, for example, to produce a report on an applicant for housing. That tenant screening company would go to one company to get credit information, another company to get housing and eviction information, another company to get employment information, and another company to get public records criminal history information. Each one of those companies may be working its way up and up and up the chain. So there could be, you know, many, many different companies that would be compiling information to get into a single report that's seen by the ultimate decision maker. They will provide individualized information. So if, for example, you go to DOC and you say, I want to get all of the booking and release dates for this individual with this date of birth, DOC will give that. What they're no longer doing is the bulk, like, here's every person we've ever booked. Um, DOC will give that in response to a public records request, but the bulk transfers that consumer reporting agencies were getting were mostly just booking and release dates, and they also included the charges on which people were booked. I will say, though, that even though DOC stopped providing that information in 2009, it still shows up in background checks. I still see lots and lots of background checks, which include as their source DOC historical information inactive 2009. So this old information is still floating around and being used to generate background checks. Um, any other questions about where all of this is coming from? Okay. Um, so the impact of all of this is pretty severe, right? Because back in the 1960s or 70s, it was actually possible to leave prison and go get a job. 
without having to discuss or disclose your criminal history. That is absolutely not the case today. Um, well over 92% of employers now are doing background checks on some or all applicants. There are 40,000 laws state, uh, nationwide, both state and federal, which impose some kind of consequence. You are not eligible for this employment license or this benefit or this type of housing because of conviction information. Um, and, and people with records are significantly less likely to get those follow-up calls and information. So the bottom line is that people with criminal history need to be prepared to discuss, to, to assume that their record will be at issue, um, to ensure that what is at issue is accurate, complete, and up to date, and to um, address that, as and Murph will discuss that in much greater issue. Um, for your purposes, though, in terms of helping to advocate for individuals with criminal history, what you're going to want to make sure is that the procedural requirements that are fought, that are imposed upon these background check companies are actually being followed. Okay, um, so what I'm going to talk about is. I'll give you a little bit of information about how you can get your hands on this information, but then also what procedures and substantive requirements attach once you have one of these third party background check companies involved. Um, so oftentimes people will come in and say, I was denied a job, this thing showed up in my record and I want it to go away. The first question is, well, what record are we talking about? Which agency or institution produced the record that the employer or landlord is using. Oftentimes it's tempting to try to send people out to get copies of their records from these CRAs. That is often a losing proposition. And here's, well, at least at the front end, and here's why. So under federal law, under the Fair Credit Reporting Act, which is 15 U.S.C. 1681 and then on down, um, Consumer reporting agencies are required to disclose to consumers all information in the consumer's file at the time of request, okay? The problem is that very few of these companies will generate a report for a consumer. What they'll say if a consumer requests the information in their file is that they don't have a report on that person because they have not yet generated. So unless a particular screening company has generated a report and has maintained that in their file, if you go to any one of these companies, you go to Lexis, you go to Axiom, you go to HireRight, and you say, I want to see a copy of my consumer report, they are not necessarily obligated to give it to you at the front end. So instead, sorry, I'm going to skip ahead and go back. Um, most people are going to be getting these reports after they have already been denied something. And that's because under the Fair Credit Reporting Act, people are entitled to get notice um, any time for employment purposes or any other purposes. They are about to be denied because of a background check. So if you apply for a job, an employer gets a copy of the consumer report and says, I'm just not sure about this. I don't like that misdemeanor conviction from 2008. At that point, an employer is required under the state and federal FICRAs to give you notice and a copy of the report and a disclosure of your rights. Okay, so most of the times when you are going to be seeing an actual consumer report prepared by a CRA, it's going to be at the back end. It's going to be when a person has already either been denied or will shortly be denied because of information contained in that report. Um, reports that are prepared by private consumer reporting agencies are limited in scope and they're limited in content. So they cannot contain everything <laughs> under the sun. The limits aren't often very helpful for folks who have lots of conviction history, but they are there. So I just wanted to highlight some of that for you because there's an interplay here between state and federal law. So under federal law, conviction information can be reported basically for life. A lot of people assume that things wash out. You'll hear that term a lot, like, well, this washed out because it's seven years old. That doesn't apply for the purposes of consumer reporting. That's a sentencing concept. It doesn't have to do with background checks, okay? So for the purposes of a background check, a conviction can be reported pretty much for life. There are two exceptions to that rule under state law. Under the State Fair Credit Reporting Act, if you're applying for a job that pays less than $20,000 a year, 
or if you're applying for rental housing. Convictions can only be reported for seven years from the date of disposition, release, or parole. Those are state law limits. They are not federal limits. And so what you'll find, though, is that a lot of these national background check companies don't pay attention to the state law. So I don't generally counsel people that you can be confident this will not show up. But I do counsel people that if it does show up, and it shouldn't, there is a remedy. Juvenile adjudications are much the same. A lot of people assume that juvenile records are confidential, so it will never show up, so it's not going to hurt me on my background check. That is not true in Washington. In Washington, juvenile records are public, unless you take affirmative steps to seal them. So juvenile adjudications can be reported for life. Again, unless you are applying for a job paying less than $20,000, then state law says that they shall be reported only until the subject of the records is 21. That's a fairly new law. It was passed in 2011. I have seen, fair, I've seen inconsistent application of it, and that hasn't been tested in the courts. Um, but that is a protection that's potentially available to people. And again, unless applying for a rental apartment, then only seven years. Non-conviction information, so arrests not resulting in conviction, can be reported for seven years from the date of entry. So not from the date the case was dismissed, seven years from the date the case was entered. Unless you're applying for a job that pays more than $75,000. And then it's for life. Arrest information is forever. Any questions about those substantive limits? Yes. Well, so I think the answer to that is really it depends. Um, it depends on how reputable and conscientious the screening company is. Um, and it depends on how aggressive they are. Um, you know, the ACLU filed suit against a tenant screening company last spring because it was routinely reporting information past the seven year limit in, for tenant screening purposes. And the company settled fairly quickly. Um, and has, you know, changed all of its screening policies and procedures and retrained everyone and is continuously auditing its information. So I think there is the potential to push back, but I would not assume that these companies are independent of any consumer action following the law. Any other questions? Yes. It, there is no distinction. So long, conviction information under the FICRA is all treated the same, whether it's felony or misdemeanor. It's seven years from the date of uh, disposition, release, or parole. Yes. So I have a damages question. Maybe okay. another speaker is going to cover this, but uh, let's say they report an old conviction, an employer denies their application, uh, and you can establish that that was the sole reason mm -hmm. for the So under the state FICRA, the liability is actual damages. It's a Consumer Protection Act claim. So you're entitled to actual damages, which can be trebled, and then uh, punitives up to $1,000 if the violation was willful. So if the reporting was, you know, was willful as opposed to just negligent. There is some case law um, allowing for consequential damages under the federal FICRA. But if you're going under the state FICRA, it's pretty limited. For example, you can't get, it's damage to uh, business or property. So I, there isn't any case law about forward pay at this point, but I think that's on the table as a possibility. I think that would fall in, I mean, my reading of the statute is that would fall under actual damages. Any other questions about this? Okay. So. The other important limitation on consumer reporting agencies under both the state and federal FICRAs is accuracy. So generally, under both state and federal law, a CRA is required to maintain reasonable procedures to ensure maximum possible accuracy. 
what that means is somewhat of a moving target. Um, and that is almost always a strict fact-based question, which is determined by a jury. So there isn't sort of really perfect case law here about the precise parameters of what reasonable procedures mean. Maximum possible accuracy has been, pretty, has been defined by, by the courts to be more than just technical accuracy. It means the information has to be complete. It means that it cannot be misleading. So something which is technically correct, but which is nevertheless misleading may not be maximally possible accurate. But again, the question is not whether the information is accurate. It's not a strict liability standard. It's whether or not the CRA maintained reasonable procedures to ensure the accuracy. So any type of claim based on this is going to require you to be delving into what this CRA's procedures are. Um, the standard is slightly higher for employment purposes if they're relying on negative public record information like conviction or arrest record. If there's adverse public record information that's reported for employment purposes, a CRA has to do one of two things. Either they have to give the consumer contemporaneous notice, meaning at the time they issue the record to the report, they are also letting the consumer know, I'm issuing a, record, a report to this employer and here's what it says. And very few CRAs do that or they must use strict procedures to ensure that the information reported is complete or up to date. Most consumer advocates argue, and thus far this argument has been pretty successful, that what that means is that the CRA must verify the information against the original source material, that it cannot rely on this sort of, you know, 16 steps down the chain outdated information, that it must in fact go back and verify with the courts or with law enforcement or whoever the original source is, that what they have is the current and most updated status of that record. Um, unfortunately, there are often errors in consumer reports. No one's done a sort of comprehensive audit of how accurate criminal history information is in consumer reports. But I, the, I would say that it is a rare instance when I see a consumer report, which once I check it out, I'm like, yeah, that's good. They did a good job. Um, audits of credit reports have shown that about 40% of credit reports contain material errors that would impact an individual's credit score. Audits of the FBI's database have shown that about 50% of FBI records are incomplete or misleading in some fashion. So I would assume that when you see consumer reports that you need to check them to ensure that the information that is being reported is accurate, complete, and up to date. There are um, a whole ton of different types of inaccuracies. And I'll just sort of highlight a few of the types I see. Um, you will see mismatch. You will see um, Joe, you know, Joe John Smith's report being reported as John Smith's report. So you'll have individuals being confused or mixed up. Um, you will see cases without a disposition reported. So you will see an arrest and then it will tell you nothing about what happened in the case. Uh, you will see cases classified as felonies when they are actually misdemeanors. You will see charges being misreported. People were charged with one offense, convicted of another, but somehow they missed the actual charge the person was convicted of. Um, you will see mischaracterization of the sentences people receive, and you will also see mischaracterization of the dates on which cases resolve. Um, for example, I one time had a client who was convicted of assault in the fourth degree, which is a low-level misdemeanor, in 1989. But the background check reported the case as having occurred in 2007. That was a pretty big gap. And so I went back and I was like, okay, how did this exactly happen? What appears to have happened is that the court computer system randomly closed the case out in 2007. Why that happens, even the court clerks had no idea. They said, well, we just have this computer system and it goes back and it closes things out and it's totally random. And the CRA, instead of reporting the conviction date, reported the closing date. CRAs often conflate closing, formal closing dates of cases with the dates of conviction. So it is fairly common that you will see a conviction date, which is not in fact the date of conviction. 
Um, you'll also see improper reports. You will see reports which include information that they are not allowed to contain under the state or federal FICRAs. Um, so what do you do when that happens? Um, you can petition for a dispute and a reinvestigation. So under both the state and federal Fair Credit Reporting Act, CRAs are required to reinvestigate. If they see, if you dispute information with them, they are required to go back, confirm whether that information is correct, and then reissue a report um, if, in fact, they made a mistake. At that point, the duty is on the CRA. So unless they can verify the accuracy of their information, they must assume that what you are telling them is correct and remove that information. Um, you can, as Steve also mentioned, bring a civil action. Under the State Fair, Fair Credit Reporting Act, it is a CPA claim, a Consumer Protection Act claim, for actual damages, potentially trebled, and potential punitive damages. Um, you can also get injunctive and declaratory relief under the state FICRA. The federal FICRA is a little bit more complicated. There are some parts of the federal FICRA have a cause of action, some parts of them don't. Generally, the federal FICRA does not authorize injunctive relief. Um, I'm not gonna get into the incredibly complicated preemption interplay between the state and federal FICRAs, um, but I will caution you that if you are planning on bringing a state FICRA claim, it, I'm, I'm available to consult about um, preemption issues because Generally, the federal FICRA preempts the state FICRA unless there are specific grandfathering clauses, but that gets to be just incredibly messy, um, and it would take us hours to go through that bit by bit. Um, the other thing I will note for you is that even when they are correct, consumer reports can be misleading. And so oftentimes people will come in upset about what is being reported, and while what what's being reported is technically correct. It is not sort of the picture that your client would want to present to an employer. Um, so this is an actual client of mine who came in last year. Um, this is a, a section from a watch report. So this is what her watch report said about her conviction. Um, if you look down here, it says status, guilty, municipality, code violation, comment, sale or possession of dangerous drugs. So what do you think of when you hear sale or possession of dangerous drugs? That, that is, in fact, exactly what it is. But what would the lay employer think? Narcotics of some variety, manufacturing meth, right? That could mean anything. Um, so if you go and look at the actual code violation, it covers sell, offering to sell, purchase, bartering, exchanging, distributing, possessing, or using any dangerous drug at all. What my client was, in fact, convicted of here was possession of a very small amount of marijuana. Um, but that's not what the consumer report reflected because, of course, that wasn't the formal title given to the charge. So that's an example of something which is technically correct, but nevertheless misleading. Um, I've already mentioned the procedures. The other uh, thing to note about the FICRA is that employers are required to get written authorization. Oftentimes that's included in the application itself. Um, so, and then just be good. Okay. All right, any questions about the FICRA? That was a very quick overview of a very big and messy subject. Yes? So, uh, state and local governments, including law enforcement agencies, have furniture liability under either the state or federal FICRA, just like any other furniture if they provide inaccurate information. So, no one has litigated that question in Washington. We know under federal law that State and local law enforcement agencies are not considered consumer reporting agencies because they don't compile and disseminate information for the purposes of providing information to employers or landlords. Whether or not they count as furnishers, I haven't seen any cases to that effect. Murph, have you seen any to that effect? I don't think anyone has litigated that. But yeah, so both the State Patrol and DSHS, which is the Department of Social and Health Services, which creates its own background checks. Both of those have under state law exemptions from any liability for provision of the information. So I'd be surprised if, well, that's an interesting question. I'd wanna tease that one through. Um, but I, I haven't seen anyone litigating that question yet. 
There is under state law, uh, similarly, a dispute process available to the, for the state patrol and also for state agencies which provide information. So if you see, for example, inaccuracies in watch reports or inaccuracies in the reports prepared by the Department of Social and Health Services Background Check Central Unit, there is a formal dispute process they are required to correct, and if they refuse to do it, you can bring an action against them in Thurston County Superior Court. But that's separate from the FICRA causes of action. Yes. Um, so we got the, so the question was, how did I, how did I help the client with the sale or possession of dangerous drugs? Um, we got the state patrol to add an additional comment in there that says possession of marijuana, um, to make clear that what she was convicted of was not, you know, manufacturing meth. Um, and I also equipped her with the police reports to bring along with her to every single job application that she had. And she also had a Department of Social Health Services issue, so I helped her again clarify with DSHS that what she was convicted of was marijuana possession, not manufacturing meth. Anything else? Yeah. Yeah, so So the question was, if an employer denies a person based on their background check, but then also says, well, but I don't like the handwriting, um, are they still obligated to give them a copy of their background check report? The answer to that question is yes. The FICRA is very clear that if the, if the background check forms any part of the reason to deny a person, even if there's other reasons, they still have to provide a pre-adverse action notice. They still have to provide a copy of the report. Do lots of employers ignore that law? Yes. Um, and whether or not there's a right of action to sue employers who violate that law is still being litigated. Um, some courts have held no, that you have no private right of action to enforce that adverse action notice requirement. Some courts have held yes. Um, generally, I have found that most employers, if people call them and say, under the FICRA, you are required to give me a copy of this information, will give you a copy of that information. Um, and even if they won't, they will almost uniformly tell you who the CRA was who provided the report, and then you can get it from the CRA, because at that point, the CRA has a report, which they have generated, and you are entitled to get it. Other questions? Those are good questions. Okay, so now we're going to get into the nitty-gritty of vacating records. Um, this is what most people want when they come to a legal clinic. They want to get this thing to go away so they never have to deal with it again. Um, vacating is a limited remedy. It is not available to most people, um, and it doesn't do everything most people would want. But it is a good sort of first step. Um, so why does a vacate help? Well, first, it actually gives you the legal right to say that you have never been convicted. That can be a double-edged sword, and we'll talk about why, um, but it is an important right. It prevents dissemination by the state patrol and by the BCCU Background Check Central Unit at DSHS. And most of the, a significant portion of the client base, who I see at least, are folks who want to work in um, nursing or as home care aides and who have to go through this enormous background check process run by the State Department of Social and Health Services. So both the WSP and BCCU will treat a vacated case like it doesn't exist. They just don't report it at all. Um, a vacate can help to limit or modify the reporting of a case by CRAs. Some CRAs treat vacates like the WSP does, like they don't exist. Some CRAs will treat a vacate like an update and will just update the status to say vacated and dismissed. Um, a vacate also removes all barriers to occupational licensing. So for those professions which are regulated by the state, um, nursing and healthcare and home aides are probably the, the most numerous of those groups, but there are also lots of others, mortgage brokers, tow truck drivers, uh, massage therapists. Vacating removes the barrier. So if there is a barrier that this conviction is posing to this person being licensed, the vacate makes the case sort of poof and disappear for that purpose. Um, so there are different rules for eligibility for misdemeanors and felonies. Um, misdemeanors are actually harder to vacate. Um, 
So the first requirement and what trips most people up is that you have to have completed all of the terms of your sentence. All of the terms includes, as Nick will discuss at great length, all of the financial terms of your sentence. And so if a person was given, you know, $700 in legal financial obligations and they have not yet paid them, they will not be eligible to vacate their conviction. It doesn't matter how long it's been since the conviction, you are not eligible until you have paid all your LFOs or unless they've expired. Um, and we'll talk about expiration. Nick, are you going to talk about expiration? Okay, so then I'll leave that to Nick. Um, for misdemeanors, you can have no conviction since the date you were convicted for the particular crime you want to vacate. So it's not no conviction since the date you complete your sentence. It's no convictions from the date that you are convicted. You have to have no pending charges, um, never previously vacated, no restraining orders or no contact orders within the past five years. And then there are whole hosts of misdemeanor crimes that cannot be vacated. Um, violent offenses, DUIs, sex offenses, crimes against persons. Um, and it has to have been at least three years since you completed your sentence. A lot of people will come in and they have outstanding LFOs and they say, well, if I borrow money from my cousin and pay it tomorrow, can I vacate tomorrow? And the answer to that question, unfortunately, is no. The three-year period, the waiting period, whatever it is, three, five, ten years, runs from the date of completion of the sentence, not from the date um, of conviction. So if it takes a person 10 years to pay their LFOs, then they have an additional waiting period on top of that. Um, I have never been able to even con think, conceive of an argument to make to a court to go, to go outside of that. Um, if any of you can come up with one, I would love to hear it. Um, the practical impact, though, of all of these eligibility requirements for misdemeanors is that you can only vacate one misdemeanor, and that would be your most recent misdemeanor. So if you have a client who has three or four or five misdemeanors, and really most of them are DWLS3, and that's not a big deal, but they've got an assault four, you know, from 10 years ago, and that's what they really want to get rid of, they won't be able to do it. You don't get to pick and choose which misdemeanor you want. You get to vacate one and only the most recent one. You cannot sort of work your way backwards because in order to vacate, you have to prove you've never previously vacated. So for a misdemeanor, you can't work your way backwards through multiple misdemeanors. You can work your way backwards for felonies, but not for misdemeanors. There have been bills that have been introduced in the legislature to allow vacation of multiple misdemeanors. They have not yet gone anywhere. I sincerely hope they do. Because oftentimes what you'll see are people who have sort of, you know, a ticky-tacky DWLS3, and that's not the issue, but that's blocking them up from doing anything else. Um, there are some areas, and I'm not going to go into great depth about these that are a little more complicated. Um, the first is what are known as prior offenses for DUI law. So these are, are cases which are charged as DUIs, but then pled down usually as a first offense to something lesser, a negligent driving or a reckless driving. Under current law, um, you can't vacate anything that would be a prior offense unless you can prove that you have no subsequent drug or alcohol violations, which is undefined, within 10 years. So that in effect, extends the waiting period for those prior offenses for to 10 years, as opposed to the three. That was only effective in 2012. There's a good retroactivity argument to be made in there. Um, but those areas are, that's a, a little messier than your typical vacate. Another sort of messier than your typical vacate area are prostitution cases. Um, prostitution can be vacated. Lots of people erroneously think it can't because it, um, technically counts as a crime against persons, but suffice it to say, yes, you can do it. Um, the legislature passed a law last year which said that you could vacate potentially without a waiting period if you committed prostitution as a result of being a victim of trafficking, and there's um, statutory definitions for that. I don't know if anyone has ever used this law. Every once in a while I put out feelers to the other defense attorneys to say, anyone done one of these yet? Not that I know of. Um, but if you have a client who has prostitution convictions that are more recent, who could potentially prove that he or she committed that as a result of being a victim of trafficking, there may be, they may be able to skirt some of the um, 
time and completion of sentence requirements of the vacate law. Um, the other more complicated area is domestic violence convictions. Domestic violence under Washington law is not a crime in and of itself. It's a designation tacked on to other crimes, um, often assault or malicious mischief or harassment. Um, if the court determines that a conviction involves DV, and it doesn't have to be formally tacked on or charged that way, the court can determine it on their own volition, um, then the waiting period is five years, and the person can never have been previously convicted of a DV crime. Um, so if you have someone who has two domestic violence assaults, they will be precluded from vacating both of those. Any questions about the misdemeanor eligibility? Okay, felony eligibility. Fel felonies are easier to vacate, um, which most people find to be ridiculous. Um, in order to vacate a felony like a misdemeanor, you have to have completed your sentence. You can have had no conviction since the date that you were discharged. Discharge is actually a formal process under RCW 9948637. Um, when you are discharged, you get a, a certificate of completion, basically, a certificate of discharge from the court that says, yep, you've done everything you needed to do. You did your time, you've done your probation, you paid your legal financial obligations. The waiting period for a felony vacate and the no conviction period for a felony vacate start from the date of discharge. So anything that happens between the date of conviction and the date of discharge is technically a freebie. Um, so that means if your client has some misdemeanors in there while they're paying off their LFOs, those subsequent misdemeanors do not necessarily preclude vacating the earlier felonies. The wait periods are a little longer. Um, five years for a class C, 10 years for a class B. You cannot, pro, you cannot vacate a class A, or at least there's an implied prohibition against there because there's no wait period laid out for it. Um, and then again, there are certain crimes that cannot be vacated. You can't vacate crimes against persons. You can't vacate violent offenses. You can't vacate uh, felony DUIs effective August 2012. Um, so really, what can you vacate? Thefts and drugs, mostly. Um, that'll be the, the, the bulk of the cases that you will see. Um, you cannot vacate assault two or assault three. You cannot vacate robbery. Um, and you know, there's a whole list. I think the KCBA has compiled a list of crimes that are ineligible for vacate. I have a list as well. Um, and so it, it's worth going through the statutes just to make sure the crime is one um, for which vacate is eligible. The difference between the felony and misdemeanor laws is that you actually can work your way backwards. So if a person has only felonies, you can start at the most recent felony, vacate that one, go back to the second most recent, vacate that one, and just keep going on back until you've either vacated everything or you run into something that can't be vacated. The most I've ever done is 10. Um, I would advise you if you are going to be exploiting that particular loophole to pad the record as much as possible. Ordinarily on a vacate, uh, particularly in King County, it can be pretty bare bones. You can just say person meets this requirement, this requirement, this requirement. There's a form, you can just check the boxes. If you're gonna be trying to do 10 or four or six of these, I would advise you to try to present really compelling evidence of rehabilitation in this person's efforts to turn their lives around. Um, you know, generally these go easier if the prosecutor agrees to vacate, and generally the prosecutor will be less uh, excited to agree to vacate 10 or 12 crimes. Um, so it is possible, but it is something you want to approach a little more carefully if you're going to be uh, doing more than one. Um, certificate of discharge often present a problem. Most of the people you will see who have felony convictions will come in and they won't have a certificate of discharge. Um, the courts were really, really bad about issuing, they're still pretty bad about issuing them, um, but they were particularly bad about issuing them in the 80s and 90s. It was just like they never happened. Um, most of the time the court and the prosecutor will agree to backdate your certificate of discharge. Um, there is a little hiccup in Snohomish County uh, there's a case called State versus Johnson where the court held, well, we don't have to issue a certificate of discharge until the court has notice that you have completed your sentence and who the obligation, who has the obligation to provide notice depends really on the type of case and when it happened and what the requirements are. 
but generally the courts will backdate CODs pretty easily. So you'll want to get those backdated to the date that the person completed all the terms of their sentence, which is most often than not the date they paid their LFOs. Um, Nick will get into this at greater length, so I'm just going to kind of skim over this. But for felonies pre-2000, um, LFOs expired. Currently, they don't. Currently, if a person has been convicted from 2000 on in Superior Court, they have to pay them um, or get them waived. But pre-2000, LFOs would just expire. Um, and the date of expiration would be calculated from 10 years from the release of their initial period of incarceration. Um, so oftentimes for pre-2000 LFOs, even if a person hasn't paid them, they may still be eligible to vacate because the LFOs have expired. And then you just petition to get the COD backdated to the date the LFO expired. Does that make sense? Um, I, you will also often see, and Nick will talk about this, I'm sure, um, extensions of jurisdiction to collect on LFOs. I would check those dates really, really carefully. Um, there was a time when the courts had a habit of giving extensions even though the prosecutor applied too late. So you, could, you have to apply for the extension within the 10-year period, and oftentimes prosecutors would miss it by a couple of months. Um, if that has happened, that extension is invalid, and the LFOs have expired, and your client can still vacate. So I would check those carefully. Um, the date of release from initial period of incarceration is something that you can get from DOC. You'll need to get, or the jail, you'll need to actually get the person's discharge date from the jail as proof of when that happened. Um, and what it means is total confinement, not like probation um, or anything like that. It's actual, you know, full confinement within a, within a facility. Um, another area where this gets really, really, really messy is deferred sentences or probationary sentences. Um, oftentimes, you will have clients who come to you who plead guilty either to a felony offense if it was pre-1984 pre or to misdemeanor offenses that are charged in superior court. So they were charged with a felony, pled down to a misdemeanor. And then people are given um, deferred sentences or some kind of a probationary period where the court says, okay, you pled guilty, but I'm going to give you two years of probation. And if you, you know, do your, if you are, are good during those two years and you pay your LFOs, I will dismiss the case. And I watch courts say this and you can, and, and it will be as if it never happened. The problem is, is that once you plead guilty for the purposes of the state patrol and for the purposes of these background check companies, it has happened. And that subsequent dismissal doesn't do you a lick of beans. It doesn't do you, a, a, you know, a lick of good. It doesn't amount to a hill of beans. I was mixing my metaphors. Um, because what the state patrol will report, if you get a deferred sentence, is it will report, um, you know, possession of a controlled substance, guilty, status, update, dismissed. What does that mean? For the purposes of licensing, that means you're guilty. For the purposes of most employers, that means you're guilty. And the dismissal does nothing because the record of the conviction still exists unless you get rid of the conviction record. So oftentimes when people come in with those kinds of cases, there's a sort of a, a risk assessment. If this is the person's only conviction or, you know, if, if it's sometimes the path of least resistance is to just go ahead and vacate the case which has already been dismissed. Because what you get from the vacate is the formal withdrawing of the guilty plea, which is good enough for the state patrol to stop disseminating the case. Sometimes you don't want to have to go through that vacate step. Maybe the person isn't eligible to do it, right? The time hasn't elapsed or they haven't paid, you know, or, or maybe they have something else they really want to vacate and you don't want to use up their vacate on this. Um, there are two cases which speak to this and it is, it is a messy, messy, messy area. Um, the two cases are Brazil and In Ray Carrier. Brazil is a 2001 case. What happened in Brazil was these were felony charges which were pre the Sentencing Reform Act. So pre the SRA in 1984, you could get probation for anything. Um, you could get probation for murder. And so people would get these deferred probationary sentences complete and then have their cases dismissed and think, okay, well, that's good. I'm done. I'm not convicted. Um, so Brazil involved two defendants who had gone through that process and whose reports of conviction were still being disseminated by the state patrol. 
who then applied to vacate their records. And the state patrol said, you can't vacate because this is a pre-SRA dismissal and it doesn't, it's not covered by the vacate statute. And what the state Supreme Court said there is that a pre-SRA dismissal is the same thing as a vacate. That the intention of both of those things, because both of those, those statutes involve the sort of magic words that you are released from all penalties and disabilities, that those are meant to have the same effect. And so that a person with a pre-SRA dismissal could, in fact, have their case vacated and not disseminated by the state patrol. In Carrier, the court took that a step further. Um, after Brazil, what happened is that the legislature passed a law which said, well, sure, but if you want to vacate a pre-SRA dismissal, you have to actually go through the vacate statute. And you have to meet all the requirements of the felony vacate statute. There are a lot of people who can't meet those requirements for whatever reason. And Carrier was one of those cases. He had been convicted of indecent liberties, which is a conviction that cannot be vacated. It was dismissed, pre-SRA, and then he was convicted of another crime and they wanted to include his pre-SRA dismissal to enhance his sentence. What the state Supreme Court said there is that, look, if you get a dismissal after a period of vacate, you have a vested right to have your conviction be considered vacated. And you don't have to go through this sort of two-step vacation process under the new statute. Um, so what that amounts to in practical purposes for your clients is, if you have someone who has a dismissal, the first step is we'll figure out if they're eligible to vacate under the current vacate statutes. If they are, and there's no reason not to vacate, you can go ahead and just vacate it. Sometimes the judge will say, am I entitled, am I allowed to do this? Because hasn't this already been dismissed? And the answer is yes, your honor, you can. Um, if you have a client who has a dismissal a, after a deferral, which they can't vacate or they might not want to vacate, all is not necessarily lost. And you can rely on Carrier in Brazil to say basically that the state patrol should give effect to the dismissal as if it were a vacate. Um, I have done both of those and I'm happy to sort of talk you through the process for how that works. Um, misdemeanors might be a little more complicated if they are filed in district um, court or municipal court, whether you have to go through a one-step or a two-step vacation. Again, I'm not going to get deeply into the weeds of that, but I'm available if you run into a situation like that. Any questions about that? You're lying. Yeah, I mean, so normally in those situations, I, I call employers directly and I say, listen, you know, this case was dismissed. This person was advised that the case had been dismissed and that they could proceed as if it was dismissed. So if there was a misrepresentation, it certainly was not intentional and it wasn't material. Um, and, you know, I'm working with this person to get it off of their record, to, to remove the formal conviction label. Um, but, you know, at the front end, right, if people haven't gone through that process, honestly, what I advise people who have sort of dismissals after probation is to disclose it at some point in the process, because it is very likely that it will show up in a background check unless you have taken affirmative steps to seal it or vacate it. So you might not need to disclose it in response to the question, have you ever been convicted? But you certainly want to flag it for somebody before a background check is run. Any other questions? Okay, um, retroactivity is another sort of just issue that I flag for folks. Um, the vacate statutes change all the time, right? Um, the legislature has been tinkering around the edges with it. Oftentimes they are tinkering to make it harder to vacate things. Um, if your client is ineligible under current law, I would check to make sure that they didn't become eligible at some point and then have that right taken away from them. Both the state and, and federal courts have held that um, people earn a vested right to apply for some form of discretionary relief. So if you were eligible to vacate, for example, in 2008, and then the legislature changed the law in 2009, 
you are entitled to proceed under 2008 law. Um, Carrier is a good example of that case. INS versus St. Sarah is another one. The, probably the clearest case on point is State versus TK, which is a 2000 case that involved a juvenile um, who petitioned to seal his records. So he applied under the, under, uh, he became eligible, and then the legislature changed the law so that he was no longer eligible, and he wanted to basically go and proceed under the old law. And the state said, the Supreme Court said, yes, you can do that. Um, you earned the right to apply before the legislature changed the law, and the legislature can't take that right away from you. Um, the easiest place to make these are pre-SRA dismissals and the DUI prior offenses, but there are there may be other areas of the law where this type of an argument is, is open to you. Um, so what are the limits of vacating? A vacate is a good first step. It is not the last step. Um, the biggest limitation of a vacate is that the court records are still there for a vacate. And the vacate is the last entry on a very long record. So if you look at the docket of a vacated case, it will say that you were charged. It will say that you pled guilty. It will say that you were convicted. It will say that you were sentenced. And then at the bottom, it will say order vacating conviction. Private background check companies are within their rights to report vacated cases. They have to report them as vacated. But if they decide to report the cases, they are entitled to do so. There's bad case law from the Southern District of New York in a case called Oba Bubeki versus Choice Point, which says basically, hey, if the records are available, you can report what's in the records, even if the case has been vacated. Um, and so that puts your clients and my clients sort of between a rock and a hard place because they're entitled to say they're not convicted, but if the records show up, then they're a liar. And an employer can legally deny a person for lying, even if they couldn't legally deny you because of the conviction itself. Um, so again, there isn't really a good, clean solution to this problem. People can petition to seal, and I'll get to that in a second. Um, but oftentimes you will have to advise people like, look, when you get that question, have you ever been convicted? If your case has been vacated and you only have that one case, you're entitled to say no, but I can't promise you that this is never going to show up. My advice to people is generally, if you think an employer is going to do a background check on you, you're going to want to flag that at some point during the process. Um, you don't have to, but if you don't, you run the risk that they think you're a liar. And if you do, you run the risk that they're not going to hire you because of the vacated case. Um, it is very much a rock and a hard place. But a vacate does help to the extent that it legally erases the conviction, right? And so oftentimes if I have clients who have vacated convictions, I am able to call the landlord or employer up and say, that case has been vacated. The state of Washington does not consider that case a conviction anymore. The state of Washington does not disseminate that case anymore in its background check. It doesn't use it for the purposes of licensing. This person is legally entitled to say they've never been convicted. This is, this is a lot like a judicial pardon. And that is sometimes enough. It's not always enough, but it is sometimes enough. Yes. Yeah, I mean, usually, uh, yes, oftentimes I'll tell people you can say you have a vacated case. I actually just, we will avoid the conviction word. Because um, it's not a conviction anymore, right? It is legally not a conviction anymore. Um, so they shouldn't have to say it's conviction, but they can say, yes, I have a vacated case. Now, if the employer presses them, you know, I mean, they're entitled to say they've never been convicted, but that doesn't necessarily insulate them from consequences for exercising that right. Um, there's no private right of action against an employer just because they considered a vacated case, for example. Any other questions about that? Um, okay. So... Vacating is good. It is not everything. Sealing is sort of the gold standard for what you can do um, in terms of limiting dissemination of court records. Not surprisingly, it is also really, really hard to do. Um, so sealing helps, um, and it helps most in these circumstances. First, a sealed case gets removed from an FBI background check. So to the extent that you have someone who's in a licensed field where they're going to be getting an FBI background check, Sealing just makes the FBI stop recording those cases. 
the FBI still reports vacated cases, um, but they do not report sealed cases. Sealing removes cases from the court's website and it removes them from the SCOMIS data dump. The SCOMIS data dump doesn't include a sealed case and a sealed case isn't gonna be on the Washington court's website. Sealed cases are still available sometimes in JIS. Um, it depends on what court you're in, honestly. In some courts, sealed cases just sort of disappear. And in some courts, sealed cases will show up with a case number and then the notation sealed. So you'll still see that a case exists, but you won't be able to see anything about it. Um, in Pierce County, sealed cases will show up on their links system, which also has a public website. So if someone knows to search for Pierce County and knows to search links, you'll see a sealed case um, with CR for criminal if it's a criminal case and then vacated if it has been vacated. If it hasn't been vacated, then links will show you what the original underlying charge is. Um, sealed cases also, I, I think, and the best, I, you know, this hasn't been fully litigated, but I think this is correct, um, limit reporting in FICRA. Because a consumer reporting agency can't ensure maximum possible accuracy of the information if the source material doesn't have the information anymore. Um, and they cannot ensure that information is complete and up to date if the source material has eliminated it. For the most part, private background check companies will take sealed cases out. Um, that seems to be fairly standard industry practice. So again, it is possible to just get cases to not be reported by CRAs if they have been fully sealed by the courts. Um, sealing though runs up against really, really high headwinds in Washington state. Um, and I'm gonna go through sort of a little history to do this. So the Washington Constitution contains a provision, Article 1, Section 10, that says justice in all cases shall be administered openly. Um, our state courts have, over the years, interpreted that to mean all records of all cases shall be publicly available in whatever format they can be available forever and ever so long as we all shall live. Um, the sort of seminal case on this is Seattle Times versus Ishikawa. Ishikawa was, it's actually not a case about sealing records at all, but it has since been applied to sealing records. Ishikawa was a case involving the closure of a hearing in a high profile murder case. Um, they wanted to close the suppression hearing to the public and then seal all of the records of that suppression hearing. And what the court said is that no, Article 1, Section 10 forbids you from just sort of unilaterally, without any analysis, closing these hearings and records. Instead, what you need to do is go through sort of a five-part analysis. Um, you have to determine that there is a serious and compelling threat, serious and imminent threat to a compelling interest or a um, legitimate threat to the defendant's fair trial rights. You have to show that the private interest outweighs the public interest. You have to show that sealing is the least restrictive means to get accomplished what you need to accomplish to protect those interests. There has to be notice and an opportunity to object. And the order has to be limited in duration and scope. You can't just seal everything. You have to really only seal what's necessary to protect the interest at issue. Um, since Ishikawa, though, um, our state Supreme Court and, and the appellate courts have applied Ishikawa not just to hearings, but also to records, and not just to records which of hearings that were closed, but also records of hearings that were open. And not just records which have never been public, but also records which were public for a long time, and only now after the fact are sought to be sealed. Um, I've just listed out some of those cases, and I'm not going to get into exhaustive detail um, about all of them, but if you are interested in pursuing sealing cases, I highly recommend that you read all of these. Um, the most recent one is State versus Chen, and there the Supreme Court held pretty strongly. Chen was a, um, a motion to redact records of a competency report in a criminal, in a pending murder trial. Um, the defendant had, was forced by state to undergo an evaluation of his competence. The competency report includes basically his entire medical history, um, and they wanted to redact some of the more sensitive private information. Um, the court said that you cannot just do that by statute and you cannot do it categorically. Instead, you need to analyze in every individual case for every individual speck of information that you are seeking to redact, why that information must be redacted, for how long and under what circumstances. 
Um, we do have a court rule, GR 15, which is currently under amendment. Um, and GR 15 says that vacating a case is a sufficient privacy concern to be weighed against the public interest in access to the court records. So initially, I think everyone who was involved in that process thought, well, that means you can just seal vacated cases, right? It's been vacated, that's good enough, now we can seal it. Unfortunately, that has not been the case. Because right around the time that GR 15 was amended, the Seattle Times did an enormous expose about sealing in the courts. And a lot of the cases that they exposed were ones where legitimately the records should never have been sealed, and where records were sealed to protect powerful interests, and where records were sealed to protect against judicial misconduct. Um, but the impact of this sort of expose of sealing has been that the courts are extremely reluctant now to seal. So whereas in 2000, it seems like you could just go in and say, well, my case has been vacated, and then the court would seal it automatically. Now that is not the case. Um, now what the courts have held is that a vacate is um, sufficient to be considered, but it is not sufficient to actually acquire a sealing. You still have to show some individualized imminent threat in your particular circumstances to justify sealing your particular case. A vacate weighs into that, but it is not enough. You can't just go in and say, well, my case has been vacated. Um, the burden of proving that sealing should happen is always on the proponent of sealing. And so even if you get a record sealed, that doesn't necessarily mean your record shall stay sealed. Um, there was a recent case that came out last year, State versus Richardson, which involved a denial of a motion to unseal. Uh, Mr. Richardson got his misdemeanor case vacated and then got it sealed a few years later and then decided to run for state senate. And his opponent uncovered the fact that he had a sealed case. The media sought to unseal the records and the court denied it and said, hey, this has been vacated and it's been sealed. Um, what the Supreme Court held, and it was sort of a technical procedural posture, but they, they essentially held that the bird, that a vacated criminal record is one to which the presumption of openness attaches. So even if a case has been vacated, the Constitution still applies. And the burden of proving that sealing should happen always remains on the person who wants to seal. So at any time, if the media wants to come in and say, hey, I want to see this sealed record, you basically have to go back in and relitigate the sealing motion from the get-go. Um, the courts have also added in an additional wrinkle, and this is a case which the Northwest Justice Project is litigating, which is currently um, before the state Supreme Court. They heard argument in the summer, and it's a case called Huntoff versus Encarnacion. It's a tenant screening case. So here the tenants were sued for unlawful detainer. Um, they, they prevailed. They settled on terms favorable to themselves, so they were never evicted. And the trial court actually found that the filing of the eviction was meritless. Um, basically, the landlord wanted to break the lease, and so they filed for eviction. Um, but what the court held there is that these tenants' interest in protecting their access to rental housing was the same as every other tenant in the universe. And nothing in this particular case distinguished these persons from anybody else. Essentially, the implication of Encarnacion was that unless an interest is unique, a case cannot be sealed. That has pretty serious implications for vacated criminal records, because of course, every person who vacates a case and wants to seal it for employment purposes um, would confront the argument that, hey, everybody else who vacates a case and wants to seal it for employment purposes would be allowed to seal if you allow this motion to go forward. Um, so Encarnacion is pending, but right now in Division I, it still remains the law. And so in addition to sort of proving a serious threat in your, in your individual circumstances, you will confront the argument, well, there's nothing special about this person. There are lots of people who have vacated cases and want to seal them in order for, to protect their access to employment or housing. What makes your client so special is basically the argument there. Um, so, you know, what sorts of facts help making, make a sealing case? I will say that I bring sealing cases pretty cautiously. They are easier in some counties than others. King County is one of the harder counties to do it in. Um, you want some identifiable concrete loss. 
So, you know, generally if folks come in and say, well, I applied for this job and I didn't get it. And then my next question is, did they tell you why? No, they didn't tell me why. I just never heard back from them. That's usually not a case where I think sealing is a viable option. Um, I tend to bring sealing cases where people are given offers and then have those offers rescinded on account of the background check. Or um, when people are given copies of the background check that show some kind of a recommendation or negative action. Um, you want people who are still looking, right? Who are still looking for jobs or housing similar to the ones they've been denied. You wanna know how that case was reported and by whom, and you wanna establish for the court that sealing is actually going to matter. Um, and then you'll wanna present compelling evidence of rehabilitation. Again, why this person doesn't pose a risk, why sealing this case isn't going to lead to some horrific danger, why this will not be the next Maurice Clemens type of story. Um, Again, some counties are easier than others. King County is one of the harder ones. Um, I have never had the King County prosecuting attorney not oppose a sealing motion. They will often also alert the media to the fact that sealing motions are pending and then you get media opposition as well. Um, I'll note non-conviction records are a little more challenging. There is some case law supporting the idea that non-conviction records can be redacted or sealed. Um, JS versus state, it's unpublished, but it's a good case. The problem really is with GR 15. The current court rule says that um, when you seal a record, the charge shall be displayed unless the case has been vacated, in which case it says vacated. So if you have someone who has a non-conviction, let's say they were charged with theft and they weren't convicted, if you seal that record, it will say person's name, criminal, theft, sealed. It doesn't say they weren't convicted. So oftentimes sealing a non-conviction doesn't help. There are some courts, particularly courts of limited jurisdiction, where sealed records just sort of poof, disappear. And in that case, I'd say sealing a non-conviction helps. But I would check what happens when you seal a non-conviction record before seeking to do that. Um, they are currently considering a rule that would change GR 15 that would say if a case has been dismissed and is sealed, then it shall say um, non-conviction instead of what you were charged with. But that hasn't been adopted yet. And so until that rule is adopted, um, I would tread carefully in the non-conviction territory. Um, redaction is another issue that is sort of hot right now. A lot of people have tried to redact names from the court indices, right, under the assumption that if you're searching for John Smith and it says JS, then they won't see the case. Um, there is case law, good case law, that says that you can do that. But again, Encarnacion um, sort of is against that precedent. And there is a proposal right now in GR 15 to just prohibit redaction of the name altogether. Um, so you would never be able to do that under any circumstances. Juvenile sealing is a little bit different. Right now, for now, juvenile sealing is done by statute. Um, it's 1350050, and the requirements are pretty simple. You've got to pay your restitution, and it has to have been uh, either two or five years, depending on the kind of crime. Unlike adult cases, in juvenile cases, you can pay today, seal tomorrow. You can pay your restitution today and seal the case tomorrow. There is not currently a requirement that you meet Ishikawa. That may change. The King County Prosecuting Attorney is appealing a case right now called State versus SJC. It's in Division I, where they are arguing that even for juvenile records, Ishikawa has to be met. Um, if you run into people with juvenile records, I would encourage them to get their sealing petitions in now. Um, SJC may turn out very badly. Um, and if it does, then juveniles will, have, will be in the same situation as adults in terms of having to prove that very serious and imminent threat. Um, so I would, you know, again, I would move aggressively on sealing juvenile records now because the law may change. I hope it doesn't, but it is a very distinct possibility. Um, so what happens after you seal a record? And sealing is done by motion to the prosecuting attorney to the judge who heard the original case. Um, you should notify law enforcement, so you should notify DOC, you should notify the state patrol, you should notify the local sheriff's office. I would review GOMIS and JIS and LINCS and all the other court systems to ensure that the order is entered and entered accurately. Sometimes the clerks don't enter these orders. 
or sometimes they enter them incorrectly. So I would check on that. Um, whether you affirmatively notify CRAs up front, I think, is an interesting ethical issue. Um, so I'm just going to flag it because I don't have an answer to that. Um, many of the CRAs have gotten together to create something that they're calling the expungement clearinghouse, which is basically a place where you notify them that the record has been sealed and then they disseminate it out to each other so that they can seal the records. I have concerns about that for two reasons. One, I think you shouldn't have to tell them. They're required under the FICRA to find out anyhow. And two, in notifying a CRA that a record has been sealed, you are giving them independent confirmation that the record exists. Um, and basically trusting to their ethical judgment not to report the sealed case anyhow. So, you know, again, I, that makes me nervous. I think it's a, the kind of situation to be evaluated in each individual case. Um, so that's all I've got. Any questions, comments, concerns, brilliant ideas? Yes. So Yeah, so if, you, if you're if you not sort of trying to notify people at the front end, um, I advise clients to, to monitor and then help them advocate for dispute and removal um, and potential damages claims if that information is reported. Um, the hard part with sort of upfront notification to CRAs that all this is happening is that there are so many of them. And there isn't sort of a comprehensive regulatory database that says here are the 200 CRAs operating in Washington, right? I mean, any guy with a computer in his garage could call himself a CRA. Um, they're not strictly regulated. There's no comprehensive list. So trying to notify everyone up front can feel like a losing battle. Um, you know, you can know sort of who some of the bigger players are, but they, these companies sort of crop up all over the place. Any other questions? Yes. So you, you still have to go to court, but there is an actual statute that says the court, well, whether it's mandatory or permissive is still being litigated, but there is a statute which says these are the conditions under which a juvenile record can or shall be sealed. Um, unlike for adult sealing where you're going under a mixture of case law and court rule. Any other? Yes. I would say for vacating, 85% of the process is, diagnosed, is diagnostic. It's figuring out, are you eligible and what can you vacate? Sealing is a lot more involved. But, but for vacating purposes, it's all diagnostic. It's what do you got and can you vacate any of it? And so that, I think, is something which, so long as you have access to GIS, um, can be done potentially in a clinical setting. And oftentimes, if they're uncomplicated vacates, I, will, I, I just help people fill out the forms and send them on their way. Um, I only will, you know, file the motions myself if it's a messier one. Yes. So the juvenile statute both vacates and seals at the same time. Um, so there, there, and, and it also covers deferrals and non-convictions as well and seals them. But if it is a conviction and goes under the juvenile statute, it vacates and seals it simultaneously. Any other questions, Steve? Uh, if you apply to the Coast Guard for semen papers, they Ooh. ask, uh, have you ever been convicted of a crime, including convictions that have been sealed, expunged, vacated, otherwise obliterated? Uh, I assume it's not a good idea to answer that question, no, even yeah. if you have a state court sealing order. But my real question is, will the FBI still honor a state court sealing record, or will they just look 
So the FBI does not disseminate for public consumption a state sealing order. I have never run into a situation where I've had the opportunity to figure out exactly what they do for military purposes. My guess would be that like the state patrol, the FBI maintains a separate database for their own purposes than the public consumption database. Um, I, yeah, I mean, I, there is nothing under either state or federal law that prohibits anyone from asking about things which have been vacated, sealed, expunged, obliterated. And the more crafty employers among us um, will have whole paragraphs of questions. Over Lake Hospital, I think it's like a whole page just for the conviction question. So if you have a person who's in that situation, then yeah, I, I think the best advice is we want to disclose that. Even if it's sealed, even if it's not going to show up in a background check, you know, we live in the internet age and it's hard to obliterate information entirely. And so if someone very clearly wants to find out about vacated or sealed or expunged cases, they will probably do so. Um, and, and again, the non-disclosure is itself a good enough reason for denial. Any other questions? Well, thank you all for your attention on an early morning after a long weekend. Everybody, as you can see on the PowerPoint, we're going to talk about employment and criminal records. We have a pretty good idea from Vanessa about what criminal records are. So what we're going to do for, I think, the next hour, hour, hour and a half, hour. We're going to, I just show up, um, hope for the best. We're going to talk about ban the box, what that means. You've probably heard that term thrown around all over. We're going to talk about the new, how many people have heard of the new Seattle Jobs Assistance Ordinance? Anybody? Very exciting. It went into effect November 1st. We're going to talk about disparate impact discrimination and how that's different from disparate treatment. We're going to look at the new EEOC guidance that came out. And we're going to go through some case examples so you can work through your new knowledge. So hopefully you can see this. This is a map of Ban the Box movement. These are states that have banned the box or some version of it. Washington has the job assistance ordinance and has a state regulation about how you can use criminal records in public employment, but there is a case that says it's not enforceable. So this movement has gone across the country, even in states where you wouldn't think of it. And why, can folks think of some reasons why we, why this movement has taken hold and really gone forward with supporting unlikely places? Because lots of people have a criminal record. One in four, some say one in three, there's different statistics. I go with a little more conservative because I'm a little more conservative. So say one in four, generally speaking, million Americans have a criminal record. That means most people, probably a quarter of this room has a criminal record. And probably more than half or three quarters, I would say, know someone, a friend, a family member, or I've worked with a client who has a criminal record. So it's expansive, and we'll talk a little bit more about why that is. Vanessa talked a little bit about it. And what has happened, what has changed is now there are significant laws were passed in the 80s and 90s that prevented people from getting certain kinds of occupational licenses, certain kinds of jobs, if they have a criminal record. And at the same time that was happening, this huge background industry exploded and has become a billion dollar industry, and employers and housing providers, now all, almost all of them, check to see if someone has a criminal record. And there's become this idea that somehow a criminal record says whether or not someone is a good employee. We're going to talk more about that. And what the Ban the Box movement does is said, look, let's give people an opportunity to at least be looked at on the merits of who they are as an employee rather than just on their criminal record. And let's not automatically exclude most people. Okay, so the Jobs Assistance Ordinance went into effect November 1st. That was a three-year struggle, I won't say battle, to try to make a change in how private employers in Seattle dealt with someone who had a criminal record. It's a compromise legislation, so it's somewhat complex because it tried to meet the sides of people with who have a criminal history as well as employers. So we'll go through the factors on the Seattle Office of Civil Rights webpage. There's lots of information about that. There's a couple folks here from the Seattle Office of Civil Rights. Can you wave? So if you have questions, these are the folks to talk to. Talk to. There is in your, <clears throat> in your materials an FAQ about the ordinance that I think has about 60 questions or so. So it is, it is somewhat complicated. 
So in Seattle, unlike some of you may be familiar with Title VII, the Job Assistance Ordinance applies to almost all businesses who have at least one employee working 50% of the time in Seattle. There are some exceptions to that. So if the job in question is working with children or with vulnerable adults, then the ordinance does not apply to that specific position. It also doesn't apply to positions involving enforcement, law enforcement, or certain security jobs. So an employer on an application or prior to an initial screening cannot ask about a criminal record. What is an initial screening? An initial screening is going through the resumes, through the job applications, and making sure that people have the basic requirements for the job. So if you are applying to be a receptionist, what kind of experience do you have? If you don't have any, you may be thrown out. So after the most employers do this, have gone through all of them and have thrown out people who are not qualified, then at that point they can ask about a criminal history. They also can't advertise if you had gone on Craigslist and maybe even still now before November 1st, you would see advertisements that say must pass background check, must have clean record, no felons, those kinds of things. So those are now illegal in the city of Seattle. Even national employers can no longer advertise in this way. And it's been really exciting. Some national employers have really changed their policies. For example, Target no longer will have this box on their application. And it has had a ripple effect. People who have, want to comply with Seattle, the ordinance are now who are national companies are just changing their forms and not asking anyone. So we're pretty excited about that. So the question is, when can an employer deny someone a, a job solely on the basis of having a criminal record? And this is a compromise. So this is what's in the ordinance. So it, it will have a negative impact on the person's ability to do the job or cause harm or injury to property, business assets, or business reputation as well as is in there. And so it's will, it's not may. So the, uh, the way that Councilmember Harrell put it, who sponsored this legislation, was when you go outside, you can say, oh, it may rain. It may rain, it looks a little cloudy, might rain. If you go outside and you say it will rain, probably there's lots of clouds, it may even be a drizzle or two, maybe you read the weather report. So it's, it's somewhat of a different standard. And there was a big fight in committee about whether it would be will or whether it would be may. Uh, and we came out with will, which I was pretty excited about. Uh, so that, so it's a subjective standard. It's on the employer and they have to have a good faith belief. So. There haven't been any cases about this yet. If an employer makes an error or makes a mistake, what happens is that uh, the employer gets one opportunity or a bite at the apple, and then they will get a letter from the Seattle Office of Civil Rights or a phone call saying you've made a mistake, but they don't get, they do not receive a financial penalty at that point. It's only on the second time they will get a financial penalty, and the penalties go up on the third time. And those financial penalties that they have to pay go to the applicant who was denied the job. So what it says is if you have a good faith, faith belief, you can deny someone, but an employer has to give an applicant a chance to show that they've been rehabilitated or another piece that I'm really excited about, an opportunity to correct the record if it's wrong. So we're the only city that has this at this point where an employer, we'll talk about this a little bit more, has to give someone an, an opportunity to say, you know, that's not me. That's the wrong date of birth, or I didn't do that. I was in, I've never been in Kentucky in my life. I don't know why that's, why that's up there. And to show a lease or something like that to say, that's not me. The other thing the employer has to do is consider these factors that are listed out here. And it can be a statement from the applicant about the rehabilitation. It can be a letter from a social worker, from a psychologist, from a probation officer, a community corrections officer, and one of the things that will that the social workers from Fair Start will do and what you can help folks do at the clinic is put together these packets and explain to the person what the standard is and what the factors are. And at the end of my second presentation about housing, we'll go through how to do that and we'll talk about what official court documents the person can get and what sort of letters the person whoa, might want might to get. Okay. Any questions about that? All right. 
So the employer has to leave the job open for two days to require the factor. So the person has about two days. They have a reasonable opportunity to get all this information together. And then after the employer denies the person the job, they have to give the person two days to either correct the record or show their rehabilitation. So that is the jobs assistance ordinance in a nutshell. I encourage you to read the FAQs if you're going to volunteer at the clinic. That will give you a really good idea about what the job is about. And in your materials, there's lots of information about it. Okay. So that's the local law. What we're going to talk about next is the federal law, Title VII of the Civil Rights Act, is what covers employment and discrimination and protected classes. So there's different protected classes, federal, state, local. Seattle has many more than what the federal government has. And mainly what we're going to talk today is about race and race discrimination. Okay. So there's two types of theories of discrimination in employment. One is called disparate treatment, and one is called disparate impact. Disparate treatment is what most folks are familiar with. Two people go to get a job. One is white and one is black. And the person said, I'm not going to hire the black person. I'm going to hire the white person. That's disparate treatment. You treat someone differently because of their protected class. Disparate impact, your policy is neutral. So if an employer has a policy that says no felons, then that may have a disparate impact on someone. And we're going to walk through what those things mean. What's really different about those two is for the theory for disparate impact, you don't have to prove intent. There's no intent requirement as there is for cases related to disparate treatment. And disparate treatment can be fairly difficult, can be very difficult to prove. Disparate impact you prove mainly through statistics, and we'll talk more about that. This sort of explains what we really, a visual demonstration of what we mean by disparate impact. So if you look at that, is that, so we have a test, and is that fair? Does that, might that have a discriminatory effect? So everybody has to take the same test. Who is probably going to get the job? The bird or the monkey, right? So keep that in mind as we go through this. Okay. So technical definition, you need to have a neutral policy. It has to have generally a significant adverse impact. So it has to have an adverse impact on a protected class. We talked about that. Title VII. Title VII has been easier to implement and think about disparate impact than some other civil rights laws because there's a long history of enforcement related to disparate impact in employment. So we'll talk about that. So here are the cases that goes back, way back. Many of you who took employment law in law school will remember the Griggs case. That was a case in the South right before the Civil Rights Act passed. The utility company enacted a policy that said you either had to have a high school diploma or you had to, and you had to take an intelligence test, an IQ test. And they had had a long history of not promoting whites, and their upper management and middle management was almost all white, and their workers who were doing the blue-collar jobs were mainly all African American. So the Supreme Court said that those policies that have a discriminatory effect are basically illegal because the goal of the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission and the civil rights law is to make these opportunities widely available to everyone. And although, and the court went out of the way to state this, there was absolutely none whatsoever discriminatory intent by the employer. They were very nice to the employer and said, we understand you're trying to have this policy and you want people who have high school education and you want people who are smart, but historically having those requirements will have a discriminatory impact on African Americans and will be unfair. So that's the case that sort of set out disparate impact by the U.S. Supreme Court. What happened was 17 years later, Ford's Cove Packing, and that was a case up in Alaska by people doing, and I think it was fishery and canning and that kind of stuff, and there were horrible abuses and practices and discriminatory things happening. But what the court said there is that you had to show that the employer's policy actually caused the discriminatory effect, and it raised the standard really high to prove disparate impact. And so 
sometimes hear, oh, it, Ward says this or Ward says that. And it was really problematic for applicants who were uh, being discriminated against in employment to bring a disparate impact case. So what Congress did a few years later was pass the Civil Rights Act of 1991. And what that said basically was that discriminatory impact exists. And what Ward's Cove said is the employer did not have to have a business justification for their policy, and the burden was not on them to show the business justification, if there was any business justification. And the new law passed by Congress says that if a business is going to have a policy that has a discriminatory effect, they have to show that there's a business justification for that, and then basically the burden shifts to the employee to say that there is a less discriminatory or less restrictive policy available. And this for impact is super controversial. It's even more controversial in the housing context, and we'll talk about that later. So let's go through any questions. This is a lot of information. I could give you a three-hour CLE on disparate impact alone. It's a complicated legal theory with lots of statistics, so I just gave you that in five minutes. Um, all right, so here's a neutral policy. In order to be a prison guard, everyone has to be at least 5'6". So neutral policy, right? You have to be 5'6". This is the test. You're 5'6". So first question, what is the goal of the policy? To make sure everyone is at least a certain height to be a prison guard. Why would you want a taller prison guard? <laughs> right? So they need to be able to see in windows and safety issues, right? You want someone who's maybe big and strong, if there is violence or authority, all those kinds of things. So that was the goal, right? In the case, that was the goal. And who might be impacted by a five, five foot six requirement? Who in here might, is, is below five foot six? So look who's raising their hand. There wasn't a single guy that raised their hand. So who might it impact? Women. So what's the possible discriminatory effect? Women. So it could violate Title VII because it would have a disparate impact on women. Was there intentional discrimination? Not necessarily. What the prison can say, we are, we're all about safety. We want to keep our guards safe. We want to keep prisoners safe. We want to keep law and order. And is there another way that's less discriminatory or less restrictive to accomplish this goal? Yes. So everyone could go through fitness training. They could have a fitness test. Strength test, they could train people how to use other techniques and other ways to restrain people, right? This was not a necessary policy to ensure safety. So there were other ones available. And that's what happened in that case. Yes, you cannot have that kind of a policy because it has a discriminatory effect. What about if, there, if a restaurant said none of its servers, none of its waiters or waitresses could can have a felony. So is, is, what's the goal of that policy? We don't want anyone in our restaurant to provide customer service if they have a felony. What's the goal? They might steal money, so protect property. Protect the public, maybe protect their reputation. They want to not be known as someone that, serve, that has criminals who are working in their restaurant. People are laughing. Yeah. There are policies out there that exist that where restaurants and other places, warehouses have no felon policies. So what's the possible discriminatory effect? And we'll talk more about this later. Who could this possibly have a discriminatory effect? People who are felons and there's discrimination and we'll talk more about that. And is there another way to accomplish this goal? of safety, of not stealing money. So maybe the restaurant could have a policy that said, if you are going to be handling the money without supervision, then you can't have a financial crime, right? Would that be more narrowly tailored and maybe a closer relationship? Yes, all right. So that's just sort of to think through these issues. So it doesn't necessarily seem intuitive that a policy about criminal records could have a, discrimi could have a discriminatory effect. So 
what is this discrimination piece in criminal records about? Felons aren't a protected class. People with criminal histories aren't a protected class. So how do we say that not hiring someone because of their criminal history is racially discriminatory? working on changing that, but these are the folks that you'll be working with at the clinic. So one of the things we like to say is if you have Joe, who's white, and we'll talk more about this, and you have Joe, who's white, and you have Jack, who's black, and they have the exact same resume, if they go out and they have both have been using drugs in the past, uh, Jack has the, Jack, Jack, who's the, I think I said John first, but we'll call him Jack. Jack, who's African-American, is more likely to have the criminal record, and yet he's rehabilitated himself. And you have Joe, who's white, who has no criminal record, and yet is still using illegal substances. So Jack is not going to get the job, but Joe will get the job, even though Joe has not changed. So those are the times we're talking about in the clinic. Folks at Fair Start, folks who are trying to deal with their LFOs, trying to turn their lives around, they're up against a lot of issues. So this is just a visual de demonstration of what we've just talked about. If you are a black man from the age of 20 to 34, one in nine, one in nine folks. So this is the study I was referring to, Deva Pager, who's a professor at Princeton University when in Milwaukee, she did a study and what she did is she took pairs of testers. So she took she took a, a black man and a white man and gave them uh, the exact same resumes and sent them out. Pretty, pretty similar, all similar. And what she found was that white applicants were the most likely to be called back. I think they were called back 37% of the time. White applicants with a criminal record were called back 17% of the time. African-American men with no criminal record were called back less than the white applicants with a criminal record. And African-American men with a criminal history were called back at a minuscule rate. It was basically non-existent. So when people say, why don't you just go get a job? <clears throat> why don't you just work? It's really difficult, even if you don't have a criminal record. <coughs> if you have a criminal record, it's even worse. It's twice. It's hugely harder to do that. And so this clinic is hopefully going to help remove some of these barriers that exist. We can't sort of change the discriminatory issue, and we're going to talk more about that when we talk about housing, but keep this in mind. Because you think, well, why, why is it so bad? Why are we spending all this effort? Because this is the environment that people are going out and looking for work in. This is what folks are up against. I had just one story. I had a uh, a uh, guy I talked to who had applied for over 90 jobs and got one call back, who was an African-American male with a, with a minor misdemeanor, drug misdemeanor. All right, so what happened in the 80s? Clarence Thomas was head of the EOC. Anybody remember that? And so then now uh, uh, Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas said, it is a disparate impact on people of color if, they ha if you have a hiring policy that says no felons or no people with a criminal history, or no people with arrest. This happened back in the 1980s. And it, w it wasn't hugely controversial. People understood that this was problematic. And so 30 years ago, this was happening. 
What's happened in the last two years is the EEOC has updated their guidance and been much more clear. There was a case, L versus SEPTA, I think from the First Circuit out of Pennsylvania, was one of the few cases on the old guidance. And the court said, you know, this guidance really, we can't really defer to it because it's so old and it's frankly not very good, is what they said. And one of the problems in that case was the, the attorney who represented the plaintiff provided no expert testimony related to disparate impact. So that was problematic. Anyway, so this guidance has come out. And a copy of the guidance is in your materials. Very helpful. What it says is that there could be a disparate impact, and it's merely guidance, it's not the law, but it's supposed to help employers avoid violating Title VII, that you can't disproportionately screen out a protected group. And so there's three things that an employer needs to consider the nature and gravity of the offense or conduct. So they have to actually look at what is the type of crime, how that crime relates to the person's ability to do a job. So if a person is going to be a janitor and cleaning the floors and cleaning up, if they have a DUI, that might necessarily be related to the ability to do the job. The EEOC distinguishes between arrests and convictions under the EEOC guidance. Arrests are still can be considered but if your criminal history comes back and it's a history of arrest and the employer says, no, I'm not going to hire you, they can't do that. They have to look at the underlying conduct and the underlying conduct's relationship to the job and what's required for that position. For convictions, they can deny someone based on a conviction, but what the EEOC encourages an employer to do is to make sure that that conviction is job-related to have time limits. And so someone asked a question like, why, how far back? And so we've had clients where their conviction has been reported back 28 years, 19 years, 30 years, and they've been denied employment or housing because of those really old criminal records. So time limited. Also, they've encouraged to look at the accuracy issues. And the big thing is individual assessments, very similar to what is in the job assistance ordinance. And we'll talk more about individual assistance individual assessments. And the factors are very similar to what we talked about in the JAO. So an individual assessment, you want to look at the nature or gravity of the offense, the type of job, and the relationship between that. So here's a scenario. Take a couple of seconds and read through that. I'll also read out National Equipment Rental Company has an internet application that you can fill out for all positions. The question says, have you ever been convicted of a crime? And if you answer yes, that's it, it ends. So Joe has a 2000 conviction for DUI. Joe is African American and all the jobs that are listed as open on the application are warehouse work, <coughs> delivery and management positions. So let's walk through it. Does this practice meet the definition of discriminatory impact? Is Joe a protected class member? That's the first question. Is there an unintentional discriminatory effect on that protected class? So what, what is that? So Joe tried to apply as a DUI and he, his application was not accepted because he checked yes on the box. So he was screened out solely on the basis of his criminal record, yes. Yes, exactly. And what's great about the EEOC guidance is they've already made that determination and said that you don't have to prove statistically in order to file a complaint with the EEOC. We've already decided that this statistically that African Americans and others, including Hispanics, that there is a disparate impact already. So sufficient, what's the sufficient business justification? What about warehouse work? Is there a relationship between warehouse work, loading freight, loading boxes, and a DUI? Probably not, maybe not unless you're driving a forklift, right? So what about what about being a truck driver? Yeah, probably, right? You don't want someone driving drunk on the road. What about being a manager? Some are saying most likely not, maybe, maybe not. So is this practice discriminatory? This is one of the examples that the EEOC gives in its guidance. And they say yes, because the blanket exclusion was not specifically job related and it wasn't consistent with business necessity. 
So what would be a better policy for the employer to have? If you're going to be a truck driver, then your driving record could be examined, right? It makes sense. It's related to the job. It seems fair. It's about your ability to be a good driver. Maybe not have those types of crimes for being a warehouse worker. And specifically look at what are the qualifications for the position to be a manager, to be a warehouse worker. How long ago was the, was the conviction? Was there any rehabilitation? So the EEOC has been very active on this issue in the last two or three years. We'll start with the, with the happy ones and go to the not so happy ones. We'll start at the bottom. So there's been EEOC settlements with J.B. Hunt was one of the largest transportation companies in the U.S. and they had a policy of no convictions and a truck driver who was African American applied for a job there and they didn't hire him solely on the basis of his felony without doing an individual assessment. And EEOC, he filed an EEOC complaint. They came in and said no. They settled and they ch decided to change all their policies nationwide and review them all to make sure that they were in compliance with the e EEOC guidance. Pepsi, I think it was a $3.31 million settlement agreement. And so there was, I think, a class, was it 13? Er more than that. I'm thinking of another case. So everybody got about $10,333. What Pepsi was doing is they were saying they were, if there was a pending conviction, or I'm sorry, a pending charge, but there had been no resolution, no matter how old it was, they were not hiring people because of that. And they were not hiring people for minor misdemeanor, minor misdemeanor convictions that were not job related. So Pepsi also agreed to change its policies. The EEOC has pending lawsuits against BMW and Dollar who have similar policies related to uh, criminal records and they're not in compliance with the EEOC guidance. Keep updated on those. The state of Texas has now recently sued the EEOC to say that the guidance is outside the scope of what they can do. I don't think it probably has a lot of merit as this has been a theory and in regulations and law for a really long time, but the state of Texas has decided they're going to take on the EEOC and that they cannot tell their employers not to hire, <coughs> to force them to hire felons is basically what is in their complaint. And then finally, there was a, a, a really bad case for the EEOC that came out of Maryland, EEOC versus Freeman. And there, the expert witness for the EEOC who provided all the statistical analysis did a really shoddy job, had all kinds of errors, used the wrong data set. I don't know what happened, but there was some kind of mix up and the court railed on the EEOC and said, you have to have an expert witness and you have to have statistics that are valid. Show, and there has to be some kind of relationship between the statistics and the applicable applicant class. And so they were unable to show that. And so they lost on summary judgment because of their statistical analysis. So as far as the clinic goes, what we're encouraging people to do is to explain what Uh, explain about the EEOC guidance and what it means for them and about if they're if the employer is in Seattle or the person is seeking work in Seattle or has been denied in Seattle what the basic requirements are of the jobs assistance ordinance so it's fairly basic and then how to file a complaint all the information is there if it's in the city of Seattle then it's under the jurisdiction of the Seattle office for civil rights if it's outside of Seattle then it's most likely the Washington Human Rights Commission if by chance it's a very small area now, but in unincorporated King County, then it would be the King County Office for Civil Rights. And then they can also file a complaint with the EEOC if there seems to be some violation of the EEOC guidance. Any questions about that, Andra? Generally, so the EOC contracts with the Seattle Office of Civil Rights to do their enforcement for them. So you can file either place and then most likely it will be sent from the EOC to the city of Seattle if you happen to file with the EOC. But they have concurrent jurisdiction. Oh. Yeah, I'm done early. That would be a surprise. Yeah, so are there any questions about that? No, all right.
So that's the employment piece. We'll do housing in the afternoon, which is much more complicated. All right. Well, I guess we can get started here on the uh, next section of the uh, CLE, which is going to be legal financial obligations in Washington State. Um, my name is Nick Allen. I'm a staff attorney with CLS in the Institutions Project. And I'll be talking for uh, about the first hour of this presentation, um, giving an overview of legal financial obligations uh, and some of the reasons why they are a barrier to reentry. Some of the stuff that we've seen coming through our LFO clinic that's been uh, in operation for the past a couple of years now. So we'll try and focus on uh, some of the, the main issues that we see coming through the clinic. And then, uh, all right, I don't think this is working, so I'll just start, a, I'll just speak up. So what I said is that I will talk, uh, give an overview <laughs> of uh, legal financial obligations in Washington State, specifically focusing on the issues that we see coming through our LFO clinic that's been in operation for the last a uh, couple of years now um, at Columbia. And then for the last half hour, um, uh, one of our volunteers at CLS that's been doing um, uh, work with the clinic uh, for the past two years, Maria Silvernail, who is uh, an emeritus attorney, is going to come up here and talk to you about uh, some of the details behind relief regarding uh, expiration of LFOs and how it works here in King County. Um, interest relief uh, in King County and a couple of cases that she's worked on and also provide some background on uh, what it, some of the steps uh, uh, involved with being a, a clinic volunteer and what you'll see if you decide um, to, to volunteer with the, with the reentry clinic. Um, so just to start off, how many of you are, um, are familiar with legal financial obligations? Okay, so that's a fair amount of you. Um, so I'll just start with a with a brief overview then of um, of what they are. Um, there's our agenda. Yeah, we'll I'll wrap up with uh, with questions and answers too. So if you've got questions and answers, uh, just ho hold on to them to the end of the um, the presentation, and uh, we'll do our best to to answer those. Um, so legal financial obligations, uh, in general, those they are criminal debts that are imposed as a as part of a, uh, as a criminal judgment and sentence. So um, in general, it is um, uh, debts that are imposed because of a, of a criminal conviction. Um, in Washington State, they're imposed for both uh, criminal and misdemeanor offenses, and they are imposed in um, all courts. So municipal courts, district courts, superior courts, all impose legal financial obligations. Um, there's two um, kind of long definitions included in our RCWs as to what legal financial obligations are, and they go through a, a long list of different types of uh, legal financial obligations that the court can impose. Um, but in general, uh, what you need to know is that LFOs consist of the fees and costs, uh, the fines, and restitution that is imposed by the court, like I said, as a result of a, of a criminal conviction. And for the sake of uh, time today, I'll be focusing primarily on superior court LFOs uh, because that is the majority of clients that we see through the clinic is folks who have uh, superior court LFOs and are looking to address them. So assume anything that's up here is uh, addressing superior court LFOs uh, unless I uh, state otherwise or unless the slide um, uh, references district or municipal court LFOs. Uh, but like I said, Fees, fines, uh, and restitution are primarily what we're dealing with here. And I'll give a brief overview of which each of those uh, consists of. Um, so when you think of fees, those are costs of recoupment that the state, the county, or the city is trying to recover um, because those are costs they incurred in you know, charging, uh, arresting, prosecuting, and defending um, the defendant. So what you want to do is think of these kind of as user fees. Um, for the most part, uh, fees are discretionary, meaning that the court can choose to impose or waive these based on a finding of indigency. If it finds that a defendant is indigent, um, it can waive pretty much all of the fees um, that, that it has the authority to impose, with the exception of one on the superior court level, which is the mandatory $100 DNA collection fee. And that is a $100 fee that's uh, imposed for every criminal uh, judgment and sentence uh, uh, where, where the individual has committed a felony. 
And there's also other certain specified crimes in the statute where the DNA collection fee can be imposed. But for the most part, it's every felony offense on the superior court level. And that's imposed regardless of an individual's ability to pay. Fines are imposed for the purpose of punishment. And we've all heard about, you know, Class A, Class B, Class C felonies all the way down to misdemeanors. And each of those comes with a corresponding maximum fine that a court can impose. That's usually where fines come into play. There's also other specific crimes, mostly domestic violence and drug crimes, where the court can impose additional fines. Like fees, fines are mostly discretionary. The court does have the power on whether or not to impose most of them, with the exception of the victim penalty assessment. And I know it's called an assessment, but it acts like a fine here in Washington State. It's a $500 assessment that's imposed upon anybody that's convicted of a felony or gross misdemeanor in Washington State. And I say it's more like a fine because it's imposed regardless of whether or not your crime has a victim or not. So it's basically punishment for a criminal conviction. And it's also, it's not imposed for purposes of recouping any funds. The monies go to the Crime Victim Compensation Fund. But like I said, it acts more like a fine, and so that's why I've classified it here as such. And then, of course, there's restitution, and that's compensation for victims' losses. It has to be ordered whenever there's an injury to a person or loss to or damage to someone's property. And so it is mostly mandatory. You know, 95% of the time, 99% of the time, it's going to be imposed where there is injury or damage to property, unless the court says that extraordinary reasons exist for restitution not to be imposed. In Washington State, on the superior court level, the court can impose up to twice an offender's gain from the commission of the crime or twice the victim's loss from the commission of the crime. So if I take someone's car and run it into a fire hydrant causing $2,000 in damage, technically the court can impose up to $4,000 in restitution. Another important thing to remember about restitution is that the court can modify the amount of restitution at any time the individual remains under the court's jurisdiction, so long as the restitution was set according to the laws in Washington State. What I mean by that is under RCW 9-94A-753, restitution has to be set at sentencing or within 180 days of sentencing. So if the court does that, sets it at sentencing or within 180 days, then it can modify it at any time the defendant remains under the court's jurisdiction. And there's two recent cases that clarified what the statute says, State v. Gray and State v. Gonzalez. And they're different. They take up the same issue, but they can be distinguished by the fact that in State v. Gonzalez, the defendant, the court imposed restitution, and then the victim came back after restitution had been imposed and said, look, I've got ongoing medical expenses, and I'm requesting that the order setting restitution be modified. And the court said that can be done. It was set according to law, and so at any time, if the victim has ongoing medical expenses, the court can modify it under those circumstances. Gray was a little bit different because what you had in that situation was a family requesting funeral expenses for a deceased victim. The court enters it legitimately, and then after the fact, the family came back and said, oh, there were additional funeral expenses that we knew of at the time restitution was set, but we didn't disclose that. The court said that it doesn't matter when the victim knows about the restitution amount. That's irrelevant. The statute's unambiguous in saying that it can be modified at any time the person is under the court's jurisdiction. So that's important to keep in mind. We see that coming through the clinic on a, you know, once in a while where somebody says my restitution order has been modified. I don't think it's legit because it was already entered within 180 days, and I don't think that they have the right to do that. In fact, they do. 
Now, another reason to, to go over fees, fines, and restitution is um, it's, it's important to separate out fees, fines, and costs from the restitution. So separating out the non-restitution from the restitution um, because later down the line, uh, they are treated differently for purposes of relief. So getting relief for restitution is different than getting relief from uh, non-restitution legal uh, financial obligations. Um, the court can impose a number of legal financial obligations. We've uh, counted as many as 20, and in the next uh, couple of slides here, you can see some of the different fees, fines, and restitution that a court can impose upon a, a convicted defendant. Um, some of the ones that, that I'd like to highlight are uh, cost of defense. Um, the, the defendant will get an attorney appointed at no cost, but later on the court can impose the cost of those defense, and if the uh, defendant ever uh, is able to pay those costs, uh, they'll, they'll have to pay them. Um, the jury fee, uh, you can be made to pay for the cost of having a, a, a jury trial. Uh, Warrant costs, this is another one that comes up pretty regularly. Uh, individuals who are in, not in compliance with payment of their legal financial obli obligations uh, can have um, uh, warrants uh, served on them, and they have to pay the cost of having to serve that warrant, and it can be added to their existing uh, legal financial obligations. Uh, similarly, there are uh, costs of appeal. If a defendant unsuccessfully uh, appeals their, uh, their case, the cost of appeal can be added to their existing legal financial obligations. Um, and then finally, uh, the last one here that I like to uh, reference is clerk's cost of collection fees. And while these aren't technically legal financial obligations in the way they, they act just like them and um, can delay a defendant's access to relief from legal financial obligations, uh, clerks are authorized to charge up to uh, impose up to $100 in fees upon a defendant who owes LFOs so that the clerk's office can collect those legal financial obligations. Um, and it is problematic because there is an order of distribution in uh, the Superior Court Statute uh, 9948760 that says any legal financial obligation payment that is sent in by a debtor shall first go towards restitution then towards any other obligations. But uh, clerks do not consider this fee to be a legal financial obligation. So what they do is collect the cost of collection fee before any restitution obligations. And um, to give you an example of how uh, devastating this can be to uh, a low income uh, uh, debtor, what could happen is we see oftentimes someone can only afford to make $5, $10 payments a month. If they do that, the first, you know, if you're making $10 payments a month, those first 10 payments, if the clerk's collection fee has been added, is going right to the clerk's office, meaning that they're only going to be making two payments each year that goes towards their restitution. So that not only impacts the debtor and uh, his or her access to relief, but also impacts uh, victims' access to, um, to restitution. And this is something that we hope uh, that the legislature will take up in, in coming sessions to either eliminate or put it lower down on the uh, order of distribution or classify it as a legal financial obligation. Um, next, um, we find that it can be uh, just as helpful uh, explaining to folks what legal financial obligations are, uh, just as it can be uh, informative to folks, it can be just as informative to let them know what legal financial obligations are not. Um, we oftentimes have people come into the clinic and say, um, I've got legal financial obligations. We'll ask, what do those consist of? And they'll say, well, I have several uh, traffic infractions. I've got child support. Uh, I've got credit card debt. And what they need to know is that that does not fall under the umbrella of legal financial obligations. All of that is separate debt. Legal financial obligations only cover that debt that comes as a result of the offense. So all of these examples here, would not be something that we could help out with uh, at the clinic, and we have to refer those folks out to a different um, uh, to different legal services to to address those concerns. Uh, and there are uh, uh, organizations out there that do provide that type of uh, legal assistance on on all these issues. Um, but uh, w that's one of the key things is is kind of informing a misinformed client population and getting them to understand what their legal financials are and what they are not. Um, 
for those of you who decide to volunteer with the clinic, one of the first and most key um, uh, steps in uh, getting the process started is knowing where this info is located. And um, you can think of it in, um, in two ways here. Non-restitution legal financial obligations are for the most part going to be imposed at sentencing, meaning that they're going to be in uh, the criminal judgment and sentence. So uh, there is a uh, sample judgment and sentence in your materials here. There's a section in, in um, uh, Washington State uh, uh, sample JNSs and all of them that's going to be specific to legal financial obligations. You're going to be able to see where the judge has imposed uh, legal financial obligations where it's been waived, the total amount owed, uh, things of that nature. But what you need to know is for non-restitution legal financial obligations, for the most part, always going to be in the judgment and sentence with, uh, with two exceptions, and those would be what I just uh, stated a little earlier. Costs of appeal aren't going to be in there because, of course, those are after the, the sentence has been uh, handed down. And uh, clerk collection fees aren't going to be in there, one, because there's dispute about whether or not they're legal financial obligations, but also because they're imposed on an ongoing basis. Um, so, so those won't be in the JNS. Uh, restitution is a little bit different. Uh, it will be in the judgment and sentence if restitution is determined at uh, the time of sentencing. So if the victim brings in um, an, uh, an accurate uh, accounting of their uh, their restitution, what they're owed in restitution, the court enters it at that time, it's going to be in the judgment and sentence. The order setting restitution will be attached as an appendix to that judgment and sentence. In your example, uh, in your materials, the, it's, it's uh, appendix E to the judgment and sentence, and it'll be noted. The judge will mark a box that says restitution has been entered in this case. Uh, see appendix uh, for, for more information. Um, and uh, uh, the, the one way that it won't be in the judgment and sentence, of course, is if the restitution hearing is held out within the 180 days. So in that case, there will be a separate uh, order setting restitution, a separate docket entry. If uh, the individual has to go back and do research and search for their documents, they're going to see a separate document, docket entry that says order setting restitution, uh, whereas if it was set at sentencing, it'll just be part of the, uh, of the judgment and sentence. Um, So uh, we can look at that sample judgment and sentence right now. And uh, like I said, this is in your documents. You can see up there at the top they, uh, the, where the star is, the judge uh, imposed the victim penalty assessment. For the most part, everything else has been waived. And then you can see the total amount owed. That includes the, uh, the restitution amount in the, in the $500 victim uh, penalty assessment. Um, and I don't know if you can see probably about three half lines down under the protection. Uh, there's a monthly uh, payment amount that uh, the, the court has ordered the uh, defendant to pay. We'll talk about that a little bit more later. Um, and then along the bottom there, you see uh, clerk's trust fees waived and interest waived, except with respect to restitution. Um, in King County, um, I think King County is probably the only county uh, in Washington State that waives interest on non-restitution. Judges will waive it, and they'll check that box there. If it is unchecked, then the restitution is going to accrue, um, the interest is going to accrue from the date of judgment. Um, and the trust fee section is uh, a fee that was charged to LFO debtors. When they brought in their payment, they would be given a surcharge on uh, payments that went above, I think it's uh, $25, they'd get like a $10 fee. But the clerk's office has eliminated that fee, so that's not something we need to be uh, concerned about uh, moving forward here in King County. Um, and here's a sample order restitution. Like I said, in this case, there was a, a set at sentencing. There's, um, it, so it's attached as an appendix. We can see that the uh, court, there was two victims at uh, this particular And the court will outline how much each of those victims uh, is owed. So uh, one of the reasons why, well, I guess another one of the reasons why LFOs can be problematic for folks that have them is because they're treated differently during the period of incarceration than they are when somebody is released uh, from, from total confinement. Uh, so when somebody goes in, they don't really have to worry about their legal financial obligations. That was dealt with at sentencing. You go in, you do your time, and you're not really thinking about, um, you know, do I have to pay these things? Can I be sanctioned? Can I challenge any of this stuff? Uh, 
For the most part, none of that is going to happen during incarceration. DOC is going to make a mandatory deduction from uh, all of the wages that are earned by um, a debtor or by any monies that are received from family, friends, or other outside sources. And for the most part, that's a 20% deduction that takes place for um, on, a, on a monthly basis, taking that um, taking that amount out. All the individual will get is a monthly trust account statement from their inmate account that says X amount of dollars were taken out. What's uh, troubling is that it doesn't tell them what their outstanding balance is. It just says how much was taken out, and it'll read unlimited in their trust account statement. And we have, we've had problems over the years with people who say, look. DOC is telling me that I owe an unlimited amount of uh, legal financial obligations, when in reality that uh, uh, unlimited is, uh, uh, reference is just a term of art. It just means the person still has outstanding legal financial obligations. But it's really difficult to know how much you owe and how much you paid while incarcerated um, because you're not affirmatively making payments. Uh, similarly, most of the relief options, like I'll explain later, require you to be, have been released from total confinement um, in order to be able to challenge the imposition of legal financial obligations. So not a whole lot is going on during incarceration. Yes? On the amounts? But yet yeah, interest is going to continue to accrue, and I'll get to that a little bit later. But uh, No, that's all right. Good question. Uh, so, uh, during incarceration, like I said, things are a little bit different. It can be easy, especially the longer your sentence is, to lose track of those things, to know how much you've paid, to know, you know, whether or not you even have legal financial obligations. And that all changes uh, after release. So after release, um, as soon as, you know, 30 days from the date of release, an individual is, could be responsible for making their own payments uh, in, on the uh, superior court level and even in courts of limited jurisdiction for the most part. Payments are going to be going to the county clerk's office in the county where the uh, conviction occurred. So an individual is going to be responsible for making uh, regular monthly payments to the county the city clerk's office. Um, and uh, probably most importantly, failure to make payment towards the legal financial obligations now can lead to uh, sanctions um, if a person does not uh, comply with um, with making payments uh, each month. Um, and all this stuff starts after release with the uh, setting of the, the monthly payment schedule. Um, I'll be mentioning the monthly payment schedule regularly uh, throughout the, uh, the presentation because it really is key as a starting point for determining, you know, whether or not somebody uh, first receives legal financial obligations, whether or not uh, their sanction for failing to pay legal financial obligations, whether or not they can keep these things manageable uh, over the course of, uh, of, of payment of, of LFOs. Um, and uh, it can be set by one of three entities um, on the superior court level. So uh, at sentencing, the court has authority to set the monthly payment schedule. Um, and if they choose not to do that, they can delegate that authority to the Department of Corrections if that individual is on DOC supervision. However, if that individual is not on DOC supervision uh, or their DOC supervision is ended, the court can then delegate uh, that authority to set the monthly payment schedule to the, uh, uh, to the clerk's office. Um, restitution, again, is a little bit different. The court shall set the monthly payment schedule for restitution obligations. And this is something that's often overlooked in the courts. You'll see uh, an individual who has restitution and the clerk's office has set the monthly payment schedule. Um, if you look to the restitution statute, um, 9948753, -E it clearly says that the restitution amount must be set by uh, the sentencing court judge. And these uh, monthly payment schedules uh, need to be set according to the individual's uh, ability to pay. So um, you can't just arbitrarily pick a number and say this individual has $10,000 in LFOs, so uh, $2,000 a month sounds reasonable to me, or $200 a month. It has to be based on that person's uh, financial situation. And as I'll explain later, um, there's steps that debtors can take, steps that courts can take, steps that uh, attorneys can take to ensure that the monthly payment schedule is uh, accordingly set. Um, 
The um, uh, another thing to mention is, is in, the, in this slide is that it's not a consolidated debt. So oftentimes what we'll see is that uh, debtors will have convictions in multiple counties. So uh, they'll have convictions in King, Kitsap, and uh, say Snohomish County. And uh, each one of those cases, they owe $25 a month. They cannot send in $75 uh, in, of, in payment to King County and think that King County is going to send those, the other uh, two payments to the, to, the, to the counties where that person has uh, uh, LFOs. Instead, they have to deal with each clerk's office where they have LFOs. They can't treat it as a consolidated debt. Um, and that's important to remember because if you do, uh, like I, in my example, send one payment into King County, you could be um, in violation of, uh, your, of, of a condition of sentence non-payment in the other two counties and uh, have your case forwarded for possible sanctions. Um, individuals who have LFOs should be getting periodic billing statements sent to them um, by the clerk's office in the county where they have the LFOs. The, that doesn't happen all the time. The clerk's office uh, issues an annual report that they're required to submit by, um, uh, by statute. And they, even they say not everybody is getting uh, periodic billing statements, which is a problem. Uh, not only when they're getting periodic billing statements, because I know if uh, I was to get a credit card bill every three or four months, I probably make my payments every three or four months. It's just one of those things that if you're not getting notice on a regular basis to make payments, uh, it can be easy to fall behind and forget that you need to make the payment. And that's a, a similar situation with folks who are getting periodic billing statements. Even the clerk's offices have noticed that payments have gone down uh, in some counties because they're being not, not being sent out on a regular basis. And then it's even worse if someone's not getting a billing statement and not getting any notice at all that they owe legal financial obligations because uh, not only are they not sure how much they need to make a payment, the amount that they need to make a payment in, but they won't have any of this other information that's listed on the billing statement that tells them how much interest has accrued, their current balance, the monthly payment schedule on each of their, uh, of, of their cause numbers. Um, the, the billing statement is valuable in that it can give you a quick overview of what your legal financial obligations consist of, but it's not gospel, and um, debtors need to be told that they have to go back in the process to really get a true and accurate accounting of what their legal financial obligations consist of. Clerk's offices, DOC, the courts regularly make mistakes on how much in legal financial obligations were initially imposed, how much interest is accrued on all the information that's on this billing statement. So it's important to know that, yes, use that billing statement, make sure that you're receiving it, but don't necessarily um, uh, take it for, uh, for the truth. You need to really go back, find that judgment and sentence, find other documentation to make sure that you're accurately being um, uh, charged and, um, and that the numbers are correct. Yeah. No, that would just be uh, from their last inmate trust account statement. So that would just tell them what the last payment was. And then when it's transferred over to the county uh, clerk's offices, at that point, then, like I'll explain later, they're going to have to meet with the clerks who's going to have that information available. But regardless, uh, they should still be doing their um, due diligence and finding the judgment and sentence, finding all that information to know exactly what the legal financial obligations are. Because the, even the most minor of mistake can over time uh, snowball and become a problem that can't be undone. Um, one of the other things that's key to know about legal financial obligations is that there is a complete lack of uniformity statewide. And so the jurisdiction where the individual has LFOs can impact the advice that's given uh, to the client. Um, if you look here, uh, the average fees and fines uh, vary greatly across the state. There was um, a study that was done in 2008 by two uh, University of Washington uh, professors entitled Assessment and Consequences of Legal Financial Obligations in Washington State. And what they found is that, yeah, there's uh, 
uh, big differences statewide in terms of how LFOs are imposed, how they are collected, and how they're enforced, uh, how non-payment is enforced. And so you can see here uh, in King County, it's about an average of $600, uh, the, the fees and fines that are imposed. And what that says is that King County judges are imposing, for the most part, the mandatory uh, LFOs, the $500 victim penalty assessment and the $100 DNA collection fee. That gets us to $600, similarly with, uh, with Snohomish County. But if you go to uh, uh, Kitsap County and you're that same person that had the conviction in King County, you're going to see the average fees and fines you know, skyrocket to almost $2,300. That's almost four, time, uh, four times the difference than King County when we add in uh, multiple convictions and interest, those folks, one guy in King County, one guy in Kitsap County are gonna have completely different experiences with their legal financial obligations. Um, uh, in the same way, uh, similarly, um, uh, use of sanctions for people who are not in compliance with uh, legal financial obligations can be very different from county to county. So in King County, if you are not paying your legal financial obligations and you're low income and uh, aren't working, it's um, pretty unlikely that they're going to uh, incarcerate you for failing to pay. But that same person in, say, Benton County or Spokane County who has failed to pay can almost expect that jail time is going to be an option. Um, in uh, Benton County and in Spokane County, the statistics are somewhere around 15 to 25 percent of their average daily population is people sitting out uh, uh, legal financial obligations or sitting there for, for non-compliance on the Superior Court level of, uh, of LFOs. And we'll talk about that uh, a little bit later. But that, of course, is going to impact the advice that you give. Um, if someone comes in with a King County conviction and LFO, it's going to be very different. Uh, the advice will be very different than the advice that you give to someone who has a Benton County. Yes. Yeah. Yes, that's a, that's a condition is that your, your legal financial obligations have to have been, uh, have to have been paid off. No. Oh, so for your, for your specific case, yeah. That has to be on that specific case. Uh, so if you've got three convictions, the question is, do you have to uh, pay off all your legal financial obligations on all your cases to seal one case? And it's specific to that. So if you have two convictions you've paid off on uh, the one case, got a certificate of discharge, you can move to uh, seal and vacate on that case. And that's similar with all the relief options for, for legal financial obligations. Um, so they won't go back and say, oh, you have to pay off these other ones um, in order to seal this case. You have to, it's case specific. Um, so next what we can get into is some of the barriers. We've talked a little bit about them. Um, to LFOs, the, the main ones that we see through the legal financial obligation portion of our reentry clinic and um, some of the options for relief that individuals can take to get out from under uh, their LFOs. Um, and we'll start with, uh, with your question about the interest rate. So um, interest accrues on legal financial obligations, superior court legal financial obligations, at a rate of 12% per year from the date of judgment. And uh, that's simple interest, um, but it, like I said, it does accrue from the date of judgment, meaning that it is accruing during the entire period of incarceration. And um, when somebody gets out, you can put them in a situation where they owe way more uh, in legal financial obligations than they, than they owed going in. Uh, district court legal financial obligations do not uh, accrue interest unless the individual's uh, case is turned over to collections and the account is placed in default status. So at that point, interest would begin to accrue at 12% um, uh, per year in addition to any fees that the collection agency may, uh, may tack on to uh, for collection. The credit it has been made. So like I said, you'll receive a trust account statement that says, uh, you know, five dollars and twenty-five cents taken out for legal financial obligations. Um, but it's a it's a good question because uh, oftentimes the the person who has the LFOs doesn't know that, and that's why they want to go back and check that that is the case. 
Um, uh, to give an example, if you took somebody that had about $2,000 in legal financial obligations and has a 30-month uh, prison sentence, they would come out after that two and a half years owing about $800 more in legal financial obligations. And that's if they didn't work and didn't receive any monies. Uh, and even if they were working, they're not, they're not receiving much. So it would still probably be somewhere up there around $2,800. Um, and, you know, that's close to a 50% increase in the amount that you went in with and the amount that you came out with. Um, and uh, on top of that, we have to remember the client population that we're working with. And 95% of the case, the $2,000 was something that they couldn't afford to pay from the start. And now it's only become worse getting out. Um, and again, uh, folks with multiple convictions are in a particularly bad situation because if you take this individual that has $2,000 in legal financial obligations and they have two other convictions with $2,000 in legal financial obligations, not only are they coming out with $2,800 on that case, but during that time, they're going to have the $2,800 on the other two convictions uh, if they haven't been making payments and are too, uh, too poor to be able to afford that. So now you're talking about somebody who has uh, close to $10,000 in debt with, uh, with interest that's accruing if you just add in two similar um, convictions. And that's the case with most people. Rarely do we see somebody coming through the clinic that has one isolated conviction in one county. Most of the time it's going to be two, three, four, ten convictions that somebody has, each with some uh, level of, uh, of legal financial obligations that's owed. Um, now, there are ways to get relief from interest that's accrued on uh, legal financial obligations. And there are three types of interest that can be addressed under statute. Uh, 1082090 allows for interest relief from legal financial obligations. And like I said, three, time, three types of uh, interest can be addressed. One is interest that is accrued on non-restitution legal financial obligations during the period of total confinement. Two is interest that is accrued on non-restitution legal financial obligations just in general. So during the period of total confinement and uh, the period after that, um, after release. And then third is interest uh, that is accrued on restitution uh, obligations. Each one of these relief options requires the individual to file a motion with the court requesting this relief and showing that they've met the criteria that are provided for by statute um, in order for the court to, uh, to grant that motion. And I'll talk about that in just a second here. And um, once they've submitted that, the court really has authority to uh, waive all of the legal financial obligation interest on the non-restitution obligations. However, it cannot do so on restitution uh, interest. It can only reduce the amount that has uh, accrued. So uh, let's talk about the um, criteria for relief. So for to get relief from uh, non-restitution that accrued during the period of uh, total confinement, you have to have been released from total confinement first, and that means um, you know total confinement within a, a, a prison. Um, you could be in work release and, and still meet these criteria because that would only be uh, partial confinement. So you have to have been released from total confinement. You have to show that the interest accrual is causing either you or your family a hardship. Um, and hardship is not defined, so we tell people to, you know, be, be persuasive with that. Most of the folks that we, we see won't have any trouble meeting that, uh, that criteria, um, but still we tell them to um, make sure that they're telling their story. Uh, third, you have to show that uh, the, a waiver of interest will serve as an incentive for you to pay off any remaining legal financial obligations. And then uh, for the period of total confinement uh, interest relief, you have to also show um, that you, you, uh, your period of total confinement, so that's dealing with DOC and showing, look, I went in on this day and I got out on this day. Um, and you also have to show the amount of interest that accrued during that period of total confinement, which sounds extremely problematic um, to have somebody who just got out kind of go on a, uh, on a hunt to find out how much interest has accrued during that time and calculate it down, you know, to the dollar. 
But what we've learned is that clerk's offices have this information. They can calculate interest down to the day. And so individuals should be dealing with their clerk's office to determine how much in interest accrued during that period of total confinement. And uh, clerk's office should uh, be willing to work with them. Um, that can't be guaranteed because, like I mentioned earlier, there's wide disparities from county to county, and not only with how they deal with the law, but even um, how, they'll, how they'll deal with debtors. Um, um, some, some can be uh, willing to work with them, others um, not so much. So uh, keep that in mind. But the good thing about the uh, interest relief during the period of total confinement is the court has to. It's an automatic waiver if the person um, can, can prove those four or five elements. Uh, interest on non-restitution in general is covered by this uh, first section of the slide. And it's similar uh, criteria. You have to have been released from total confinement. You have to show that there's a hardship on you or your family. Uh, you have to show that there's an, it's an incentive. A waiver will serve as an incentive to pay off your remaining legal financial obligations. And then you have to show that you made a good faith effort towards uh, payment on your legal financial obligations. And this standard changed a few years ago. Uh, there was the legislator, le legislature made some changes, defining good faith effort as either having paid off the principal amount of the non-restitution in full, or by having made at least 15 payments within an 18 month period. So if I was released uh, yesterday, and I want to get started on uh, legal financial obligation payments and access interest relief on non-restitution down the line. Uh, in June of 2015, I would have had at, le at least made uh, 15 payments by then in order to be eligible for relief and have meet these other uh, criteria. If I do that, then the court has the authority to either fully or partially waive the interest that's accrued during that time. Um, Restitution is a little bit different in that there's just two, two criteria there. Uh, you have to have been released from total confinement and you have to uh, have paid off the principal amount in your restitution. That's, that's, that's it um, in terms of relief from restitution. Mario will talk a little bit later about some of the work she's been able to do to negotiate restitution um, amounts, but uh, when it comes to the interest on restitution under the law, there's only one um, standard and it's a pretty difficult standard to meet. Um, especially for folks who have uh, very little to, to pay. Our second barrier goes back to uh, the payment schedule. And um, uh, they're problematic, like I said, at sentencing, uh, post-sentencing upon release when somebody gets out, and when sanctions are sought for non-payment. Um, and like I said, that is because they should be based on an individual's ability to pay. But that is not always the case. Oftentimes, uh, they're based upon the amount of uh, LFOs that are outstanding. Oftentimes, they're based upon the individual having restitution instead of non-restitution. Um, or uh, it can be from the other side, too. The debtor has not provided the court or the clerk's office with enough information to make an appropriate uh, decision about how much uh, this person should be making each month uh, towards their um, legal financial obligations. Um, at sentencing, courts are required to inquire into a defendant's ability to pay. And there is a very low standard, but there's a standard nonetheless that the court must uh, follow when, when, um, when imposing it, uh, legal financial obligations and setting the payment schedule. There's a case from last year, State v. Bertrand, where it said that the court does not need to enter formal findings uh, uh, about ability to pay on the record, but that there has to be some support in the record for uh, uh, that they took into account somebody's ability to pay. And I say it's a low standard because there's been some cases since Bertrand where the courts affirmed uh, trial courts just have having uh, trial courts meeting that standard by simply waiving one uh, legal financial obligation and imposing the rest. That's enough to say they took account of the person's ability to pay. So a very low standard when it comes to that. Um, and also, you see here examination comes at the point of collection. That's another reason why the standard is so low, is because there's really no opportunity to challenge the court's finding at sentencing. It's only the court has said uh, in State v. Curry that the imposition of LFOs, the, the, the right time to challenge it is at the point of collection. So once the person's already had the LFOs imposed, Upon release, they can challenge uh, the, uh, the imposition of LFOs, but it's only when the, when the state has come to collect. Um, and um, 
like the slide here says, an inaccurate payment schedule really can start the individual down that path of destruction because if you don't have an inappropriate, if you have an inappropriate payment schedule and aren't making the payments in the amount you're supposed to be making, warrants can be issued for your arrest, which can lead to sanctions and just at this point a lifetime of instability because you're just never going to be able, if you don't get that payment schedule together, you're never going to be able to pay the amount you can afford to pay. So it just creates this cycle of nonpayment, warrant, sanctions, get out, warrant, nonpayment, sanctions, get out. So some of the steps that we like to provide to prepare someone to get an appropriate payment schedule is, you know, the first step is, well, it depends on what point in the payment schedule is being challenged. But regardless, an individual needs to have an accounting of their current financial situation. And what we like to tell people to do is start by filling out a financial declaration. It's a basic form that's going to tell you, you know, what your expenses are and what your income is. And a basic deduction of expenses from income will tell you what your disposable income is each month. And that disposable income should be a good guide for how much you can afford to pay each month. At sentencing, it can be used to present evidence to the court that you're indigent. After release, it can be used to show the clerk's office or the court that your financial circumstances have changed and that you're entitled to a lower or, I guess, a higher monthly payment amount if the financial circumstances have changed upward. And at the point of collections, when sanctions are sought, getting an appropriate payment schedule is helpful because it can help you avoid being incarcerated for failing to pay. Another piece of advice based on what we've seen practically is that debtors should not agree to a payment schedule that they cannot afford to pay. We see on a regular basis an individual worry that jail time is going to be imposed. See the judge say, okay, jail time is going to be imposed unless you make a payment. This individual might only be having, you know, might only have $20, $30 a month in disposable income. And the court will say, okay, I'm going to tell you, can you afford to pay $75 a month? And given the, you know, immediacy of jail time that's lurking there, they'll agree to the $75. And they can't afford to pay it, and all it's doing is delaying the inevitable. If they went back, filled out a financial declaration, presented it to the court and said, look, I can't afford to pay $25 a month, and here's the evidence to show what I can afford to pay, it can avoid some of the consequences of nonpayment. Another thing that debtors can do is request a meeting with the clerk's office. And in King County, this is done through administrative reviews is what they're called. They're informal meetings with the clerk's office where you bring in all your financial information. An LFO collection officer will look over that information and set a monthly payment schedule based on that financial information. The debtor or the clerk's office can request this meeting, so it can go both ways. Most of the time it's going to be the county here. King County will request that, you know, 30, 60 days after someone's been released to set that. And it's key that the individual responds to those, because if not, they will get an inappropriate payment schedule, and also the clerk's office might forward their case to the prosecutor's office for possible sanctions for noncompliance. But they want to use that financial declaration even with those meetings as well. Like I said, it's really just a practical way, easy way to get an accounting of that and make sure you can present precise evidence to the entities that are going to be setting the payment schedule. In our next slide, this is a sample administrative review letter that goes out to the debtor. And it can be intimidating because people think that this is a court hearing, a formal court hearing, and it's not. It's informal. And even if the individual is not satisfied with what the clerk's office has set, they can always go back to the court and ask for a modification of their payment schedule and say, you know, I presented all this evidence that shows that I can't afford to pay what the clerk's office has set. Will you consider looking over my financial information and modifying it? That's not very helpful. So barrier three that we notice is jail time for nonpayment. And I've talked about this throughout so far, but we'll talk about some of the details here. First being that monthly payment is a conditioned sentence on the superior court level. 
So it's just like any other condition of sentence, meaning that noncompliance with that condition of sentence can lead to court-ordered sanctions. And that's one of the key differences between the Superior Court and District Court when it comes to noncompliance for legal financial obligations. On the Superior Court level, like I said, condition of sentence. The District Court level, it is your noncompliance can lead the court to hold you in contempt of court. So it's not a condition of sentence. They both can lead to jail time. The big difference between Superior Court and District Court is that on the Superior Court level, there's no credit given towards your legal financial obligations for every day you serve in the county jail. Yeah. We'll get to that in the next slide. Good point. You're right there with me. So on the Superior Court level, no credit. That was decided. State v. Mason a couple years ago said you cannot get credit for your time served on a Superior Court nonpayment for LFOs. District Court, on the other hand, you do get credit for each day that you serve in jail. And so, for instance, I know we've looked at some, done some court observations around the state and seen that, like Benton County gives people $50 a day for each day that they serve in jail. So if you've got $500, you'll serve 10 days in jail and then you'll be out. But going to your question, in any instance, there has to be an inquiry into ability to pay. So like the slide here says, jail time is not automatic. There's steps that need to be followed before jail time is imposed. Like I said, a lot of counties use jail time as a regular sanction. For instance, in Spokane, up until 2010, they had what was known as an auto jail policy. Individuals would enter into what was known as pay or appear agreements. So the court would say pay $25 a month. If you don't, show up at the jail and sit it out, and you're going to sit in jail for 60 days. That is unconstitutional. There's a U.S. Supreme Court case, Bearden v. Georgia, in which the court has said you cannot incarcerate an individual for failing to pay their legal financial obligations if the failure to pay is due solely to that individual's indigence. So before incarceration can take place, the individual is entitled to a hearing, and the court must inquire into the individual's failure to pay at that hearing, where the burden is on the defendant to prove that the nonpayment was not willful. So if a person is brought in for their hearing, the state has to prove by a preponderance of the evidence that the violation was committed, which is fairly easy. They just have to say, you know, Mr. Allen didn't pay his legal financial obligations. But at that point, the burden shifts to the defendant to prove that the inability to pay was not willful. And this is where defendants mess up because of lack of information about this burden and what they need to do to show inability to pay. You cannot plead poverty in general to meet your burden, and this has been discussed in State v. Bauer, a case from about 20 years ago, where an individual was brought before the court for his hearing to prove inability to pay, and he simply said, Your Honor, I can't afford to pay this because I don't have the ability to pay. That's not enough. You have to present affirmative evidence to the court that you do not have the ability to pay. And this is where the financial declaration comes in handy, because if you can present that evidence to the court to show, look, this is my income, and after all my expenses are taken care of, you know, rent, utility, transportation, child care, medical costs, other legal financial obligations in other counties, in that situation, you can show, look, I don't have any money left over, and therefore, you know, I can't be incarcerated. In addition to that, the defendant should be supporting that declaration with evidence, so it's not just enough to fill out the numbers in the declaration. What a lot of courts require is that you actually, you know, have your rent receipt attached to that, that you have your benefits letter attached to that, that you have receipts of medical costs and transportation. The closer that you can put an airtight argument to the court, the better it is, the better the outcome. That's likely. And that last bullet point there is important as well, because what can happen oftentimes is that an individual 
will fail to appear for noncompliance, then be brought in on a warrant for noncompliance and failure to appear, the court will find that the person did not willfully fail to pay their legal or financial obligations, but the individual will still wind up in jail because uh, they failed to appear. So it's key to let individuals know you need to respond to any notice from the courts. Uh, the head in the sand model does not work when it comes to legal financial obligations. Uh, it'll just lead to additional sanctions and more jail time. And like I said, just continuation of this, uh, of this cycle. Um, and another reason that I uh, talked about pleading poverty and, and not being able to do that to the court, the reference to case in your materials, um, Fate v. Campbell, and in that case, the individual had $700 in monthly income and was caring for his daughter, but presented to the court that he had $200 in disposable income. And so based on what I've told you, you can only imagine what the outcome of that case was. Willful noncompliance, even though the court said we don't see how somebody making only $700 a month would have $200 in disposable income, but that's what you've presented to us. And so the, the trial court met its uh, minimal standard of, of finding um, uh, willfulness. Um, another barrier is uh, expiration of legal financial obligations. So like Vanessa talked about earlier, newer LFOs never expire. If your offense was committed after July 1st, 2000, you're going to pay on your legal financial obligations till they're paid in full. The old law still applies to offenses committed before July 1st, 2000. If your offense was committed before then, the LFOs run 10 years from the date of release from total confinement or the date of judgment whichever is later, and then the court can extend jurisdiction for an additional 10 years if the uh, extension is requested prior to the end of the first year period, 10 year period. So at a max, you're talking about 20 years from the date of release from total confinement for uh, offenses that were committed prior to July 2000 where LFOs were imposed. And uh, I won't get into um, too many of the details about this because Mari is gonna talk about a case that she's worked on with expiration. Um, but to get uh, a relief, you do have to file a motion. Um, uh, the clerk's office, the court, will not give notice that your LFOs have expired. And in fact, you will continue to receive billing statements in many cases. We've seen people that have paid uh, way more than they, than they owe um, after the fact. And uh, it's, it's a, a step that they have to take to, um, to address those. Yeah. No, that's just going to be a payment towards those legal financial obligations. They're just going to say you voluntarily made, chose to make payments on a legal financial obligation that's expired. So, um, you know, I suppose you could uh, uh, submit a motion, but I would guess that it would be unlikely that the court would grant that, uh, especially if a victim's involved, because then that money has already uh, gone to, to that victim. Yeah. Yeah, no, there's two cases. State v. Iyer said that uh, legal financial obligation interest is not um, uh, dischargeable through bankruptcy, and uh, State v. Cunningham has said the principal amount is um, is not dischargeable through bankruptcy. So not a, not an avenue to, to seek for um, uh, discharging uh, superior court legal financial obligations. There still might be a question about district court, but um, I would guess because they're um, uh, part and parcel of a criminal conviction that, that that's unlikely as well. Um, I will quickly go through these next slides because I know uh, Mario is going to get up here. Um, we talked about the record sealing. There's a barrier that has been addressed, um, and this is important for clients that come through our clinic, is that a few years ago, um, up until a few years ago, payment of legal financial obligations, uh, uh, your voting right was dependent on payment of your legal financial obligations. So if you have felony conviction, legal financial obligations, you cannot get your right to vote back until those uh, legal financial obligations were paid off. This was addressed by the legislature two years ago so that uh, persons with com uh, felony convictions have a provisional right to vote restored um, uh, so long as they're no longer under DOC supervision. Once that uh, happens, the, the right to vote is automatically restored, but it can be revoked if the individual uh, fails to make three payments within a year. I've not heard of any uh, prosecutor's offices moving to revoke payments so far. Um, but it is a, so it is a, a benefit to people who have le uh, legal financial obligations uh, and felonies and, and still want to, uh, to exercise the right to vote. An individual, individual still needs to register, but otherwise uh, they're good. Um, I won't get into these here, but there are some examples in your PowerPoint 
if you do choose to volunteer, that'll kind of really basic uh, LFO examples on expiration, interest, and uh, uh, there's another one in there. I forget what it's about. Uh, sanctions. It just help you to see kind of some of the issues on a basic level that we see through the clinic. Um, if you have questions, feel free to to contact us. Uh, but I imagine that everybody in here will will get through those pretty easily. Um, they just cover some of the stuff that we see coming through the clinic on a, on a real basic level. And then uh, the last thing, and I don't really need to touch on this, is because Mario will. But if you are going to volunteer, there's just kind of some steps that are involved with legal financial obligations that involves, you know, identifying the issue first. There's really a limited universe of issues that comes up with legal financial obligations. Of course, we do see the exceptions all the time, but for the most part, we're going to be dealing with, you know, six or seven primary issues that people have related to legal financial obligations. And there's a quick reference guide included in your materials that guides you through that process and tells you, you know, how to start in, a, in interviewing the client and getting to the heart of their legal financial obligation issue. And then you just want to do the, you know, the what, where's, and how's. Uh, where, who imposed the, uh, what court imposed the LFOs? Is this municipal or district? Um, and I'm sorry we couldn't get too, uh, as much into municipal and district court LFOs as I would like, but, um, uh, you know, figuring out the distinctions there. The, the advice you give will be different depending on the court that's imposed the legal financial obligations. Uh, similarly, um, where the LFOs were imposed, we touched on that. But you want to keep some of this in mind. You want to make sure that the client has uh, the proper documentation. And if they don't, uh, maybe saying, look, we'll follow up once you do have this documentation. Because the goal is to take that person's specific LFO issue and kind of guide them through the process over the course of, a, of an hour or a couple of uh, hours if, uh, if they need follow-up services. Um, and figuring out whether they need follow-up services. And then... Um, and then at the end, just providing them with the key documentation based on the issues that you spotted and, um, and, and the relief that you think they can access. And, um, you know, another uh, point to, uh, to make is it can be just as helpful for an individual to know that there are no relief options for them. So we see oftentimes people that come in with giant restitution orders, and the only thing we can tell them is you've got to pay off the principal before this happens. And that can help a person say, you know, uh, now I know I, that I need to manage and include this in my budget for the next 20, 30 years instead of thinking, okay, in three years these things will go away. Um, so it can help people regardless of whether uh, re relief options are available or not. And uh, like I said, I will be happy to answer any questions after uh, Maria takes the last half hour here. Um, but that's a, a brief overview of, uh, of, of the topic. Okay. <clears throat> I don't know if I'm going to talk as loud or if this works. Anyway, as Nick said, um, my name is Maria Silvernail, and um, I'm going to speak today a little bit about um, volunteering in the in the clinic, uh, based on my experience over the last two years of volunteering. Um, I have to say I'm a little intimidated, <laughs> and I've decided that my purpose here is to uh, assure you that you don't have to be as knowledgeable, experienced, and articulate as Vanessa and Nick and Murph in order to do this volunteering. Uh, and they've given a lot of information, and it's really well documented in the materials that you get. Uh, and if you read through it, you know, you'll be as confident as you need to be to give the advice. Um, I can assure you of that from my two years of experience. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the way the clinic works, and uh, I'll, I'll maybe figure out how to do this. <laughs> All right, so a little bit of background. I've been volunteering in the clinic for the last two years. Um, I practiced uh, civil law um, for a city and county for over 25 years uh, before I had the opportunity to take some time off. And I decided I wanted to switch to the emeritus status um, category of bar membership and do volunteer work. And you need to find a qualified legal services provider. And fortunately, Columbia Legal Services is one. So I switched to that category a couple of years ago. And I saw a, a flyer for this training for a, a legal clinic, the LFO clinic, the legal financial obligation. So in uh, November of uh, 2011, I attended a class very much like this one you guys are attending. Um, and that's basically all I, uh, all I did in order to be prepared. I didn't have any criminal law background. 
uh, I just had a little bit of volunteer work while I was in law school with the Legal Action Center, but I did not primarily or wasn't involved in advising uh, low-income clients or in matters of uh, uh, housing and landlord and certainly nothing related to criminal law. So um, the take-home message there is that you can volunteer even if you don't have a background uh, in those things, and you'll be just great. Uh, having the criminal background is probably helpful to you as well, and your experience is certainly going to be going to be helpful. So uh, let me see. Go to the next one. Okay. So basically, the scope of the client services that are provided in the clinic setting. Um, the reentry clinic, and the, I think I'll be speaking a lot to the LFO clinic because that's really all I've done. Like you, I'm sitting here listening to the information about housing and employment impacts of having a criminal record, um, but I haven't done a lot of that advising, so uh, a lot of my comments I think are pretty well focused on the LFO clinic. Um, basically, it's what they call a counsel and advice model, uh, and it's um, it's a limited scope of legal services. So the first thing that you do is there's a client agreement. There's a copy that's in your materials. So basically there's a lots of stuff for the LFO portion that's under tab number nine. Um, the client agreement is really the first thing that you'll go over, and it basically explains that um, there's no continuing uh, representation and no ongoing attorney-client relationship uh, that's being established. Uh, there's still the attorney-client confidentiality, and I think there's still a lot of really important um, uh, things from being in a confidential attorney-client relationship that the clients get from being able to talk with a volunteer attorney. Uh, but you're not establishing an ongoing attorney-client relationship, and there isn't uh, the need for um, follow-up, um, although there is some sorts of follow-up, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, as I said, you know, the attorney-client confidentiality still applies, and we provide a space that's a confidential meeting space. Uh, and there are some other ethical issues that sort of are raised that uh, hopefully Debbie Perlis will address uh, later on in the afternoon. Uh, when I attended this training, I found the uh, ethics section to be really, really helpful, and I went back to the materials that were provided and looked at these things on, you know, what do they mean by limited scope representation um, so that uh, I feel like I'm, you know, it's, if it's reasonable to limit the scope and if the client consents. So those sorts of things are addressed there. Um, issues of dressing, uh, dressing, dealing with clients with diminished capacity, um, ghost writing issues, uh, those things actually come up uh, in the day-to-day -day clinic uh, work that I did. Uh, so hopefully Debbie will cover those. So a little bit about the clinic um, the, and the volunteer time commitment. It's flexible. Um, the request is that you commit to do four clinic sessions per year, and they're each about two and a half hours, so that's 10 hours per year, um, which is pretty reasonable. Um, the clinics that, the, currently the clinics that we have are scheduled on the second and fourth Tuesdays, do I have that right? <laughs> Tuesdays? Okay, good. Uh, and one will be at the King County Law Library, which is where we've been doing the clinic now, and um, one will be at the Fair Start offices. Um, so that's really helpful. Uh, that, that's a, a defined space and a regularly scheduled time. Uh, hopefully you can work that into your schedule. Um, again, there isn't any obligation to follow up with clients. However, um, there may be a possibility to do that. In my case, I was interested in volunteering some additional time uh, to do sort of limited representation to help clients actually go through these um, processes. We give them information, and it, it's pretty daunting, you know, writing up your own. You have to do an actual motion and proposed order in order to get an expired LFO actually terminated and in order to get your um, uh, interest waived. Uh, and actually going through that process is, is uh, you know, it's very daunting to somebody who's not an attorney. Uh, and it, it, it may be, we may think, oh, this is pretty easy because it's standard and the forms are provided. But for lots of folks, you know, actually having access to a computer to type this up and to uh, get your facts straight and to sort of assemble all of the information is a really daunting task. Um, so it may be that um, uh, people come back to more than one clinic appointment, and that's where that sort of limited scope issue comes in. Uh, you'll help them in the clinic, and then uh, if they need to go get information um, uh, or they need to assemble their documentation, they may come back for another appointment, and possibly you'll see the same person, but you can see them in the clinic setting. Um, 
Okay. So a question was raised earlier today about, uh, in Vanessa's presentation about war, that sounds like a lot of, um, of working, checking out facts, and uh, going back and forth. And in my experience, that sometimes happened, you know, not as much as Vanessa's clients, but uh, you know, sending people back to court to get information about their judgment and sentence and to get information about their financial payment history. Um, it's kind of an opportunity for self-advocacy on their part, and I'm hopeful that it's also something that might be provided by the Fair Start counselors, at least for the Fair Start clients, to help people go back to court and actually find those records. Um, the one benefit at the King County uh, Clinic is it's held at the law library, which is on the sixth floor. It's the other end of the hallway from where the clerk's office is. And I've had the experience of saying, you know, here's where you go and look. Here's where you find these pieces of paper. And they'll go down to the clerk's office, and sometimes they can come back during the same clinic, or they can come back and, uh, on another appointment. And I can tell them exactly where to go to get their court records and where to go to get their financial information, which is at the other end of the counter. So um, in that way, it's, it's uh, you know, it is kind of an ongoing process where people will come back. Uh, so basically, Nick's presentation, let me see, get this done, <laughs> clinic details. Um, Nick's presentation and his slides really go through the clinic. Um, uh, I can, I'll go over a little bit about clinic details and then also training and support and then maybe the benefits of clinic volunteering. I might mix them all up, but I'll, I'll try and keep my, I think uh, consistent. Um, the cool thing this is to me is sort of a benefit about it, but also an explanation of the clinic is that you get a lot of help. The, um, the Columbia Legal Services has a dedicated legal assistant that's going to be doing the client intake screening and making sure that people are actually eligible for the services, um, put together basic information about you know what the client says their problem is. Um, there's also some ability to um, uh, pull records before the meeting is held. They'll get copies of the judgment and sentence and copies of, um, if the client provides them, copies of billing statements. So uh, it's possible that a lot of those records will already be compiled for you when you sit down to meet with somebody and you can quickly look at that information. Um, again, for me, it was pretty daunting um, to look at a judgment and sentence. You know, they're just m many pages long, and I'd never, ever looked through one. But those of you with criminal background will have no problem. And then other people look at the example of a judgment and sentence that's provided in the material. Uh, you pretty quickly get quick at figuring out where the information about their LFOs uh, are located. Um, so uh, again, you'll get this file, and it'll have the client agreement, and you'll go over that with the client, and then both of you will sign it. Um, and that's real important. Uh, and then uh, you kind of get an overview of the case. Oh, we go on to the next slide. Um, yeah, well, there it is. Client issues overview provided. Okay. Um, <laughs> sorry. Um, so usually the, the way I start, you know, the way that uh, Nick recommends starting is to just uh, ask the client why they're here and what it is that they hope to achieve. Um, and sometimes, you know, it really is uh, just an opportunity to sit down with the client and sort of give them an overview and explain things. And like Nick said, sometimes you're not going to give them, you know, there's no silver bullet, no magic bullet. You're not going to get rid of their LFOs, but you're just going to really give them, you know, hopefully where they feel uh, somebody took the time to sit down and really explain to them what these documents say and what the legal situation is and that they're getting information from somebody who's their advocate. Um, I think that uh, my experience with a lot of the people that I've talked with is that, you know, for good reason, they don't always feel that the information that they get from the clerk or from the prosecutor um, uh, was very helpful on these issues or was necessarily in their best interest. Um, and, you know, folks, when they're dealing with their, uh, you know, most people had public defenders. When they're dealing with their public defenders, their, their minds are on the other things. You know, they're on the, uh, the trial, they're on uh, going, going to jail, and they're not really on some of these LFO issues. So, you know, you provide an opportunity to really sit down and explain to them in terms that, you know, are really meaningful to them uh, what the situation is. So um, uh, what we'll do is in this clinic is we'll focus on um, the particular LFO issues and also the housing and the uh, employment um, and make referrals for other issues that are sort of outside of our scope or beyond what we can do in this kind of advice and um, counsel um, model. Um, so follow up on relevant issues, um, and again, you know, the beauty of this clinic is that clients can make follow-up appointments and come back um, when they've 
assembled more of their documents uh, and uh, are at sort of the next step. Sometimes these things are really just multi-step processes. You know, people, some people are kind of limited in the amount of information that they can absorb. Um, and, uh, and so uh, coming, being able to come back uh, multiple times is real helpful. So training and support, um, that's another advantage of this clinic model as a way to do volunteer uh, legal services is there is a lot of really great training such as today's CLE. Um, there's lots of materials in your book. Uh, one of the things that's really helpful are there's um, uh, for FYIs for your information. Um, they're pretty detailed. Um, as my son would say, no offense, but <laughs> uh, sometimes uh, I look at them and I think, wow, this is a lot more information than a lot of the clients that I speak with are going to be able to really process. Um, however, it's really great information for you as a volunteer attorney that maybe doesn't have a lot of background in this area. Um, it gives you lots of steps and it's something that uh, you can do to just basically sit down and say, okay, I'm going to explain how these steps work and I'm going to give you this document you know, to take home uh, so that you can uh, work through it. Uh, and lots of people are really able to take that home and work through it later, or they have other friends that can help them sort of read through the document. Uh, but those clinic materials um, are really helpful, uh, especially for educating you about what you need to know so that you can then explain it to uh, the clients that we see. Uh, the other thing that's provided in the materials are lots of form um, uh, documents, form motions and orders uh, that um, uh, they're basically to give to the clients so the clients can do that themselves. Um, what I've been able to do is take that next step of actually uh, going ahead and doing one and I've worked on um, motions to uh, terminate expired LFO obligations and recently did a motion, completed a motion to um, reduce the interest owed on a restitution after being able to successfully negotiate an agreement with the party that was receiving the restitution payments to reduce the interest amount. So first, the benefits of volunteering. I've already covered a lot of them, but it's really there are convenient locations and regular hours. You have a very clearly defined legal role and, um, and, a, and a role for just giving limited legal advice. Um, the follow-up and other support services are, uh, in the case of the Fair Start, provided in the context of their program. Uh, and so if there are things they need, like getting documents, I think there'll be help from other people to follow up with folks, and that's not necessarily, or that's not your responsibility. Um, the other things that I think are beneficial is, again, there's great support. Um, there'll be a, 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 a very experienced and knowledgeable legal services attorney like uh, Nick or Murph uh, at the clinic site, at every clinic, and they're able to answer questions, which is really great. You know, you may just say, I don't know the answer to that, but I can go get that answer and I can get back to you on that. Uh, so that's really great to have that sort of um, support. So, um, and what I'll talk about uh, a little bit is um, some common issues that I've worked on. Um, uh, one of them is the expiration, uh, as Nick mentioned, uh, for offenses that were uh, committed after July 1 of 2000. Um, now there is no expiration date, so we're talking about older offenses. Um, but the good news is, is that for these older offenses, you know, my, in my experience, it's been oftentimes people who, um, uh, it's been many years since the offense was committed and, and really getting rid of that financial obligation helps them sort of stay on track uh, with their life um, and uh, get rid of this financial obligation. And also if it's really old, there's oftentimes a lot of interest that's accrued. And so being able to just eliminate it entirely is, is, um, is really helpful. Um, how am I doing for time? Okay. <laughs> um, Okay, so uh, the way that I've addressed it here in King County is, um, first off, there's lots of self-help materials that are in the book. Um, there's a step-by-step -step procedure uh, with lots of information about how you go about collecting the information. Um, basically, in King County, it's researching the facts and documents. Um, you need to find the date of the offense to make sure that it is um, uh, an obligation that's going to expire. Um, you need the judgment and sentence um, in order to, uh, and, or the order of restitution to figure out all of the amounts and to figure out the dates. Um, again, the statute's, the statute's been 
amended several times to change the date that they calculate when the 10 years starts to run. So it's a little bit confusing, but it pretty much uh, basically boils down to um, was there an order extending jurisdiction filed and how much time has gone by since the person was released from total confinement. Uh, so you need to assemble all these documents um, and this way. This is um, an example of the docket that you get from the uh, Washington Courts website. Um, and you don't get an actual copy of the document this way, but you're able to see it, it'll be called an order extending jurisdiction if it's there. Um, the ones that I dealt with, uh, I was glad to see there wasn't anything labeled an order extending jurisdiction. And what I ended up doing sort of to satisfy myself was to go down to the King County Superior Court and actually look through the uh, case file that's open to the public. Uh, and you can, you know, w for no money, you can uh, a review a copy of all of the documents. It's, I think, 25 cents a page if you want to print them out. Um, uh, and there, if you can't, if you don't find a copy of an order extending jurisdiction, then um, you can assume that a jurisdiction wasn't extended. So uh, what I did is went through the exercise of um, finding, of you know, going through this information and putting this together in one of the sample motion and orders. Uh, I talked with the, an attorney with the King County Prosecuting Attorney's Office who works in the post-sentencing unit, and she was actually really helpful. She just said flat out, you know, that the information that's available to me is the same information available to you. If you can't find an order extending jurisdiction in the court's file, then I'm likely not going to be able to find it. So that's good enough for me. And she also said that, you know, I don't have any interest in sort of uh, – um, hassling people about this. If they've expired, they've expired, and I'm willing to sign an agreed order. So you have a copy in the, um, in the materials of the agreed order and – or the agreed motion and order dismissing the uh, case um, that we've been able to use um, multiple times now. Uh, and the benefit there of putting it together in an agreed order is you can – after you've got all the information and attached the documents, you can just send it to the uh, King County Prosecutor's post-sentencing unit, and they will actually process it. They, uh, they say it's helpful to know who the sentencing judge was because the, it goes back to the sentencing judge or the substitute judge if, if the sentencing judge is no longer sitting on the court. Um, but she'll uh, – he or she will process that for you and then send the order back to Columbia Legal Services. Again, I'm not sure how much of that we'll be doing in the clinic, but um, uh, I – what I can assure you is, is the process works pretty well if you've got all your documentation. So helping people find the documentation is a really key thing that you'll do, and, uh, and then um, hopefully they'll be able to put together that agreed motion and order. Um, so the benefits to the clients are that uh, – yeah, that it, um, it removes the debt completely, uh, and the court will enter a satisfaction of judgment. Uh, it allows the clients to concentrate on other LFOs that they might have or other debt. Um, it also prevents the clerk from allocating portions of the payment. You know, as Nick explained, the court will – if you submit a voluntary payment, the court will apportion a payment to expired LFOs as well as the unexpired LFOs. And some courts, I'm told, um, actually uh, assign the payments to the oldest LFO obligation first. So they may be uh, assigning 100 percent of the payment within a single court uh, to an expired LFO, uh, which is just means it's going to take a lot longer for uh, somebody to pay off all these debts. Um, again, the clerk's policy is to continue collecting these payments if people submit them. If your client just submits a single payment and they have two or three cases, they'll apportion them across the three cases. Um, and apportion it to restitution and non-restitution. Um, so what King County says is they'll continue to accept the payments, but they won't put you into any sort of an enforcement proceeding, um, which is, you know, of some benefit. But if you're continuing to collect the payments when you're talking about people that really don't have a lot of financial wherewithal, uh, it's nice to be able to get rid of them. Um, it also uh, discharge it, it completely. Um, it satisfies all of the requirements to get your um, uh, to get a discharge certificate, which may be useful to some people. Um, okay, so in the did not want to do that, but okay. So uh, the other um, uh, example of an area where I was able to help a client is in negotiating for. Um, uh, restitution interest relief. Nick sort of explained that interest depends on whether it's a, a non-restitution versus restitution, whether you're incarcerated or not incarcerated. Uh, when you get to restitution, uh, basically um, 
it all has to do with whether or not you've paid off the principal, whether you can get interest relief. Again, the restitution doesn't depend on your ability to pay, so you have to pay it no matter what. Um, uh, but if you have paid the entire principal, then the statute does seem to suggest that you can get interest relief. It isn't really clear exactly what the statute requires. I think it requires uh, that you have a hardship, and so the same documentation of a hardship for making this payment is going to be um, uh, imposed. Um, process. Okay, so um, I assisted a client, and um, what we did is we basically, uh, first we figured out where his documents were, you know, what the order of restitution was, um, which is on the record side of the clerk's office, and then on the left side of the clerk's office is the counter where people pay their LFO obligations. They can give you a printout of your payment history that shows what you've paid. They usually just write it down for you because they charge a dollar a page, and it may go on for several pages because it shows all the payments they've received and the, payment and the payouts that they've made. Um, uh, so if, uh, if they want to uh, actually bring the motion, it may be useful to actually get that printout. But what we did is we collected all the information, and I had a client who um, is not atypical of the clients you see. He had a couple of LFOs that he'd been paying on from different criminal offenses. He'd paid one off entirely, um, and he was surprised to learn that the second one, the jurisdiction had been extended for another 10 years. Um, he'd paid off all of the principal balance, and he'd paid a significant amount of interest, and he was pretty uh, crestfallen to realize that the jurisdiction was extended in 2011 for another 10 years, that he's basically going to, he'd already been paying on LFOs for 15 years, and he was going to be paying on LFOs for another uh, eight years at this point. Um, and what we were able to do is show that he'd paid consistently on a monthly basis every month, you know, he'd been paying for a long time. He paid all the principal. He paid a significant amount of the interest. Um, he'd lost his job, and he was in his late 50s, and he'd been working uh, diligently at finding a new job, but he hadn't been able to find a new job. Uh, the clerk's office had been willing to modify his payment amount in view of his financial circumstances, um, but it was still a, a hardship to him, at least at that point. I think he's since gotten a job, but at that point, he was all he was getting was unemployment insurance, and after a certain point, his unemployment insurance had even gone down. Uh, so what we did is we put all this information together. Um, we looked at, I looked and researched the interest rates over the last 10 or 15 years, and as most people know, 12% uh, per year is pretty high interest compared to what you can get in any place else, you know, your bank account, even what the uh, uh, federal, uh, uh, the, I can't remember the name of that interest rate, <laughs> but uh, uh, it's a lot, 12% is a lot more than any amount of interest you could get. So we wrote this letter and we basically explained why it was a hardship because this person had lost their job. Um, we also sort of explained the rehabilitation part, um, which has been mentioned. It's not technically a requirement of the statute, but I think it is really useful to state, you know, that this particular person, you know, had paid monthly without fail his restitution obligation. Um, for, you know, more than 10 years on this particular one, and that he paid off the principal and already paid significant interest. And uh, surprisingly enough, <laughs> despite my, uh, my cynicism, that Melissa was very positive about continuing to contact. They didn't respond to my letter, so I made a PDF and I sent it by email, which was a lot more effective. I guess I should have uh, not been surprised, but... Um, anyway, uh, they were actually really helpful, and they said that they would be willing to waive all of the rest of the interest. I had already told the client that for restitution, they can't just waive it all, but they can reduce it if we need to go to court. Um, in this case, the client had actually paid some of the interest, and so I was able to request that they reduce the rest of the interest, which was sort of, to him, like waiving the rest of the interest. Uh, anyway, um, they agreed to do it. So uh, we, they, they wrote us a brief letter that basically said they agreed, and we were able to do an agreed motion in order. Again, the prosecuting attorney's office, the post-sentencing unit said, um, if the person to whom restitution is owed is, is willing to agree, then uh, we won't uh, object, and said it's the paperwork and we'll process it, which they did. So um, I, the one thing I wanted to... Uh, uh, caution with though on the interest um, uh, negotiating interest relief on restitution where you have an individual victim is that most of those judgment and sentences have no contact orders with the victim and sometimes witnesses and other parties. 
Um, so uh, if there is a no-contact order, you really have to point that out and make sure. Uh, my advice uh, to the clients that I've talked to is I would counsel against trying to contact a, a specifically named victim, even if there's not a no-contact order, uh, because I think that it, it, it just would be I don't think it would help the, the client's case to be trying to contact a victim to uh, see if they'll get, if they'll agree to reduce the, the amount. Um, one thing that the Parskini Attorney's Office said uh, to me, though, is that in appropriate circumstances, the victim witness unit of the prosecutor's office might be available to help with negotiation. That, and I don't know what an appropriate circumstance might be, but they did say that um, if you have a client who's got a specifically named victim, then maybe um, go through the prosecuting attorney's office and the victim witness unit if, if there's any desire to try and negotiate. Um, a lot of them that I've seen, though, are institutional clients like Harborview, the public health hospitals, restitution would be the amount of, of any sort of uh, medical services that might have been provided to the victim or even to the defendant. Um, and also insurance companies, there's a number of insurance companies that are listed, and I think that they're, unless they're specifically listed in the judgment and sentence as a no contact, um, I don't think there's any, uh, anything wrong with contacting the insurance company and seeing if they're willing to negotiate uh, for a reduction in the amount of restitution or in the, uh, or in the amount of interest. I, I don't know, I've never done it and I don't know how successful it might be because they don't have much to lose, the, the insurance company, um, uh, you know, it's a permanent obligation mostly. In ones that are going to expire at some point or in ones that are not very collectible, you might be able to negotiate to, uh, to get uh, the amount reduced. So basically that's it. Um, uh, if you have questions about the reentry program, you know, Columbia Legal Services, definitely who to contact. Um, if you have questions about working as a volunteer, feel free to contact me. I'm happy to talk with anyone. And uh, I'll, I'll quit talking. <laughs> Thank you. So hopefully I'll go a lot longer than I did this morning. I'm sure you'll be thrilled about that. So we're going to talk about housing and uh, criminal records. So first we'll talk about a new law that passed a couple years ago, the Fair Tenant Screening Act. We'll talk about the federal fair housing law. And then we'll look at uh, public and subsidized housing admissions and what the rules and laws are around those. And then we'll talk briefly about appeals. And at the end, we'll look at what's the best way to prepare a client for an individual assessment if they have an opportunity to do that, either in employment or in housing. Okay, so why are we talking about housing and criminal records? So homelessness has exploded in the last few years, and many folks who have a criminal record are also homeless. It's, it's a huge problem. And so one of the things we hope to achieve from the clinic is to remove bar access to barriers and increase access to housing for folks who have, uh-oh. For folks who have criminal records. So maybe I can do it this way. Okay, that's fancy. All right. So there was a recent study that came out this summer from DSHS, the Department of Health, uh, DSHS. And so what that looked at was what, what, are there any differences between folks coming out of prison who have access to stable housing and those that don't have access to stable housing or housing is not an issue? And what they found was yes, there is a, uh, Significant factors, if folks have stable permanent housing, they are much less likely to recidivate than they are if they don't have stable permanent housing. They also found that folks with stable housing had more more likely to access Medicaid and to access substance abuse treatment and were more likely to be able to become employed. And so housing seemed to be a key element for all of these other things. So sometimes we think, oh, get a job and then you can get housing and all these other things. But what this study found and other studies have shown that Housing first is really the key. So if folks can get into housing, then they can access all these other services, and they're much more likely. The other study is for each move that a person makes, many folks coming out of prison or jail do what most of you know as couch surfing. They stay to friends, they stay to family members, they stay here, they stay here. And what they, what this one study showed is that for each move that the client makes, their recidivism rate increases almost 25%. So keeping people in stable, permanent housing is really important. 
So first, let's talk about how do you get into housing? What's, sort, what's that process? And most of you are familiar. How many people have been a tenant, applied for housing? Everybody just about, yeah. So you know the deal, advertisement, you apply, you, get, you fill it out, you don't get it, most times you don't know why. And sometimes that can be a real problem for people. They keep getting denied, they have to pay an application fee, $50, $75, even a $100 fee, and they keep getting rejected. So the law was changed a few years ago to, to deal with this. And that, and that law is called the New Fair Tenant Screening Act. Oh, cool. Thanks. It's like magic. <laughs> All right. Um, so what, what does this law do? Well, it doesn't force landlords to take any, anyone. It doesn't sort of create a private right of action or anything like that. It, it does provide some, whoops. Go back. So landlords under the new tenant, Fair Tenant Screening Act, they can still try to make sure they have tenants who will pay the rent, who will follow the rules, because that's basically what landlords want. And so what they have to do now is they have to, landlords have to provide the tenant with information about their screening criteria in writing. They have to say what specific criteria will cause that person to be denied. So unlike in the employment context, in the tenant screening context, the tenant will know exactly why they've been denied. In the statute, you will see that there's a, a form in there that most landlords need to use substantially in that form, and it lists like 10 different things, and the landlord is required to check the box about why the person would be denied. Uh, maybe they may check all boxes, but most landlords won't do that. Vanessa talked about the credit reporting agencies and how that worked before this law passed. Although in employment, you are entitled to get notice of an adverse action and get information about the screening company that was used to provide the, the screening report to the employer, that wasn't the case for rental housing. So you weren't necessarily entitled to get a free copy of your report if you were denied housing. Now the uh, landlord has to give you notice uh, about the tenant screening company that they use, how to contact that company, and that you can obtain a free copy of your report. As Vanessa talked about, one glitch still is that the report that you get may not be the same one that the landlord gets. It won't look the same, but hopefully it will contain most of the similar information. If a landlord violates this section, the tenant can go into court and get up to $100 for each violation plus court costs and attorney's fees. So it's not sort of a ding landlord, but hopefully that provides some incentive for the landlord to comply. Usually a strongly worded letter could be fairly helpful for this and we'll provide some forms at the clinic for folks who need to uh, contact landlords about this problem. Many landlords, even though the law is about two years old, are not aware of this. And so if you see a tenant at the clinic who doesn't know why they were denied, then helping the tenant uh, fill out a form letter saying, I need a copy of my adverse action letter. Here's a copy of the statute. Here's what the form looks like. Please provide it to me in a certain amount of time. So those are some brief services that can be provided at the clinic under that particular statute. Any questions about that law? All right, it's a very exciting law. Next, we're going to talk about fair housing. We've already talked about the difference between disparate impact and disparate treatment. We'll talk a little bit more in depth about those two things within the housing context and also... I can't believe I just did that again. <laughs> Pay no attention. <laughs> um, I'm going to use the mouse because I am really klutzy. All right. Being uh, coordinated is not a requirement to volunteer at the clinic. Thank goodness. Or be a successful attorney. So Washington has its own fair housing law. It's pretty much modeled on the, on the federal law. It's very similar to what we talked about in Title VII. This is Title VIII. And a person cannot treat someone differently because of a protected class in terms of renting housing. And that's what we're talking about today. It also includes other real estate transactions. But what we're talking about today is rental denials. So again, just to review, disparate treatment is treating someone differently. And you have a discriminatory motive about that. You have to have discriminatory intent. One of the things I want to talk about is a lot of times when I give this presentation, people say, well, we don't discriminate in Seattle. We're progressive. We're open. We can't believe that there is a lot of housing discrimination here in our fair city. 
And so what I like to remind folks of is that in Seattle, unfortunately, we have a long, long, long history of housing discrimination. And it's one of the worst histories in the country. Many cities in the United States were already passing fair housing ordinances and trying to end housing dis discrimination, but Seattle was not. And if you look at the map, you can see this in 1960 was how segregated Seattle was. There were no, none, zero people of color, particularly uh, African Americans, living in Florence. Zippo, none. So keep that in mind when you're thinking about these things. So what the Seattle City Council did not want to vote on this, they wanted to let the people decide. So they put out a referendum and there was a vote on whether or not to have what was called an open housing ordinance, which basically was, should people in Seattle be able to discriminate on the basis of race and housing? And Seattleites, we voted two to one against the ordinance. So it was an unbelievable vote. The only reason that changed was because the Fair Housing Act passed, I think it was in 19, after the vote in 1968. And so finally, after following that law, we were able to pass a city council open housing <laughs> ordinance. And so that's one of the issues. And so what is it like, what is it like in Seattle now? Well, you can see that the demographics have changed somewhat. There are still some issues, but it's more, Seattle is more, widely distributed and more diverse than it used to be. We still have some serious problems that we need to address as far as uh, folks who are poor and folks who are people of color uh, being forced to live in, in certain neighborhoods. So, so that was in, from 1980 to 2000, what's happening now? So the Seattle Office of Civil Rights did a uh, testing in 2011, and testing is where the Seattle Office of Civil Rights trains people to go out and pretend, mostly actors, that they are a rental applicant. And so the, they usually pair testers and they have one white tester and one tester who is a person of color. And in this case, they did people who were African American and people who had a, people with disabilities. And they went out and see, and what they found was that in the, in the terms of housing, so the amount of the deposit, whether or not they did a credit check, and particularly whether or not they did a criminal background check really mattered based on the person's race. So the study found that almost 70%, 70 69 point something percent of landlords were treating people in a discriminatory way. They were no longer saying, which was they used to say, well, you can't live here because of your race. We used to have restricted covenants in Seattle that said that the person who owned a house could not rent or could not sell to someone who is a person of color. Though we've gotten rid of those and we've gotten rid of sort of mostly, not completely the obvious forms of discrimination, but it still exists. So remember that too when you're talking with people, almost 70% of landlords who were tested acted in some way that was discriminatory. Oh no, I want it, all right, we'll skip that. So we talked about disparate impact. So what we've just talked about is disparate treatment. Two people go and they apply for housing. The person who is white is not, does not have to pass a criminal background check, but the person of color does. Obviously, that's, dis that's discrimination. It can be really hard to prove because you have to show that your, based on your race, are being treated differently than other people, and it can be really hard to get that, that other kinds of information. And so the Seattle Office of Rights is really helpful. They can investigate and try to find out what's happening. So disparate impact. This has had uh, a long and troubled history in the housing context. It's much, it has been, in some ways, much more controversial in the housing context than it has been in the employment context. In the employment context, it's been pretty much understood that people need to work and that all people should be treated equally. But when it comes to renting out your home or selling your home, it has been much more difficult for people to accept that they can't have certain policies and that they can't rent to exactly who they want to rent to. I'm not sure why, but we've had a really long entrenched history of this in our country and particularly in the city of Seattle. So the Fair Housing Act, it has been argued, includes disparate impact as part of the act. It's not as explicit in the regulations or it wasn't explicit at all in the regulations as it was under the EEOC. So there was a bunch of litigation. All the circuits have said, yes, disparate impact exists under the Fair Housing Act. It's there. 
And all the circuits, they've used different tests among the different circuits, but all the circuits have found that disparate impact in housing exists. Finally, just recently, HUD passed a final rule that laid out the criteria for disparate impact in housing. And this is very recent within the last year. Part of the reason why HUD finally moved on this was because there were some cases that had gone before the Supreme Court that the Supreme Court was getting ready to decide, and so HUD needed to act quickly. Because there are many folks, this is very controversial, and there are some folks who disagree and think that disparate impact should not be a theory under the Fair Housing Act. My concern with getting rid of disparate impact is neutral policy, we would no longer have a way to talk about that kind of discrimination. For example, criminal records policy or policies that say you must make a certain amount of income or that I think a really good example is you must be able to live independently. So if we walk through that scenario the way we walk through the employment one, the ability to live in independently could, could inadvertently impact what class of folks. The elderly, folks with disabilities, children, and there could be less restrictive ways to do that. So the same is true for criminal backgrounds. There hasn't been a whole lot of case law about that. And we'll talk about HUD versus the EOC and guidance. So what the HUD rule said is it sort of reviewed all of the different cases, looked at all of the different tests, and came up with its own, which is that it has to predictably result in a disparate impact. It means it most likely will result in some type of discriminatory effect. There has to be a protected class, and there's no legally sufficient justification, which is a little bit different than some of the tests that have been in place before, which is a manifest relationship or a legitimate business. And so this sort of took all those and combined it into this. So the burden is on the employer to show that it's necessary to achieve their legitimate business interests and that there's no less discriminatory alternative. So the test is fairly similar but not exactly the same in housing and employment. There have been some recent cases that have bubbled up to the US Supreme Court one from a few years ago was Magna versus Gallagher. That was just a really bizarre, odd case out of Minnesota. And so in that case, there was a group of landlords who some would call slumlords who got mad at St. Paul, their uh, code enforcement department, who decided that they were actually going to enforce the code and require the landlords to have working toilets and running faucets and all those kinds of things, get rid of the rats. And so landlords who own those uh, slums said, well, the people who live in our housing are predominantly people who are African American. And so if you force us to bring our properties up to code, we'll have to evict all those people and nobody will be able to afford to live there. So therefore, it will have a disparate impact on African Americans and so we should be able to have slum housing because of that. So that was a very interesting use of the Fair Housing Act. And so they went up to the A circuit. The A circuit said, well, they do have a prima facie case of disparate impact. And St. Paul said, this is ridiculous. We have a housing code. We should be able to enforce it. And so they appealed to the US Supreme Court. And the US Supreme Court granted cert to decide whether disparate impact existed as a theory under the Fair Housing Act. Many advocates were really concerned that they would decide, the Supreme Court would decide that, no, this didn't exist. And so, thank goodness, at the final hour, right before oral argument, a settlement was reached, and uh, not a settlement, that St. Paul decided to withdraw their appeal to the U.S. Supreme Court, which was unbelievable. It's unprecedented at that time. And now uh, a similar thing has happened again. So this other case was right behind it coming up called Mount Holly versus Mount Holly Garden Citizens. And in that case, Mount Holly decided that they wanted to redevelop a blighted area. And so they wanted to get rid of folks who were living in that community who were pro predominantly African American and Hispanics. The problem was that studies and statistics showed that if they redeveloped it and put in the new housing, uh, the majority of whites who live there could come back and afford those houses, but 79% of blacks and Hispanics would not be able to afford that housing. And so that case, again, went all the way up to the U.S. Supreme Court. The argument was set for December 4th, our oral argument. The only issue that was granted cert was whether or not disparate impact existed 
under the Fair Housing Law, which made advocates and attorneys advocating under the Fair Housing Act very nervous because they weren't even going to look as they were in Magner about what was the test. In Magner, at least they were going to ask what specific, if it exists, what kind of test would we, would we use? And in Mount Holly, the only issue they granted was whether or not it existed. So most folks thought, well, they probably wouldn't have granted it if, uh, if they um, thought it existed. So that case settled just a few weeks ago. I was ecstatic. I did a little happy dance um, around the office. And that was a, a huge success because most people were pretty sure that that case would be a loser and would, would get rid of disparate impact uh, theory of cases under the Fair Housing Act. And so that settled fairly well. The uh, city of Mount Holly and some nonprofit developers got together and we're going to build housing that will be affordable to folks. And so most folks will be able to return to their community. The next case, American Insurance filed a case against HUD. This was in the real estate and insurance context saying that like this, the case we talked about filed by the state of Texas against the EEOC earlier, that HUD had no authority under the Fair Housing Law to issue these regulations. And so that, I think, was filed in the D.C. Circuit this year, and that case hasn't been resolved yet. The final case, I uh, forgot to put a site in, but I'll get that to you if folks want it. What happened under Katrina was there was this program to help people rebuild their homes. But what was happening is that federal project was using the value of the, the original value of the home. And so that original value of the home was much less for people of color than it was for people who were white. And so it caused a significant problem. And so the federal government settled and changed the way they, and they found that it had a disparate impact on communities of color. And so they changed the way they were assessing the housing and not to use the original value, but the most recently assessed value, I think, is what they decided on. All right. Any questions about that? Fascinating to me, maybe not super interesting to you. Questions about that? All right. So the big question, anybody have an answer to that? What do you think? How many people think yes? Anybody? Anybody think no? Any dissenters in the room? All right. Well, let's see what we come up with. So there's no HUD guidance on arrests and convictions, the use of arrests and conviction records in housing as there is in the EEOC. I think there's some analogies there, but HUD has not put it out. My understanding is they've written guidance, but because of all the controversy, they have not issued it yet. They were supposed to issue it two years ago in the summer, but they have not done so yet, even though people are clamoring, clamoring on it. There was one footnote in the final rule, the final rules in your materials that came out that talked about the comments they received about the confusion regarding criminal records and arrests and how they were taking note of that and were proceeding to do something, although they didn't see what it was. But I took that as being hopeful, trying to be an optimist on that. So I think what we have to do in the housing context is look to the HUD district impact rule and then make, an make argues that are analogous to the employment context. I wrote a manual, which I didn't force to go in your materials. It's like I don't know, 40 pages with 200 footnotes on this issue. And so if people are geeky and want to read more about it, I'm happy to forward you my manual. All right, which I just updated. So these are mainly, except for Tally versus Lane, the green case and the next case we're going to talk about, which is a state case, are more in the employment context. But I think if you're in the employment context, you can, of course, look at these cases. But in the housing context, I think it's it's a good analogy, and it's also a good review from the employment section this morning. So in green, they were denying people with prior criminal records, including arrests. And so what the court said was that you can't do that. You can't categorically deny people with criminal histories, that that's a violation of Title VII. So green has been a longstanding case, and green was codified by the EEOC into its regulations. HUD has not done this, but I think that you can make an analogous argument. Some advocates across the country have tried to file cases and assert that if a person has a disability and their disability was related to their crime, like drug possession or theft or something like that, they have asked the housing provider to provide a reasonable accommodation. And under the Fair Housing Act, you can ask for a reasonable accommodation and ask the landlord to change their rule 
or their policy so that you can use and enjoy the housing like anyone else. So in those cases, they were saying you need to change your criminal record policy and not deny this person because they had a charge of possession because they're covered under the Fair Housing Act as someone with a disability because they're a substance abuser and substance abusers who are not actively using are covered by the act. Some courts have said okay, but most courts, and there's been some success at an, at an administrative level, but most courts have said, well, it's not really related to the disability, and what, we're not talking about the person's disability, we're talking about the person's cr criminal record, and they refuse to see the nexus between the criminal record and the person's disability. And what they said in tally was that if a person had a criminal history and they could show that there are was some type of a relationship between that criminal history and that person being violent to staff or other tenants that the housing provider could refuse to rent to that person. And we'll talk more, that was in a public subsidized housing context, so we'll talk more about that. Evan said almost the exact same thing uh, 15 years later, that you could refuse to rent to someone based on their criminal record. So in most cases, the one person raised their hand, yes, you can a landlord can refuse to rent to someone based on their criminal record unless that person is in a protected class. And the real problem in the housing context is that there is not the statistical data is there as there is in the employment context. And the EEOC already has compiled all that data and says, yes, there already is this statistical disparate impact. But HUD has not done that yet in the housing context. So it makes these cases that much more difficult for people to file pro se. It's much more easy, it's much easier for someone to file and have SOCR investigate an employment case because there's the EEOC guidance saying yes, there is a disparate impact on protected classes based on criminal records in the employment context. There is not that in housing. And so it makes it much more difficult. But in Washington, I think there's a really good argument that you can use the Oliver case to say that landlords rather than having automatic bans on people with a criminal history need to do a case-by-case -case assessment as they are required to do under the EEOC or under the Jobs Assistance Ordinance. So this is a reminder that Washington employers need to do a case-by-case -case assessment. The unfortunate part is unlike the Jobs Assistance Ordinance which applies to everyone whether or not they're in a protected class, this case will only apply to folks who are in a protected class. So I think there's a good argument in that we can say to people to ask the landlord for an individual assessment based on this case law, but it would be a case of first impression. This has not yet been decided in Washington or in most other states. Okay, so I'm gonna review the criminal record statistics. So what, how could you help someone who has a housing issue argue this statistical analysis which can be hugely huge, complicated? I think you can rely on a report that was issued by the Task Force on Race Discrimination in the Criminal Justice System in Washington. They did an amazing job, cited in your materials, I think, and it's cited here. And what they said is that at every point in the process, some type of discrimination has happened. For example, people convicted of a felony drug crime, people who were African-American males were 69% more likely to be incarcerated than those who were not. It also goes at the front end for auto stops. So having your, being pulled over and having your car searched, it was much more likely to happen to people who were, who were Hispanic, people who are African American. However, it was much more likely if a white person was pulled over that they would find illegal substances. It was significantly more likely. And although the Farrakhan case was overturned on other grounds, there's really good dicta in there that I think can be helpful, which says that there is no other reason or no underlying idea or rationale for the, the disproportionate statistics in our criminal justice system, basically other than racial discrimination. So we talked about that. From the, um, So where are we at? There might be some statistics, uh, there's some showing that there may be disproportionality among folks. So 
You have answered the first part. So there's a neutral policy, no felons, or we don't take people with criminal histories, or we don't take people with criminal histories in the last three years, or violent offenses. Then the next step you would look, does it have a disparate effect? Yes, it could. And finally, what would be the business justification for not wanting to rent to someone with a criminal record? It could hurt somebody, right? They could recidivate, they could go back to jail and then go to prison and never pay their rent. They may have to go through an eviction. There may be liability issues related to negligence. All these reasons. But so could someone also who doesn't have a criminal record. So one of the things I think is helpful to make housing providers aware of and clients aware of at the clinic is looking at how long ago the crime happened. There's been some really good studies that show that after a certain amount of time, a person's, the chance that a person would recidivate or commit another crime gradually coincides with someone who has never been arrested or convicted of a crime. It becomes exactly the same. And it varies by crime, but usually it's right around seven years. There was a study, I think from 2011 at the Downtown Emergency Services Center, where they looked at their clients and they looked at one group who had a criminal history and another group who did not have a criminal history over a two year period. And what they found was the ability to comply with the obligations of a lease was exactly the same for those two cohorts. There was no difference based on criminal record. The only difference they found, there was one group that was much more likely to break the rules than any other group. Any idea who it was, what group? Those who are parents may know. The younger you were, the more, much more likely you were to break the rules. So that was a much more correlated than having a criminal history where there was no correlation. So this study shows, has looked at three crimes, burglary, assault, and robbery. And you can see that for burglary, it's fairly, it's around four years. Assault, it's around four years. Robbery is a little bit higher, close to seven and a half, almost eight years. But the out is usually around seven years, where it gets back to the point of the general public who does not have a criminal conviction. So the other issue that we talked about was that, well, what about negligence? Am I, as a housing provider, liable for the criminal acts of third parties? Can I be? And the answer is yes, maybe, but only in certain circumstances. So in one case, the court said, you know, we really haven't decided this issue, but generally we say that it needs to be foreseeable. So there has to be some foreseeability. And then in the another case, in the Griffin case, the Court of Appeals said, yes, landlords have a duty to protect tenants from the criminal acts of third parties, but the Court of Appeals overturned that but didn't decide and decided the case on other grounds. In the Griffin case, it's a really interesting case. There was a tenant, a woman tenant who contacted her landlord, went to the property manager and said, gosh, there's like this hole in my ceiling. It looks like a crawl space. There's plaster coming down. It looks like someone had crawled in there. It's open. I'm afraid someone's going to come in and hurt me. I can hear somebody up there. Can you please do something? And so the landlord went and they said, okay, and they put up a two by four over the hole, but there was still lots of room on either side and you could sort of see up there and it was probably about this big a space. So maybe not the best repair in the world. Next day, person comes through, attacks the tenant, tenant tries to run away, gets assaulted, has her arm broken. They're able to apprehend the person that did this. So what happened? Was the landlord liable? The jury said that the landlord was negligent. However, they said, and then the repair was negligent. The landlord did not do the right thing. However, they didn't have to pay any money. They were not liable, even though they were negligent, because, and you'll have to revert back to your torts class, the person that assaulted her was an unforeseeable event. So that person that interceded, what is that? So, but for that person coming in, the person would not have been assaulted. And so the jury found that the landlord was not liable, but the person that assaulted her was liable. So in Washington, it may be really hard to prove this. And so there's a bit of a conundrum in that we want housing advocates, want tenants to be able to have housing, want people who are homeless to have housing, but at the same time, we want people to be safe. 
So what is a housing provider and an advocate to, to do? Yes, they were a tenant. So there has to be this balancing, just like in the, in the, in the, in the employment context where there is a negligent hiring uh, theory that can also be used. Uh, I mean, there isn't a lot of negligent tenant screening cases out there. I also have like a, a crazy memo with 180 footnotes on negligence in Washington. If you want it, I'm happy to share it with you what we did for a client. Um, and across the country, in most cases, because the law evolved very differently in the employment context and the housing context, there's a great uh, body of case law in the employment context on negligent hiring very little in the housing context because it was caveat emptor for a long time. Landlords were not responsible for the conditions of the property. They were never responsible for third party criminal acts. And that started to change in the 1970s. And so what most cases say is if you, if you are going to screen, then you need to screen in a way that's not negligent. And if you have a policy, you need to have, you need to follow your own policy. There was a case against the public housing authority where they were supposed to do a national record search and they didn't and they missed a recent, um, uh, fairly recent, I think it was within eight years, crime of second degree murder. And so one of their tenants ended up getting murdered by this person that they let in. And what the jury found was that they were negligent, not, not, uh, not because of the attack, but because they didn't follow their own screening policy. So what I, when I talk to housing providers about it, I say have a screening policy and follow that screening policy and make sure that it is uh, uh, re rationally related to what, your, what kind of tenant you want. Is that person going to be able to follow the rules and obligations of tenancy? There was a case out of Georgia where they let a tenant in who had a history of assault, but it was greater than five years old until they let him in. Unfortunately, the tenant relapsed and began drinking and carrying a gun. Unfortunately, again, the housing provider made that person a property manager. <laughs> Um, so which was the real problem. And so the question for the jury at survived summary judgment was whether or not it was negligent on uh, not to let the person in, be, not to have the policy of the five years, but whether it, whether it was um, a negligent act knowing what they knew about that person to let them continue to live there basically. <coughs> so the, the, he had a gun and he ended up killing one of the other tenants in his capacity as property manager when trying to discipline one of the tenants. So it's a horrible, it's a horrible case, but it shows that you need, that the, the landlord needs to not act negligently. In that case, they said that it was, that a jury possibly could find that the landlord was negligent there. I don't know, it's not in the facts of the case, we tried to contact the attorney who brought the case, but he never responded. Would that be, could that be considered negligent? So that's a good question about whether or not landlords are required to perform background checks. And in, it's not answered in Washington yet. In, in, the, in the Griffith case, in the Griffin case, the court said that the landlord does have a duty. But the Supreme Court says we haven't really decided that yet. That question in the Wydell case is that that question remains unanswered. So that question remains unanswered. I think there's a good argument based on the reasoning in Griffin that the landlord would owe a duty of a tenant for third party criminal acts. I think it's clear in the employment context that there's a duty not to commit negligent hiring, but it's less clear in the housing context. So answer, denial of rent to housing based on a criminal records could be discriminatory. Does that make sense? Do most people agree? Sort of see how we walk through that. Okay. So I think under the case law and the negligence and tort laws, you could argue that there needs to be an individual assessment to determine whether or not that person would oppose a danger to other tenants, to possible staff or to neighbors and really make that kind of an assessment. And I don't think it's always an, an easy assessment to make, but I think it can for example, many housing providers that we've been working with have been changing their policies about DUI and seeing that maybe a DUI does not have a health or safety risk. 
if it's a simple possession that's very old and the person can show treatment, then they're letting those folks in. And what many housing providers are looking to the studies and looking at seven years as sort of being the baseline for reform and maybe even less years for other types of crimes based on the studies that are starting to come out. So if you have a client and they're trying to get into private housing, there's no specific rule, there's no specific laws. We talked about the laws in flux. So what about public and subsidized housing? There are rules, of course. There are regulations. There are specific things. So there is only one set of absolute bans. Methamphetamine production in federally assisted housing and if you're a lifetime registered sex offender. That's absolute. Those are the two. All the other ones have some discretionary component to them. So what is called sort of a presumptive denial. A housing authority can deny, but they don't have to under the HUD rules. So there is a lot of wiggle room for your client to argue individual assessment and that the housing authority has discretion. So if someone is evicted from housing for criminal activity, drug-related criminal activity, in the last three years, they are ineligible for housing unless, and unlike the other two we just talked about, methamphetamine production and Regist lifetime registered sex offenders, there are exceptions. Completed a rehab program, the person is no longer living in the household. <coughs> and sometimes you may be able to ask for an accommodation, but that, that's a little dicey. So those two. Um, if the household member is currently engaging in illegal use of drugs, and that's kind of been sort of murky about what how the housing authority would prove <coughs> that. Usually they'll say, oh, I smoke marijuana or you know, the person was nodding out of my office, those kinds of things. So you have to feel that they completed a rehab program or otherwise rehabilitated, which is pretty broad. So hopefully you can get some evidence and we'll talk about what evidence you might need at the end of the presentation. Same with abusing alcohol that can be denied if they have a history of abusing alcohol that affects the health and safety of other of staff and other tenants unless they can show they've gone through a rehab program or have been rehabilitated. What other reasons can they deny? They don't have to, which is helpful to remind the housing authorities that they don't have to. Drug-related crimes, violent crimes, or other crimes that affect the health, safety, or right to peaceful enjoyment of residents, neighbors, and staff. And those are limited to a reasonable amount of time, which has been interpre interpreted. There are broad ranges for that of housing authorities across the state. Um, so, under the federal regulations, if you're trying to get someone into subsidized housing, that is somewhat similar to the EEOC guidance in that HUD has said to housing authorities, look at these criteria, the seriousness of the offense, uh, the person's culpability, if it was someone else in the household and they're no longer there, and evidence of rehabilitation. So all those things that we talked about in the employment context are applicable in the subsidized housing context. Okay, and in most cases, in the subsidized housing content, you have some form of appeals process. If the client comes to the clinic and they have a notice of denial, read the denial notice carefully because it'll say you have 10 days to appeal, you have 10 days, generally it's 10 days, it may be, it may be longer or shorter depending on whether it's King County or Seattle or some other housing authority, but it should say on the notice. It might be that they have a chance for an informal hearing or an informal conference or a written appeal depending on the type of subsidy they receive. And we can help you walk you through that to figure out what the subsidy is and what the rules are, but helping the person write an appeal letter can be really helpful. There's self-help packets of how to um, represent yourself in those kinds of hearings that we'll have available, those kinds of things. All right, so for example, I said that the ranges are all over the board. Here is the um, Seattle Housing Authorities list. And a problem with lists like this, and we've been talking with the Seattle Housing Authority and working with them to change their policy, and they're in the process of doing that, is it has a real chilling effect on people applying. So many people will have this because it says automatic denial, just won't apply. And I think that the Housing Authority cannot automatically deny, that they have to use their discretion, particularly if it's a person in a protected class. We haven't sued them yet because we're trying um, to be nice and play well with others. And, but we've been meeting with them and meeting with many housing providers over the last year now 
um, and talking with them about why it's important to change their policies and how this can be a real barrier to family uni reunification and a real barrier to people rehabilitating themselves. And, they've, and the Housing Authority, to its credit, has been very open and wanting to change this policy, but other residents have been very concerned, particularly residents with disabilities and residents who are senior citizens who, of course, are worried about their own safety. And so trying, again, to balance the needs of those residents with the needs of folks who are homeless and coming out of jail and prison who may be able to meet all the obligations of tenancy but for their criminal record. Okay, so this is the part uh, that's really hopeful and optimistic, preparing for opportunity. So individualized assessments is what we're talking about under the jobs assistance ordinance, what we're talking about in the subsidized housing context, possibly, arguably, in the private housing context. So how do you do that? Usually you want to get detailed proof of that person's rehabilitation. There will be social workers and case managers for folks who are in Fair Start to help gather that. There will be less for less of that support for folks, folks in the community clinic. So what most likely would be legally sufficient in this context? So the EOC spells it out for us, and I think we can also say that that would apply analogously in the housing context. So look at what is the, what is the offense? Is it related to the job? Is it related to the ability to do housing? How long ago? What was the age? Uh, did it involve substance abuse? Has the person been through treatment? Have they completed their sentence? Are they working? Are they not working? What, what are all of the things? Have they been denied housing already just because of that? Are they otherwise eligible for those things? So what are the specific documents that might be able to prove that? So the serious of, seriousness of the offense is one that pretty much will apply across the board. You want to look at court records, what Nick talked about, look at the judgment and sentence. That will tell you the exact crime. And as Vanessa talked about, you actually want to look at the, what the statute says about what that crime particularly is and ask the client, was it just for possession of marijuana? Was it an opiate? What really happened? And if the client has the police report number, you can look it up online. If they don't, you can suggest that they go and they get a copy of the police report to see sometimes police reports are not accurate but sometimes they are, and sometimes they can be helpful to look at and see what actually happened. As Vanessa said, she, she arms her folks with police reports if they're helpful and with the docket so they know exactly what happened. You want to know when, when did the conviction happen, what was the date, not the date the case was closed, because a lot of times the case will be closed randomly by the computer in 2009, even though the conviction goes back to 1989. And housing providers see that on a report or employers see that and they say, well, that was just five years ago or that was just four years ago. And the person's like, no, that was 20 years ago. And so you need to help that person get proof of that. The other thing that can be really helpful and is specifically set out in the rules of the jobs assistance ordinance is that the person's own statement can be considered by the employer. And also, I think you can <laughs> help the person put that together for a housing provider. What happened? How did they take responsibility? And how is their life different now? And what will make them a good tenant? Have they been living in transitional housing? Have they been living with a friend or a neighbor who can write a letter for them? What kind of court records could be helpful? There was talk about a certificate of discharge. You can talk about the person, how they can obtain that. It could be difficult, but walking them through the steps of that process. Getting a copy of the case docket, which are Legal assistant, Sonia, who it's her first day in the back, can help get all those records. So those are the kinds of things that can be really, really helpful. So the only case on the appeal process is in the public housing context. And that was a case out of Illinois where the person mainly had a history, a long, very, very long history of arrest, but there was never a conviction or an affirmative disposition in the cases. And the Court of Appeals there said that's not enough housing authority. You need to show that the conduct related and underlying that arrest is related to that person uh, harming or being a safety risk to staff and to other residents. So that can be a helpful case to cite uh, if you're writing a letter or helping the person appeal in your brief clinic visit. So again, if you want, if the person has been denied housing, it's a little bit more difficult. We don't have the EEOC guidance. We do not have the job assistance ordinance, but they can still file a discrimination claim with the Seattle Office of Civil Rights, the Human Rights Commission, or as we said, the King County Office 
of civil rights, which is in unincorporated King County and with Todd. And again, there's concurrent jurisdiction. So I think I made it. I have a few minutes for questions, comments, concerns. Andra, I mean. It's the same advocacy, but you don't have the federal regulations that apply to public and subsidized housing that specifically set out the uh, different criteria and so and discretion and what the provider can look at. But I think you can still make that argument based on the uh, employment case, based on the Oliver case. It's harder. I think it's more difficult. You can also look and see if the market rate housing provider has complied with the Fair Tenant Screening Act and making sure look at the criteria and what criteria the person received and make sure that matches up with what denial, the denial letter, the uh, note, the adverse action notice that the tenant received from the landlord. The enforcement is up to $100 per violation. They go to small claims court. They can go to small claims court. It's a judicial remedy. We don't know. This is a brand new pilot project that the Allen Foundation gave us a 30,000 grant to start. And so we don't we don't know yet. In our LFO clinic, of course, it was all LFOs. And so we're gonna have to we're gonna have to see. We did do a survey of Fair Start students, and it looked like more than half of the students had LFO issues. A significant portion had both housing and employment. It wasn't quite as high as LFOs, but I think it was probably more than half. Uh, the other issue that came up a lot was child support. So we will have a good referral with the Union Gospel Mission here from the Union Gospel Mission. We had who's here from the Union, Union Gospel Mission, yes. So they will take referrals if the person doesn't need to be homeless, they just need to be indigent, and they do child support stuff. So we have some good referrals for that if that comes up. Other questions or comments? All right, there is a, I want to do a gentle, oh yeah, over here. We usually, we usually provide two documents, generally. There may be more depending on the situation, but usually the judgment and sentence, and then we highlight those, those portions of it. And then we also usually give the docket, if that's needed, and highlight what's relevant and helpful. And uh, our legal assistant, and we also have legal assistant volunteers who will help attorneys put together all those things, and there will be a closing sheet where the steps that the person, the next steps the person needs to be, to take in will, um, will be spelled out. Also, if there's more documentation that's needed, the legal assistants can follow up on that as well. So if it says GIS needed, uh, this other documentation is needed, criteria from the landlord, and these are the steps, then the legal assistant will review that and provide, email the information to the client if we can find it for them. A really good question. The question was, does this apply to workers or tenants who are undocumented? And the answer is yes. They can file, as far as I know, they can file a complaint with the Seattle Office of Civil Rights and with other civil rights agencies. There was recently passed an ethics rule that says the other side can't use that in retaliation or as um, uh, part of the case to try to uh, take negative action unless it's relevant to the particular case at hand. What, what, isn't, what isn't as clear is if a landlord or an employer requires a more, this comes up in the landlord context because there's specific rules in the employment context, a social security number. And they can do that as long as they ask everyone for the social security number. So it's harder to show disparate treatment, disparate impact, but you can show disparate treatment. So if they're not asking everybody for the social security number, um, that can come up, but that's a really good question. And the jobs assistance ordinance, the job assistance ordinance applies to all employees as long as they're working 50% in Seattle, even, I think, if they're undocumented. And the Seattle Office of Civil Rights is not in, not in, yeah. All right. Uh, good question. Thanks. Thanks. 
I'm not sure. I think $1,200, but I'm going to defer to our expert in the back. So there's a, is there an argument if the two cases are consolidated that they can only charge the fee once rather than twice on the same case? So we should go to the clerk's office. Okay. 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 Good questions. Other questions? So the question was, if someone has a criminal record and they're being charged higher fees, can they do that? The answer is most likely yes, unless you can show that those fees have a discriminatory impact on a protected class. So in the Fair Housing, in the Fair Tenant Screening Act, part of the form is that the person could have a higher deposit if they have a bad credit record or they have a low credit score. So yes, you would have to show that there was some type of discriminatory treatment that folks who were not a protected class were not, not being charged those extra fees. And that came up in the city, uh, the Seattle Office of Civil Rights in their investigation that that was happening, that people were being charged higher rent and higher, higher fees, sometimes based on race, but that's sometimes hard to prove. Anything else? All right, I think we are at 3.10. So should we move ahead? Yes, John says yes. So Debbie, if you're ready. So Debbie Perlis from the Northwest Justice Project, we're really excited to have her expertise with us today on all things ethics. Thank you. Thank you. Um, wait, 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 don't go anywhere, Murph. Murph. Am I supposed to do something? Why don't we take five minutes while we do the PowerPoint, or two minutes? It, well, we we actually through. wouldn't even need it that much, but it okay. might be helpful for people to see the rules. <laughs> All right. Let me pull this up. It's all high tech, so it's uh. Hi. We need the ethics. Okay. Right. Right. Go ahead. Which, which the, you know, well, and no, get out there. No, no, get out there before the Seahawks block game blocks your way. It starts at 5:30. Oh, Everyone should be out of here by <coughs> okay. 3:45 at okay, the latest. Good. I may sneak out. <laughs> yes. No, go, go. Just, I, I just and then you just click the arrows back and forth depending on which way you want okay. to go. Okay, all right. So. We'll wait a minute, get every, let everyone get their stuff for this last scintillating half hour of your <laughs> training. Okay, um, I'm just going to go ahead and begin. I am not bothered by people walking around, uh, talking, <laughs> whatever. Um, I'm happy to be here. Thank you, Murph, for inviting me, although I have to say it's always with some trepidation to go after Murph. 
Uh, and I consistently have to do so. So, and I never overcome my um, sense of trepidation in having to do so. Um, first of all, I'd like to know, I mean, I know most of the room, or much of the room. How many people here are actually private attorneys? Okay, well, you are the folks that I want to speak primarily to. Um, I, I know and respect and love the legal services community and the nonprofit community, but the folks who we really need to engage in this work are you private attorneys who will uh, really um, hopefully add capacity and make a difference for this population. So you're the group I'd really want to speak to. Um, and what I really want to tell you is that um, you're not just doing what you're doing and interested in this topic out of the goodness of your heart, which I know you are and you should be, and that's the primary reason to do it. You also have an ethical obligation to do pro bono work. And that um, obligation is excuse me, both uh, stems from a lawyer's role as a public citizen, as described in the preamble to our rules of professional conduct, and, um, who, and the responsibility to seek improvement in the law, access to the uh, legal system and administration of justice. But there's also a rule, RPC 6.1. If you haven't read it, you should. Um, that rule... Um, actually imposes a duty um, that uh, to do uh, pro bono public service public services regardless of uh, professional prominence workload station in life and for those legal services lawyers in the room I also want to tell you that um, working and doing work for low-income people when you're paid or compensated in any way to do so does not count as pro bono publico services and you too have an obligation to to perform pro bono work um, our rules in Washington are special in that they differ from the model rules of professional conduct by really prioritizing work for low-income people. Uh, the ABA rules allow for um, uh, work on behalf of charitable organizations, public service work, a whole range of work, but our rules really prioritize um, work to persons of, of limited means. So I really want to encourage you to um, to really uh, comply and, and undertake uh, with enthusiasm that professional obligation. Um, and the interesting thing about the pro bono publico rule is it actually incorporates kind of an eligibility uh, rule of um, approximately the, the, the indigent uh, definition uh, that's contained in other rules, which is approximately those persons who are at 125% of the federal poverty level. Um, there's lots of pro bono options, but uh, some of the things that people worry about um, are what I guess I would call the three C's. People worry about in doing pro bono work, competency, uh, conflicts, and confidentiality. So those are the things I'm going to focus on, though really I'm not going to focus on competence at all. The reason for that is um, that competence is, and I'll just read the rule, it means requires competent representation requires the legal knowledge, skill, thoroughness, and preparation reasonably necessary for the representation. Well, you're doing all that right now. You clearly have the skill. What you may feel that you're lacking in doing the work for people who are seeking and, and trying to reenter um, from having been incarcerated is a competency to be able to identify all the issues and to actually uh, do the representation. Um, but you're really overcoming that by one, being here today, uh, listening to fabulous people like Murph and, and Nick talk about and, and uh, others talk about the issues that um, impact this, this community and to um, know that those resources exist and you can rely upon them. So it's, you're really one step ahead. Uh, and please don't be discouraged from doing this work because you just don't feel like, like you have enough knowledge to do so. Um, you really, you, you've got the basics <laughs> as of today and um, you, you should just 
continue to to rely on the people uh, who who are there to to serve as resources for you. Um, so I'm not going to talk about that further. Uh, the the conflict rules people worry about. They worry about, oh, you know, I don't want to go out and do pro bono work because I'm worried about I need to check conflicts or I need to um, know whether or not I have a conflict before I talk to this person. I don't want to create a conflict with myself or with my firm to take a pain client back, back when I get back to the office. And the um, – in, in pro bono work, you really um, – our, our state Supreme Court was very concerned about this issue for private lawyers and um, has really tried to to create or, or interpret the RPCs in a way that uh, reduces barriers to lawyers from engaging in pro bono um, activity. And one of the ways that it has done so is by adopting this rule RPC uh, 6.5. The model ABA rules have a rule that's kind of like this, but ours is much more um, protective of lawyers in engaging in pro bono work. Um, and basically, you don't have to worry about conflicts. Um, you know, is it, really the message for a, a lawyer who is participating in a pro bono program in connection with a nonprofit organization or a court annexed uh, 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 program is relieved of any prohibitions related to conflict unless they know – unless there is a known conflict. In other words, if there's actual knowledge that you have a conflict with a person who may be coming to seek your services, RPC 1.7 does not apply when you're engaged in a limited scope representation of that person. A limited scope representation is advice – um, uh, brief services, something that you know is not going to continue over the scope of an extensive period of time. Uh, similarly, you're relieved of having or creating a conflict with your law firm uh, in the event that a conflict were later to be discovered or that a paying client were to come to the law firm uh, down the road and were to, you, that you were to discover that, oh, I assisted an opposing party at the, at the reentry clinic and, excuse me, and, um, water, this guy, um, at the reentry, at the reentry clinic and, um, and, 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 and there wasn't a way to discover that earlier on. So there's no imputation of conflicts whatsoever under RPC 6.9. I should have gotten the water ahead of time. Apologize. Um, so, so there's no worry about creating conflicts with your law firm unless there's actual knowledge of the conflict. And even if, even if there were to be a conflict or that a conflict were to arise between you and a client that your law firm seeks to represent or is representing for that matter. The conflict does not disqualify the law firm if the lawyer is effectively screened from any knowledge or participation in that case. So it's a very, very expansive, protective uh, rule that encourages uh, private lawyers to participate in pro bono activities. Uh, if you're, it, it generally applies um, where it is a limited assistance representation. However, even if the representation is to extend beyond limited assistance, as I said before, conflicts still would not be a problem if the lawyer is completely screened from the opposing representation. Um, if the lawyer does believe that the person who 
they may be seen at the clinic or who is seeking their services through the clinic, for who, they, they believe that there is or may be a conflict either with them personally or with their law firm back at the ranch. Um, you can still, the rules allow a lawyer to still get information from the individual and refer to somebody else who may be able to assist them without providing any direct legal advice. So as I said, it's a very protective rule and um, hopefully one that lawyers who are seeking to participate in pro bono um, services will um, use to prevent uh, conflicts from being a barrier for uh, their participation. I'm going to skip down because um, a couple of things to, to understand. Um, I, I'll get, get to confidentiality in a minute, but I just want to really carefully talk about communication. Under the rules 4.2 and 4.3, if you are talking to an individual uh, and they want you to talk to another individual, it's important to know, remember that uh, communication uh, with an unrepresented uh, third party is um, uh, something that you you know have to be very careful about not misrepresenting the purpose of your communication. If you are doing a, what we would call a limited representation on behalf of an, of an individual, which you're allowed to do under the RPC's rules of the the scope rules 1.2, um, and you're going into court. There are rules that allow you to engage in a limited scope representation if you file what is called a notice of limited representation under CR 70.1 and you serve that on the other side if they are represented by an attorney. That attorney cannot communicate with your client even though you're not representing them for the full scope of the representation during the period that you say you are representing that person. However, be, beyond the scope of that representation, in other words, once your representation terminates, which it does in essence as a matter of law based upon what you describe your scope of representation to be, the opposing attorney can communicate directly with the client. So that's just something to keep in mind when you're thinking about, well, you know, am I going to do a little something for this person or not? What am I going to do? How am I going to do it? Can I do a limited scope representation? Um, and if you are thinking of doing that, then uh, you just have to know that um, the rules – Allow it, number one, they allow, uh, they allow you to do ghostwriting, number two, that is writing a pleadings that you write, the lawyer writes, but the client ultimately signs and files. You do not need to disclose. If you're going to do ghostwriting, you do not need to disclose that a lawyer has, in fact, drafted the documents and your name doesn't have to go anywhere on the documents. That's another protection and one of those kinds of, you know, exceptions to the candor to the court rules that our, our um, model rules um, encourage, okay, I'm going back to confidentiality, encourage, to, to encourage uh, people to engage in providing pro bono services. Okay, confidentiality. I'm going to be really quick here uh, because I, what I really am more interested in is trying to answer any questions you might have. So, Confidentiality rule 1.6, um, it has very broad application under uh, Washington State rules. Washington State rules have a, probably about the broadest uh, confidentiality rule in the country. Um, it prevents you from disclosing any information relating to the representation of a client. That's the basic rule. It's a fundamental rule of the attorney-client relationship. Um, you're, you're prohibited, in essence, from disclosing inf any information about the client, discussing any information about the client's case with anyone without the client's informed consent. And what that means is really outside of 
uh, the scope of your own law firm, the scope of the relationship that you have with anybody else who is there to help you assist the client. Um, there is an implied authorization uh, for you to be able to discuss the facts of a case with somebody who is obviously assisting you with the case. Um, but if you are going to discuss the client's case with anybody else, particularly somebody who's not within the scope of your own law firm, then you ought to make sure to ask the client, is it okay if you discuss their situation uh, with, for example, with Murph, if you're going to directly discuss their specific situation, their specific facts, their spe with their specific name or other identifying information, um, involved um, you need that you need to get the clients informed consent um, it may be I don't know how you're going to run your clinic I don't know if you're going to have like a little uh, limited scope retainer agreement that will in fact dis disclose who the potential persons are that you will to be able to discuss their case with but if not that would be an excellent thing to include so that you have the informed consent up front and the lawyer can discuss the, the nature and scope of that informed consent with the client. Um, you cannot reveal non-protected information if, the, if it will lead to protected information. So for example, if a client has information on the public record and you know that, and you just you wish to somehow, you know, you think that it's okay to disclose information that may be a matter of public record. Um, you better get the client's informed consent, because even if information is public and is a matter of public records, for example, um, information relating to the client's, you know crimes are all public record and you're providing that information to someone else, um, if it can lead to protected information such as the fact that you're providing services to them at that moment, um, that is protected information. So, so we, we really, in, in, in NJP, we're really careful about um, redacting names even off of pleadings that have been filed that are a matter of public record um, because of that very broad scope of confidentiality that applies in Washington. Um, Murph basically gave me a couple of little examples of things that people might be concerned about in the course of this reentry clinic. And, and one example she gave me is something about, well, people might be concerned about overheard conversations. If you're talking to a person who has come in to get advice in the clinic, um, what is the environment in which that person is seeking uh, uh, information. It really should be a very, it should be a confidential environment. One that uh, respects the person <laughs> as a client and demonstrates that you're in a profession, you're try, trying to provide a professional uh, service in a professional environment. Um, but you also have an affirmative duty to ensure and provide an environment in which information is presented, is able to be presented in a confidential way. Um, clients should not be over, should not be the ones who are being, who are forced over, you know, to, to point out the need for privacy. That is the lawyer's responsibility to ensure that the environment is such that they can receive the information that they need to receive in order to assist the client. Um, overheard conversations probably don't destroy the attorney-client uh, uh, privilege, which is different than the ethical obligation under 1.6 to maintain the confidentiality of information relating to the representation. That is a privilege that it is that the lawyer must assert regardless of whether the privilege could be breached or violated in some other way. 
you should not be the one to make the judgment as to whether or not the privilege attaches. I guess I'm going to stop there and just ask if anyone has any questions about either the conflicts or the confidentiality issue, and then I can talk a little bit about capacity of the client. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I would meet with the general advice is this. Meet with the client alone. Ask them what their situation is. Find out whether or not why they want to bring somebody in. If they really feel like they need the support, invite that person in. And if there becomes a point in time where the client is demonstrating reluctance to give information, ask the person to leave the room. I think that it's – I don't think that the – I don't think that you've breached your ethical duty by having a third person in the room. There could potentially be an issue as to whether – if somebody should raise it as to whether or not you violated the privilege or whether or not the privilege has been breached for purposes of, you know, compelling you to testify. But you would really have to – you know, a judge would have to decide that and have to be put to the test as to whether or not, you know, the privilege has been violated. Really, it's the ethical issue. And if your client gives you informed consent to have that person in the room and you're very clear that, you know, the communications between you are completely confidential, then I don't see a real issue there. The issue comes in when you get down to the privilege. So any other questions about that? That's a good question. Yeah. So informed consent. Yeah, well, informed consent can be – one, it doesn't have to be in writing. It can be implied from the circumstances. It doesn't have to be in writing. No. Informed consent does not have to be in writing. And I know most lawyers are more comfortable with it being in writing because then you have evidence and you have the client's signature on something that goes through all kinds of disclaimers as to why they shouldn't be signing this document and giving you informed consent. But the truth is that you can get it orally. You should document that you've received informed consent. You should reduce it to writing. And I'm just saying that there are rules that do require informed consent to be in writing, like conflicts, you know, as between opposing parties or between parties who may have a mutual interest, but there may be a potential conflict. But for RPC 1.6, informed consent does not need to be in writing. So although obviously it's better to document for your own protection than – because informed consent for this purpose, for RPC 1.6 purposes, can be inferred from the circumstances. That's a good question, though. Any other questions? Okay. Well, really, Murph is the one who should be talking about 1.14, capacity of a client, because she always does a brilliant job of presenting how to deal with clients who are under diminished capacity. RPC 1.14 may come into play in some of your cases, in the reentry cases, may not. You know, it's always a very difficult judgment call when you're dealing with a client with a diminished capacity. And this rule addresses how a lawyer is to act and deal with the attorney-client relationship when they believe that the client is of diminished capacity. And what this means is that the person is unable to make decisions to help facilitate the representation. It is not a bad judgment test. 
It is not my client is acting contrary to their own best interest. My client is not following my advice or my client is an idiot. That is not the test of whether they have diminished capacity. The test of whether or not they have diminished capacity is where there is a substantial risk of harm, a physical, financial, or other harm by virtue of their inability to assist you in the representation or their decision making. And their decision making may be impaired um, when they um, are not able to articulate the rationale that goes with the decision making process or they're not able or they're out of touch with reality. They may be fading in and out of reality and their decision making is tempered or affected by their by some bad, fantastic um, unreal imagined context in which they find themselves which demonstrates, generally demonstrates, more of a mental illness than it does bad judgment. Now, mind you, there are people who have bad judgment and will make up all kinds of reasons why they would make that decision, all of which lead to the bad judgment, but it's not necessarily diminished capacity. Where a client has diminished capacity, the rule is that the normal attorney-client relationship um, um, is is to continue is to is to be the is to be the basic uh, principle that applies. You you follow their decisions. You you involve them in the process. You they make the decisions as to how what their objectives are and um, what ultimately they're trying to achieve as a result of the representation. If after dealing with a the, a person you believe that they are simply not able. And it's a hard, hard judgment. It's a very difficult judgment. Um, if you believe that they are simply not able to assist in the representation or that they are making decisions that are truly um, going to result in substantial risk of physical or, or financial or other harm, then you may, and again, this is not even a you will, you may, seek to take some kind of protective action, such as finding some guardian ad litem potentially that could assist in the representation if it's an in-court kind of proceeding, uh, potentially seeking to have the person uh, declared incompetent or incapacitated uh, through a guardianship or some other kind of conservative court proceeding or simply calling a third party family member who may be able to assist with the representation. But even there, RPC 1.6 would have you limited to disclosing the information related to the representation or the basis of your reasoning why, as to why you think the person has impaired capacity to the limit, to the information limited to identifying and, and um, seeking and using a, a, protective, um, a, a protective process or third party. Going back to uh, 1.6 for, uh, for just one minute, I forgot to say on 1.6, there are two um, exceptions to 1.6. Um, and those two exceptions could come up in in this context. Um, they are actually there's more than two, but there, there's uh, three, but at least three. But um, it could come up. And and those two exceptions are in 1.6b. It says that a lawyer, uh, to the extent the lawyer reasonably believes necessary. And those, those, again, comes down to judgment. What is your best judgment of the situation? Uh, shall, this is a mandatory obligation under the rules, shall reveal information related to the representation of a client to prevent reasonably certain death or substantial bodily harm. Reasonably certain death or substantial bodily harm. I just did a, 
little CLE for um, staff at NJP. And one of the things that we, we are talking about is just a safety, safety for our staff, safety for our clients. What are the rules around making sure that we, we are safe in our, in our work and our representation? And the issue of uh, client suicide uh, is a big, in fact, I had a call today from one of my staff members where the client on the phone was, oh, we can't help you. Oh, I'm going to go kill myself, you know, threatening suicide. And really, it's such a dilemma as to, as to what to do because you're bound not to reveal any information related to the representation. And the, the rules, as I tell people, the RPCs are rules of reason. They do not, they are the minimum obligation. They do not address the scope of what is morally or ethically required of a lawyer or of a human being. So when faced with this kind of suicide situation, and many people who we represent, frankly, are distressed, they have reason to be distressed. They're in terrible, dire straits. Um, you, you know, what do you do? And all I could say is that um, you have to really dig deeper because, but if you do, and if you then become reasonably certain that they in fact are going to kill themselves, then you have an obligation to reveal that to someone who can help, the police, crisis line, a case manager, somebody who is in a position to uh, intercede and take affirmative action to prevent that harm. Um, and, and so it's a judgment. One question I asked, somebody asked was, well, then isn't it better just not to ask? Because then you don't confirm any suspicions about being concerned about this individual. And maybe under the rules, yes. Is that your moral or ethical compass? That's a whole different question. And that's only something that every individual needs to decide for themselves. You may reveal the information to prevent the commission of a crime. And the model rules um, say this is true to prevent the commission of um, a crime where uh, a financial crime, I think, a crime of financial harm, where in Washington, the rules relate to any crime. So you, it's permissive. You're not required, but it, you are allowed to reveal information relating to, to prevent the commission of a crime. So if a client were to come in and, you know, I hate to say it, but I mean, this is a formerly incarcerated population, a um, person could potentially be coming in and saying, you know, I um, I just want to find out what the, you know, what the consequences will be if I, you know, go and, you know, kill my landlord, for example. Um, and uh, obviously there you're not, you may or may not be obligated given whether you not you reasonably believe that a crime is that the person is going to commit this horrendous crime or even if you feel like mm, if you're pretty certain that they could they you know you may you may reveal information to prevent the commission of the crime but again only to the extent necessary for that purpose so um, I'm going to stop there. I guess I'm done. I'm over my time. Okay. I'm all done. Any questions? All right. You are all ethically able now to go and serve in the reentry clinic. <laughs> so I want to thank everyone for being here today. Um, we really appreciate your time today. And um, you should all have an evaluation form in the front of the binder that you received when you came in. If you wouldn't mind taking a few minutes to fill that out. Sonia will be waiting near the um, registration desk outside and you can give them to her. Um, so I want to thank Perkins again for allowing us to use the space and providing us with food and drinks today. Again, we really appreciate that. Um, for those of you who signed up on the volunteer forms. Um, we'll be contacting you in the next few weeks to um, provide you with more information and, and get more information from you. Um, and again, the training from today has been recorded and um, 
the video will be posted along with the written materials in the binders on our website, columbialegal.org, um, sometime in the next couple of weeks. So again, thank you very much. Yes, Mike. Thank you.